an era of gourmet hunters and enticing dishes. A young man named Kamatsu is venturing into the forest to find a world-renowned ingredient hunter named Toriko. Kamatsu has been sent by the International Gourmet Organization IGO, to request Toriko's help in finding ingredients for them. However, Toriko is currently busy fishing and hasn't heard anything Kamatsu said. Just as a giant bird was about to steal Toriko's catch, he swiftly dealt with it using his fishing rod. Shortly after, Kamatsu informed Toriko that the IGO wants him to hunt a galalligator. As soon as Toriko heard the name galalligator, he became ecstatic because its meat is even more delicious than Emperor Crow and Kobe beef combined. The two of them set off for the island where the galalligators reside. Toriko quickly recognized Kamatsu as a chef due to the food scent on his hands, while Toriko himself is the most renowned ingredient hunter in this era. Finally, they reached the habitat of the galalligators, known as the Southern Wasteland Island. To get there, they had to cross a river filled with level 1 sharks. According to the IGO's standards, creatures at level 1 require at least 10 hunters to catch, while the galalligator they were after was classified as level 5. As they stepped onto the island, a blood-sucking leech fell on Kamatsu's neck, frightening him. However, Toriko squeezed some salt water from a plant leaf onto the leech. Driving it away since leeches are highly averse to salt. Kamatsu then encountered a giant sword-wielding tiger at level 3, but as Toriko revealed his fierce demeanor, the tiger quickly fled in panic. That evening, the two of them grilled a few level 1 frogs and snakes for a makeshift dinner. However, a massive level 5 swamp snake suddenly appeared, disrupting their meal. Surprisingly, the snake collapsed and died, as it had previously suffered a significant bite wound. Before Toriko and Kamatsu could comprehend what happened, the snake's body was suddenly dragged underwater. Immediately after, a gigantic galalligator emerged from the depths. Kamatsu, frightened, realized that this galalligator was actually a level 8 creature, not the level 5 they initially thought, and it was the one that had bitten and killed the swamp snake earlier. The galalligator had tough tank-like scales, rendering Toriko's regular attacks ineffective. Even its tail strike was powerful enough to send him flying several dozen meters. However, a red demon suddenly appeared behind Toriko, wielding a knife and plate. Toriko activated his food honor technique, transforming his arms into blades with plates. As the galalligator continued its charge, Toriko used his knife and fork technique to pierce and slice it. Toriko and Kamatsu then cut the galalligator's meat and grilled it, discovering its succulent, flavorful, and juicy qualities. Grilling it on stones made the exterior crispy while maintaining its moistness inside. During the meal, Kamatsu shared his aspiration to become the world's greatest chef. While Toriko expressed his desire to create an extraordinary menu with the world's finest dishes. Impressed by Toriko's intriguing character, Kamatsu requested to accompany him on his journey. The next morning, Toriko ate every last bit of the gal alligator, leaving none for the IGO organization. This place is a central market specializing in seafood that supplies the entire city. As a result, television reporters often come here to film reports for the people. When Tina, the reporter, spotted Toriko, she immediately recognized him as a famous hunter. So, Tina ran up to interview Toriko, but she was immediately pushed away by IGO security personnel. Because they didn't want to get involved with reporters like Tina, the IGO members took her away. An IGO officer informed Toriko that the rainbow fruit had just ripened, and the rainbow fruit is a top-tier fruit. Just one drop of its juice can turn an entire fruit juice swimming pool. However, the rainbow fruit is currently in the territory of level 9 King Kongs. So no one dares to approach it. IGO asked Toriko to go and harvest the rainbow fruit located in the scenic garden behind the gate, which is under the control of the King Kong tribe. Toriko, however, used his three-hit style to punch a hole in the wall to intimidate the King Kong and make it run away. Toriko confidently entered the garden, ignoring the fear of those present. Toriko and Kamatsu soon encountered a level 9 King Kong, but Toriko used an electric prod to immobilize it because he didn't want to harm the animals in this place. Little Tina followed Toriko here and sneaked past the security to enter the garden. The scent of the rainbow fruit can mesmerize animals to the point of hallucination. So the King Kongs often use it for hunting. Toriko and Kamatsu found the rainbow fruit in the lair of the gigantic King Kong tribe. Toriko rushed forward and used an electric prod to immobilize the apes because their meat was not appetizing. Toriko's principle is to only kill creatures that can be eaten. He quickly identified the leader with white fur. Toriko emitted a terrifying, demon-like aura that made the leader fearful and obedient. Toriko then plucked only one fruit, leaving the rest for the apes to use as hunting tools. Tina was recording Toriko with the rainbow fruit when she was grabbed by the guards and taken outside. 
That night, Komatsu made a fragrant pudding from the rainbow fruit, causing everyone to salivate. As Toriko took a bite, he felt the flavors of various fruits melting in his mouth. It was the most delicious pudding he had ever tasted, so Toriko decided to include the rainbow fruit pudding in his ultimate menu. A few days later, Toriko and Komatsu set out to hunt puffer whales because it was currently their mating season. A hunter named Zong approached Toriko to challenge him when he learned that Toriko was also a hunter. However, as soon as Zong saw Toriko's massive physique, he became fearful and immediately left. Toriko explained that most ingredient hunters in the world often compete with each other. When Toriko saw an elderly man with silver hair approaching and requesting wine, he immediately handed him a bottle of wine. Upon disembarking from the ship, Toriko coincidentally met his best friend, Koko, and Komatsu was astonished because Koko, along with Toriko, was one of the four strongest hunters known as the Four Heavenly Kings. The Four Heavenly Kings had experienced life and death battles against countless species of creatures. Koko summoned an emperor cow to transport Toriko and Komatsu to his home. When they arrived at Koko's home, he laid out a table of food to treat Toriko. Koko mentioned that he had completed half of his ultimate menu which consisted of top-tier dishes such as dragon's tear soup and phoenix meat. Koko also knew that Toriko and Komatsu were on their way to catch puffer whales, a highly poisonous species that required someone skilled in preparation. If eaten as is, it could send one to heaven immediately. Not to mention, they were deep inside a cave where there were dozens of other dangerous creatures. In addition to being a hunter, Koko was also a fortune teller, so he unintentionally discovered that Komatsu had only one year left to live. Hundreds of hunters had gathered to hunt puffer whales, so Tina was present to shoot a video. When she saw Toriko and Koko, she requested to join them to record their journey. Despite Toriko warning her about the dangers inside the cave, Tina still followed along. When she encountered a type of mushroom called Bakibaki, Toriko quickly ran over to taste it and assess its flavor. While filming, Tina accidentally encountered Zong's group, but they all fled the cave when they saw a horde of monsters appearing. Koko had a keener eye than most, allowing him to see clearly in the darkness as well as foresee the future of living creatures. Besides his sharp vision, Koko had the ability to excrete toxins through his skin and could defend against almost all naturally occurring poisonous creatures. When a flock of bats arrived, Koko sprayed toxins on himself to eliminate them. However, Komatsu mysteriously disappeared, causing Toriko and Koko great concern. A gigantic demon snake appeared in front of them, a creature at level 21, making it a formidable opponent for Toriko and Koko. The snake's terrifying roar caused the cave entrance to collapse immediately. Prior to this, Tina had attached an ultra-small recording device to Komatsu's hat so she could capture footage without entering the cave. However, she observed Komatsu being abducted by a bearded man. The demon snake managed to grab Toriko with one of its hands, rendering him immobile. When Toriko sensed that the snake was about to spray poison on him, he used all his strength to break free. Toriko used his knife-like technique to sever one of the snake's legs. However, the snake quickly regenerated the lost limb at a rapid pace and sent Toriko flying. As for the kidnapper, he intended to use Komatsu as bait to distract the monsters while he captured puffer whales. Toriko and Koko attempted to work together to defeat the snake, but their attacks were ineffective. Toriko suggested that if Koko could hold the snake still for a moment, he could definitely defeat it. Toriko then concentrated all his strength into his right arm. While Koko rushed to shoot poison into the snake's sensory organs to try to immobilize it for Toriko to use his internal energy. The demon snake quickly caught Koko as he exposed himself, and when it attempted to spray poison on him, Koko created a layer of his own poison on his body. Therefore, even though the snake sprayed poison on him, Koko remained unharmed due to the protective layer of poison. Frustrated by its failed poison attack, the snake then tried to inject venomous spines into Koko, but Koko took advantage of the spines to push his own poison back into the snake's body. As a result, the snake became immobilized and writhed in agony from the shock of the poison. At this point, Toriko had focused all his power into his right arm and relentlessly delivered powerful punches to the snake's body, ultimately defeating it. After defeating the demon snake, Toriko dismembered it into pieces for transportation. Koko was concerned about Komatsu, but Toriko reassured him that he had given Komatsu a secret weapon, so there was no need to worry. Komatsu and the kidnapper were now facing another demon snake. The kidnapper had abandoned Komatsu and fled as soon as he saw the demon snake, only to be killed by a swarm of giant insects shortly after. While on the ship, Toriko had given Komatsu a stunning gun to fend off monsters, and he had instructed Komatsu to cover his ears when using it. However, Komatsu panicked and fired the stunning gun towards the demon snake without covering his ears. The deafening blast from the gun caused Komatsu's heart to stop, but it had no effect on the snake. 
When Toriko and Koko arrived at the scene, they were relieved to find Komatsu unharmed. It turned out that just as the demon snake was about to devour Komatsu, an old man who had been asking for alcohol on the ship had appeared and transformed into a giant. He used an electric shock to incapacitate the giant snake with a single strike. The old man then used his electric abilities to restart Komatsu's heart and heal his eardrums. Afterward, the old man left the area. Koko and Toriko recognized him as the legendary hunter named Jiro, whose menu consisted of exquisite dishes that no one had ever tasted. Finally, Toriko's group reached the breeding grounds of the puffer whales. Tina was excited to film the scene of capturing the whales, but Komatsu realized he had left his hat on the shore. As they descended into the sea, Toriko and Koko encountered a large school of puffer whales. However, when Toriko tried to catch them, the whales became frightened, released their toxic substances, and died instantly. Koko, on the other hand, submerged himself in the water to approach the school of whales and used electric shocks to paralyze their brains. Seeing this, Toriko also learned to conceal himself in the water and used his fingers to paralyze the whales' brains. After a considerable effort, Toriko and Koko managed to capture 10 puffer whales, much to Komatsu's joy. However, they needed to remove the poison sacs from the whales' bodies before they could be consumed. Koko suggested that Komatsu prepare the fish, as he was a professional chef, and Komatsu would need precise knife skills for this task, which he found even more challenging than defusing bombs. Komatsu successfully prepared the eight poison whales, and they were no longer considered inedible. He extracted the poison sack from the last whale to the group's delight. They then made puffer whale sashimi and enjoyed it together. As they ate, Toriko felt like all the fatigue in his body had disappeared. Especially when paired with sake, the meal was incomparably delicious. While everyone was dining, a strange figure suddenly appeared with an aura so intimidating that even Toriko and Koko were taken aback. However, this individual had come here solely to capture puffer whales and paid no attention to the Toriko group. After leaving the scene, Toriko's group saw the unfamiliar figure defeating many hunters to steal puffer whales, but Tina remained unharmed. IGO then sent a helicopter to pick up Toriko, while Koko rode an emperor cow back home. While on the helicopter, Toriko made an enormous burger and devoured it in one bite. The creature that IGO wanted Toriko to capture next was the regal mammoth. Which Toriko immediately agreed to, as their meat was considered the pinnacle of all meats. The Toriko group then flew to IGO's largest garden, spanning 500,000 square kilometers. This location also served as the world's largest food processing factory, and IGO used it for breeding and genetically reviving extinct animal species. As soon as Toriko met the bald-headed director, Mansam, of this garden, he greeted him warmly. However, Mansam was feeling extremely worried because the Gourmet Corp was about to take action. Mansam explained that the Gourmet Corp was an organization created with the purpose of controlling food resources worldwide, and the robot that Toriko encountered while capturing the puffer whale belonged to them. Mansam temporarily put aside the matter of the Gourmet Corp and took Toriko and Komatsu to an arena. This arena was where the IGO organized battles between ferocious creatures for the entertainment of the wealthy. The money earned from these battles would be used to support impoverished countries facing difficulties. As Toriko settled into his seat, Mansam released a series of fierce monsters, but when he learned that the main character of the battle was a battle wolf, Toriko was very surprised. In ancient times, there was a giant monster that had consumed all the vegetation, causing life on many continents to disappear. However, the battle wolf species appeared and eradicated each of these monsters, saving the entire planet. Mansam wanted the recently bred battle wolf from IGO to fight all the monsters in the arena. The person in charge of the battle was a girl named Rin, an animal trainer. To make the battle more intense, Rin injected a gas into the arena that stimulated the fierceness of the creatures. However, when the creatures rushed to attack, the battle wolf remained still and did not retaliate. Suddenly, Toriko leaped into the arena, punching away the other monsters to rescue the battle wolf. He realized that this particular battle wolf was pregnant. When the renowned hunter Toriko prepared to fight, the entire audience became extremely excited. Toriko pierced through the 2.5-meter-thick protective barrier to enter the arena, leaving Mansam wide-eyed in astonishment. Immediately after, Toriko emitted a powerful and terrifying killing intent to push back the group of monsters. Meanwhile, Tina and Komatsu were sitting, enjoying a pricey pear bread treat provided by Mansam. The battle wolf suddenly exhausted and collapsed, so Toriko asked Rin to reduce the combat gas. When he saw a white-faced monkey rushing to attack, Toriko immediately punched it, knocking it out instantly. Toriko was determined to protect the mother and child battle wolves because they were the last remaining individuals of their species. When a horned dinosaur was about to attack, 
Toriko threw it into the sky, shocking everyone as they witnessed Toriko punch through the protective barrier around the arena. It turned out that Toriko wanted to create a glass fireworks display to welcome the birth of the baby battle wolf. The mother battle wolf successfully gave birth to a very healthy baby. At this moment, a devil serpent that the IGO had captured was becoming strangely agitated. Rin hadn't had a chance to use the sleeping gas on the devil serpent when it broke out of its enclosure. Mansam even used his fry panch to defeat a multi-headed bird to assist Toriko. He couldn't understand how a cloned creature like the battle wolf could have offspring. Tina took the opportunity to run up and filmed the rare mother and child battle wolves. However, the devil serpent chased after Rin as she ran out of the arena. Easily defeating all the other creatures in the blink of an eye. In the face of the devil serpent's appearance, the audience panicked and fled in chaos. Still, Mansam noticed that the president of the Roto Republic remained seated in the stands. However, as Mansam approached, the president suddenly used one hand to stab Mansam. So, Mansam used his fry panch technique to knock him away. It turned out that the person was not the president of the Roto Republic but a robot from the Gourmet Corp organization. However, Toriko realized that it was not the same robot they had encountered before. At this moment, the devil serpent was preparing to attack the mother and child battle wolves. The mother battle wolf moved at a dizzying speed and bit through the serpent's body, leaving Toriko astonished. Immediately after, the baby battle wolf happily ran towards its mother, but as it reached her, the robot shot through the mother's body. When Mansam was stabbed in the chest, Kamatsu was extremely shocked. However, after pouring some alcohol on the wound, it disappeared as if nothing had happened. The mother battle wolf continued to approach her cub, and Rin released a thick fog to prevent the robot from attacking them again. Mansam explained that the person controlling the robot was somewhere else, but these robots could still exert all the strength of their controllers. After witnessing the mother battle wolf being shot by the robot, Toriko felt extreme anger. He immediately rushed and punched the dust bag into the robot's face. However, the robot showed no signs of being affected and fired a barrage of energy blades towards Toriko. Nevertheless, Toriko evaded these blades and launched a continuous series of punches to send the robot flying. Due to the robot's excessively tough body, Toriko's right arm became numb after that blow. Then, the robot continued to launch energy blades to push Toriko back. Toriko now had only his left arm left for a final blow. When the robot separated its face to fire a laser beam, Toriko rushed in and punched the robot in the face. Toriko's unexpected punch caused the robot's head to explode instantly. However, the robot was still functioning and was about to self-destruct to blow up the entire arena. Fortunately, Mansam gave orders to his subordinates to fire a laser beam to destroy it. The control core of the robot popped out, attempting to escape, but Mansam ordered his level 35 pet beast named Riki to chase and eliminate the control core. Meanwhile, in the Bishikukai's hideout, the controller of the robot, named Bei, was showing extreme frustration. Luckily for Bei, he had only lost the robot, as he would have met his demise if he had engaged directly. The mother battle wolf passed away due to her severe injuries, while the baby battle wolf offered Toriko a piece of devil serpent meat as thanks for avenging her mother. Toriko accepted the baby battle wolf as his pet and named it Terry. That evening, Mansam organized a feast to treat everyone, and since Mansam was quite a drinker, the menu consisted of various dishes cooked with alcohol. Mansam also invited Tina to the party, but it seemed that Rin wasn't too fond of her. After the meal, Mansam remembered that they had forgotten about capturing the regal mammoth. However, Rin informed them that her elder brother, Sani, had already captured the regal mammoth. Toriko and the others went outside to wait for Sani to bring the mammoth. They took the opportunity to have another piece of meat to curb their hunger. When they saw Sani effortlessly carrying an enormous mammoth with one hand, everyone was astonished. The other beasts that were about to attack Sani immediately fainted. Sani then threw the mammoth towards the group, and Mansam had to exert all his strength to catch it. Sani was revealed to be one of the four heavenly kings. This guy Sani only likes beautiful things, so he scolded Rin when he noticed she seemed to have gained some weight. However, Mansam explained that the elephant Sani brought back was just a baby mammoth, leaving everyone astonished, unable to imagine how much bigger the mother mammoth would be. Meanwhile, a sous chef from the Bishikukai named Starjun was planning to capture the regal mammoth. He sent some subordinates to infiltrate Mansam's garden using robots. Starjun was the one controlling the black robot that Toriko and Coco encountered in the puffer whale graveyard. Toriko and the others arrived at a place called the Black Grass Plains. Sani wondered what Kamatsu ate every day to have such an unsightly appearance. Sani claimed that his menu consisted of high-quality dishes good for women's skin. 
Suddenly, a herd of level 27 rock drums approached to attack them. Toriko immediately engaged in battle with the rock drums because their meat grilled up beautifully. Sani, on the other hand, refused to fight because he didn't like dealing with ugly things. However, when he saw Rin being pursued by one of the rock drums, Sani used a gust to blow it away and save his sister. Sani wanted to collect the shells of the rock drums because they could be used to make extremely beautiful furniture. Sani possessed tiny sensory hairs on his head, and these hairs were so strong that he could lift an entire mammoth with them. Even turning them into a protective shield to counter enemy attacks. Meanwhile, Mansam was taking the baby regal mammoth back to the laboratory when he received news that the Bishakukai was attacking the garden. The Toriko team had missed one of the rock drums, so it returned and sent them flying in different directions. Sani and Kamatsu were thrown to a forest filled with giant mushroom creatures. Surprisingly, Kamatsu was delighted when he found a group of squids that could spray chili sauce, while Sani found these squids disgusting. Toriko and Rin ended up in the same location, surrounded by a forest full of bizarre creatures. Rin was happy to be alone with Toriko, but they found themselves in a forest teeming with wild beasts. Tina and Terry remained in their original spot since they were not attacked by the rock drums. Tina suddenly spotted the black robot controlled by Starjun passing by. Sensing danger, Terry carried Tina and went to find Toriko. Toriko and Rin were being surrounded by a group of wild beasts, so Toriko told Rin to spray her combat gas on him. After being stimulated by the combat gas, Toriko's killing intent surged, causing the beasts to panic and flee. Kamatsu grilled some mushrooms and sprayed a bit of squid sauce from the squid he found to make a fragrant grilled mushroom dish. Sani, on the other hand, found the dish Kamatsu was making truly repulsive, but he praised Kamatsu's kitchen knife and his exquisite cooking skills. Mansam brought the baby regal mammoth back to headquarters to obtain jewel meat, which was the most delicious part inside the regal mammoth's body. Meanwhile, a member of the Bishakokai, a robotic being, was massacring the creatures in the garden. However, it was crushed by the mother regal mammoth while searching for its own child. Kamatsu and Sani encountered a swamp, so Sani used his hair to get them both to the other side. There, they suddenly saw the carcass of a creature that had been killed by the Bishakokai. Sani realized that the Bishakokai hunts for gourmet cells in order to implant them into human bodies, granting them superhuman abilities. Mansam and the four heavenly kings had received gourmet cell implants, which is why they were so powerful. Toriko faced off against a level 28 lizard and fought it until he was exhausted. He managed to defeat the lizard and captured it to use as his mount. On the way to the regal mammoth slayer, Toriko and Rin encountered a devil athletics pit, a dangerous racetrack filled with fierce beasts built by the IGO. Toriko, weakened by hunger, needed to find a safe path. After crossing the swamp, Sani and Kamatsu discovered a massive candy tree, and Kamatsu made some cakes with mushrooms he had gathered earlier. Even someone as picky as Sani had to admit that the food was delicious. They continued on their way to the regal mammoth slayer and were shocked to find enormous footprints belonging to a giant pink robot controlled by a Bishakukai member named Jido. Meanwhile, Toriko's group encountered a mysterious creature called the Mystery Bird. When Toriko's lizard lunged at it, it was hit by the Mystery Bird's breath and fell into a ravine. This strange bird had incredible speed and could create illusions, making it difficult for Toriko to determine its real location. Toriko was then attacked by the bird but was saved when Terry intervened and kicked the bird away. Toriko was relieved to find out that Terry and Tina were safe. The mystery bird recognized the Qian Lang bloodline in Terry, so it froze in fear, allowing Toriko and the others to continue their journey. Thanks to Terry's sharp sense of smell, they easily navigated through devil athletics without encountering any dangerous beasts. However, Terry suddenly sensed the presence of Starjun in devil athletics and immediately turned back to confront him. Despite knowing that Terry was chasing a dangerous adversary, Toriko and the group had to continue their search for the regal mammoth. Meanwhile, Sani was pulling Kamatsu up a steep and towering mountain. At the mountain's peak, Jido was fiercely attacking the mother regal mammoth. But his attacks were ineffective against the gigantic creature. The regal mammoth absorbed all the creatures in front of it into its trunk and then expelled their bones after consuming them. Afterward, the mother regal mammoth went into a frenzied charge down the mountainside in search of her offspring. Sani and Kamatsu, on the other hand, had to delicately traverse through a territory inhabited by a herd of heavy cliff creatures. They were shocked when they saw the massive figure of the mother regal mammoth descending towards them. Toriko and the two girls also rushed to the scene and witnessed the mother regal mammoth falling from the mountain. The heavy cliff herd attacked Sani and Kamatsu, believing that they were threatening their territory. In a hurry, Sani had to pull Kamatsu and dash down the mountain in a frenzy. 
When Toriko saw that Sani and Kamatsu were in danger, he created a square-shaped pit in the ground and used his hand to scoop out a large chunk of earth to create a safe spot for their group. Sani and Kamatsu managed to jump into the pit with Toriko's group just before the Mother Regal Mammoth crashed down. The Mother Regal Mammoth created a massive crater after the collision, while everyone was fortunate to survive thanks to the pit that Toriko had dug in Sani's shield. They only now realized that the Mother Regal Mammoth was as big as a mountain, and the Heavy Cliffs also survived the fall because their bodies became as hard as stone when they curled up. The Heavy Cliffs charged at Toriko's group, believing they were the ones who had damaged their homes. However, the Heavy Cliffs suddenly became paralyzed and fell to the ground because they were poisoned, and everyone discovered that Coco had used his paralysis poison to incapacitate them. Sunny noticed Coco's well-timed heroic act. But when Coco reached out to shake hands with Sunny, he declined because Coco's hands were full of poison. Coco also used his poison to temporarily immobilize the Mother Regal Mammoth, and he found a robot from the Bishakukai hidden inside the mammoth, searching for the jewel meat. Kamatsu was eager to see the precious gem meat, and as everyone was trying to find a way into the mammoth, Jido's giant pink robot landed near them. Meanwhile, Starjun was still looking for a way through Devil Athletics and accidentally stumbled upon Toriko's naive lizard, promptly subduing it. Seeing that everyone was exhausted, Koko decided to leave Jido to him and called Emperor Crow to help him fight Jido's giant robot. Just as Toriko and the others were contemplating how to enter the mammoth, they were suddenly sucked inside. Koko panicked when he saw the Grim Reaper following one of them, and then Toriko and the rest were swallowed into the mouth of the Mother Regal Mammoth. The entire group realized in horror that they were standing on one of its giant teeth. As the Mother Regal Mammoth's two teeth were about to crush them, Toriko and Sani managed to hold them back and leap out just before they closed, falling straight into the mammoth's esophagus. Outside, the battle between Koko and Jido continued fiercely, with Koko solidifying his poison and creating a poison sword to attack Jido. However, Jido's robot was extremely robust, and Koko's attacks had little effect. Inside the mammoth's gut, Toriko's group accidentally encountered a green robot searching for jewel meat. The mammoth's intestines were like a maze, making it difficult for the robot to find the desired meat. Sani suggested that the group go look for the gem meat while he stayed behind to keep the green robot occupied. In reality, Sani didn't want to go deeper into the intestines as he was afraid of getting dirty, but Toriko believed that Sani would surely win because he knew his friend was extremely strong. The green robot fired an energy beam to attack Sani, but his hair blocked it all, transforming into a monster in front of the astonished robot. Terry ran up to confront Starjun and saw his attack coming before he even struck, so Terry leaped back. However, Starjun didn't want to waste time with Terry as he still needed to find the gem meat, so he left the lizard he had previously tamed to fight Terry. Meanwhile, Coco and Jido's pink robot were still locked in battle, and when Coco saw Jido preparing to fire a laser from his head, Coco rushed down and fired a poison ray at him. However, Jido successfully shot a laser that hit Coco and then kicked him to the ground, leaving him incapacitated. In this dire situation, Coco decided he would use all his strength to fight, and he released a thick cloud of poisonous smoke around Jido's robot, creating a toxic fog. However, Jido mentioned that he was controlling the robot remotely, so Coco's poison wouldn't have any effect. Immediately after, Jido caused a tremendous and terrifying explosion to dissipate Coco's toxic fog. But when Jido attempted to fire a laser to finish off Coco, he missed, even though he was at point-blank range. His robot suddenly collapsed, becoming uncontrollable. It turned out that Coco had introduced poison into the robot, corroding its control core, rendering Jido unable to control it anymore, making Coco the victor. However, while Coco was resting, Starjun suddenly appeared nearby, causing him to become greatly alarmed. After examining the baby regal mammoth, Mansan realized that it still didn't have jewel meat because it was too small. He hoped that Toriko's group would find that type of meat inside the mother regal mammoth. Starjun ignored Coco and went straight into the body of the mother mammoth. Koko saw that one of his friends was about to die in there. While searching for jewel meat, Kamatsu suddenly spotted an orange tree growing inside the mammoth's stomach and even found other rare spices. However, Toriko realized that someone had infiltrated the mammoth's body. The green robot tried to maintain a distance to avoid Sani's hair and attacked him from a distance. Recognizing that Sani would soon exhaust himself if he had to continuously defend against the attacks, Right after that, the green robot sat down, waiting for Sani's defenses to weaken, and he displayed his collection of monstrous eyes, making Sani feel nauseous. After inspecting the collection, the green robot suddenly summoned a monster with numerous eyes, and as the monster was preparing to attack Sani, he launched dozens of blades to push it away. However, when the robot saw that Sani seemed exhausted, it actively rushed in and punched Sani in the face. While searching for jewel meat, Kamatsu and Tina discussed gourmet cells. 
Tina knew that the one who discovered gourmet cells was a saint named Acacia. Saint Acacia had tasted all the finest foods in the world, but one day, he found a fish with meat so delicious that nothing could compare. Upon researching, Acacia discovered that the fish's meat was so delectable because it had consumed a certain type of jellyfish from the ocean, and after eating that jellyfish, creatures would evolve when consuming other delicious foods. So, Acacia collected the cells from these jellyfish and named them gourmet cells. The green robot continued to punch Sonny repeatedly, but Sonny was only pretending to weaken to lure him closer. Suddenly, Sonny's hair transformed into a monstrous creature and delivered a devastating blow to the robot. However, the green robot was still functional, so he attempted to flee. Sonny used his hair to infiltrate the robot's body and destroy its control core. After defeating the green robot, the mammoth suddenly blew him out, prompting Coco to order his emperor crow to fly over and rescue Sonny. Both Coco and Sonny were exhausted, so they sat outside, eating fruit while waiting for the others. The Toriko group was getting closer to the jewel meat, and the path was getting brighter. However, Toriko suddenly spotted Star June and went into a frenzy, charging to attack him. Nevertheless, with just a light punch, Star June sent Toriko flying and knocked him out cold. Rin, who was about to release smoke to help everyone escape, was also punched by Star June and left severely injured, though she still tried to release the smoke to save the others. Tina and her pigeon companion tried to run outside to call for Sonny and Coco's assistance. While Star June was preparing to attack Komatsu, Toriko suddenly stood up and punched him away. Rin realized that her injuries were severe, and she might not survive. So she asked Toriko to kiss her as a final wish for peace. After that kiss, Rin passed away instantly. Toriko, driven by anger, rushed to attack Star June furiously, seeking revenge for Rin. However, Star June remained unharmed, and he realized that Toriko was self-digesting his own body to continue the fight. Star June explained that those who were infused with gourmet cells typically had to consume large amounts of food daily to sustain themselves. Toriko had been fasting the whole day, so he was currently replenishing his energy by consuming his own gourmet cells to keep fighting. Toriko, despite pushing his limits, eventually became too weak to lift his arm. Consequently, Star June fired an incredibly powerful laser to send Toriko flying toward Tina. Tina desperately tried to awaken Toriko, but he remained motionless. Tina suddenly noticed shiny golden droplets flowing from somewhere as bright as the sun. When Tina gently placed a few drops of that liquid on Toriko's lips, he immediately woke up. They were surprised to discover that it was the meat juice flowing from the jewel meat of the mother regal mammoth. Toriko felt that the marbling in the meat was intricately carved like a work of art, and the taste of the meat juice was more aromatic than any other meat in the world. As Toriko cut a piece of jewel meat, the meat juice burst out like fireworks, and as he tasted it, he cried out in delight, feeling the sweetness of the meat juice spreading throughout his mouth. Additionally, the jewel meat stimulated the gourmet cells in Toriko's body, making him even stronger. Meanwhile, Star June was rummaging through Komatsu's bag to see if he could find anything valuable. Seeing Komatsu's beautiful knife, Star June decided to take it. However, Komatsu declared that he would reclaim the knife because a knife was a chef's life. Despite Star June emitting an intense killing intent, Komatsu refused to let go. Toriko suddenly transformed into a sleeker and more agile form, leaving Star June astonished. Star June realized that Toriko's strength had increased after consuming the jewel meat. He ordered his subordinate to deactivate the shock reduction mode to test Toriko's strength, meaning that the damage Toriko caused would be transferred to Star June's real body. Star June launched a powerful punch at Toriko, but he remained unfazed. Toriko used his knife technique to easily sever one of Starjin's arms and continued to pummel him with his three-hit combo technique, battering him like a pile of trash. After being hit by Toriko's onslaught, Starjin's robot immediately exploded into pieces, but his real body was still intact, although he was slightly injured. When they reached Rin for examination, Toriko was overjoyed to find that she was still alive. Toriko managed to obtain the jewel meat and carried Rin out of the mother regal mammoth's body along with everyone else. However, Sonny used his net to catch the jewel meat, causing Toriko to fall flat on his face. Sonny then used his hair to provide temporary aid to Zin. Coco recognized Toriko as the one who had escaped death from the Grim Reaper, and Terry had tamed a lizard, using it to transport Toriko. IGO had released the Regal Mammoth's child, but it seemed that the mother Regal Mammoth was still extremely angry. Therefore, the Toriko team hastily took the jewel meat and fled from the scene. Rin, after receiving medical treatment from IGO, recovered from the critical condition. However, upon waking up, she immediately declared herself as Toriko's girlfriend, leaving everyone speechless. That night, they organized a magnificent feast using the jewel meat from the mother regal mammoth. 
The meat emitted a glow similar to real jewel. After trying a juicy piece of the jewel meat, Komatsu felt an endless sweetness spreading throughout his mouth. Even after eating the jewel meat, everyone's bodies emitted a strange glow. Toriko invited Tina to join the table and thanked her for waking him up when he was injured. Everyone suddenly noticed Sani's body was emitting an incredibly intense light. Toriko decided that he would include this jewel meat dish in his divine menu, but Sani also wanted to feature this glowing meat as the main course on his menu. After a heated argument, Toriko reluctantly gave up this delicious meat to Sani. In the morning, Toriko woke up he immediately dug into a chocolate block in the middle of the house to eat. Toriko's house seems to be made of candy, so everything is edible, even the doorknob of his house. But he realizes that since birth, his wolf Terry hasn't eaten anything. Meanwhile, Komatsu's cooking skills have reached a new height after his journeys with Toriko, and the dishes he cooks are highly favored by high-ranking officials of the IGO. After being deceived by the robot of the Bishakukai, the president is showing anger towards other executives, and the business director of the IGO wants Komatsu to make a dish from a rare and precious species of tuna to appease him. The president loves the top-grade meat known as bubble meat from the first-rate tuna. And the deliciousness of bubble meat reaches its peak seven days after the fish is caught. Koko is preparing to leave the city but is immediately surrounded by girls who recognize him as the famous gourmet hunter. Meanwhile, Sani wants to go to the recovery country to search for good foods for his hair. Toriko leads Terry into the forest to find a suitable meal for him and encounters a level 15 flying bird. Toriko immediately uses his knocking master ability, causing the bird to collapse on the spot. Afterwards, Toriko grills the bird, but it seems that Terry is not interested. The bird has a rich and wild flavor, similar to the taste of premium wagyu beef. Additionally, the bones of the flying bird, when deep fried, become crispy like a snack. However, Toriko still hasn't found any food that Terry likes. Upon returning to the city, Toriko immediately brings a flying bird to sell at a commercial area known as the World Kitchen. The manager, Tomu, of the World Kitchen informs Toriko that the original habitat of Battle Wolf is the gourmet world. Therefore, Terry only likes food from the gourmet world, which is the undiscovered land outside the continents where humans live. Legendary gourmet hunter Jiru once found a type of corn originating from the gourmet world called BB corn. Just one BB corn kernel can produce enough popped corn for hundreds of people to eat. Although quite rare, BB corn can also be found on the Gu continent. Part of the human world, but it is located in a forest with many meat-eating plants known as the botanical hell. The next morning, Komatsu went to meet Tomo to buy ingredients to make sauce to go with the bubble meat from the first-rate tuna. When he learned that Toriko was heading to the Gu continent, Komatsu insisted on going along because there is a fruit called the star sauce fruit that makes a delicious sauce. Tina also wants to accompany Komatsu to make a YouTube video. Komatsu and Tina asked IGO staff to take them to the botanical hell on the Gu continent. Meanwhile, Sani is preparing to go to the recovery country to find hair beauty products. But upon learning that Toriko is going to the Gu continent, Rin insists that Sani must take her there to meet her crush. Toriko and Terry are flown by IGO's plane to the outskirts of the botanical hell, where Terry quickly marks his territory. Soon after, Toriko finds a plant called the lantern wine, and upon opening one, he has a bowl full of wine to quench his thirst. In addition, Toriko also finds fried potato flowers as snack. Terry suddenly discovers a giant peach lying in the middle of an empty field, and a flying squirrel suddenly emerges from below the ground, attempting to grab Terry. However, Terry jumps out in time. It turns out that this flying squirrel uses the delicious peach on its head to hunt for prey. Toriko ignores the squirrel and quickly enters the botanical hell forest to find BB corn for Terry. As Komatsu and Tina arrive, they see Toriko entering the forest from the plane. An IGO employee suggests they wait outside because the botanical hell is dangerous. However, Komatsu insists on searching for the star sauce fruit because the bubble meat will expire in two days. Suddenly, Zong comes running out of the forest with his gang revealing that they also came to explore but got scared off by a meat-eating plant. Meanwhile, as Toriko walks through the forest with Terry, a flock of loud birds suddenly defecates on Toriko. Inside the droppings are seeds of a meat-eating plant that grows rapidly. Toriko uses his knife technique to cut the plant. Next, a colossal root monster appears and grabs Terry. After a fierce struggle, Terry manages to escape, and Toriko wants Terry to defeat the creature to gain combat experience. Terry attacks the root monster with incredible speed, but the creature regenerates its wounds and easily catches Terry. It swallows Terry in front of Toriko. However, the creature suddenly bursts into flames. And it has to spit out Terry. It turns out that Terry tore the wine fruits on the creature's head, then bit down with great strength, causing the alcohol in the fruits to ignite and incinerate the creature. After climbing the trees in the forest for a while, Toriko successfully finds BB corn. 
However, Toriko can't harvest BB corn in the usual way because it's extremely tough. Toriko has to continuously use his knife technique to chop one corn, and to his amazement, he finds a corn as big as a building. Toriko tried to jump up and use his knife technique to cut the giant corn, but it proved to be challenging. Together with Terry, Toriko attempted to peel away each layer of the outer husk of the giant corn. After successfully removing the outer layers, Toriko saw the beautiful golden BB corn seeds, but extracting them was still a difficult task. Toriko circled behind the corn and continuously punched its stalk. After Toriko's powerful and fierce attacks, dozens of BB corns were released, but there were still many layers of corn that Toriko couldn't reach. To turn this section of corn into popcorn, Toriko needed to cook them at the temperature of a volcano. Toriko and Terry decided to head to a nearby volcano in this forest to roast the corn. Kamatsu's group is currently being chased by a giant flower mantis. However, Kamatsu accidentally discovers a star sauce fruit, quickly grabs it, and continues to run away from the mantis. Despite being caught by the mantis and swallowed, Kamatsu manages to scare the creature away by putting a bit of extremely spicy pepper powder into its mouth. Sani plans to make a grand entrance to save Kamatsu but fails to achieve anything remarkable. As soon as everyone sees Toriko, they express immense joy and run to greet him. Immediately after, Kamatsu and Tina ask Sani to transport them back using his flashy helicopter to prepare the tuna meat in time. Toriko leads Terry to a nearby volcano to roast the corn. The rocks in this area are arranged in layers, and as they ascend, the temperature decreases. To prevent the corn from burning, Toriko must carefully roast it from top to bottom. However, as they descend, the temperature increases, making Toriko and Terry feel the heat. Nevertheless, they are overjoyed when they see the corn popping, releasing a delicious aroma, and Terry happily devours a piece of popcorn to Toriko's delight. Toriko then took a piece and slowly savored its flavor. This popcorn had the ability to stimulate the taste buds, making Toriko unable to stop eating it. Therefore, Toriko decided to choose BB corn popcorn as the appetizer in his menu. Moreover, the volcano here emitted a type of ash containing salt to spice up this popcorn. However, a strange guy suddenly appeared and sucked away Toriko's popcorn with a large nozzle, even demanding to suck up Terry, prompting Terry to run away hastily. Toriko then rushed to strike a powerful blow at the guy's nozzle, but it didn't break. It turned out that he was a sous chef of the Bishakukai named Green Park. Green Park had very healthy lungs for sucking up food. Eating everything he could find, even rats. His nozzle was made from the proboscis of a giant mosquito, making it very sturdy. It appeared that Green Park had also come here to find BB corn as a gift for his boss, and the Bishakukai's main goal was to find a material called God. Whoever possessed this divine material would control the entire world. In ancient times, the nations of the world engaged in a war that lasted centuries. It was believed to be the world's end when the legendary gourmet hunter Acacia presented a dish called God to the leaders for a taste test. The most effective time for this dish was during the gourmet eclipse, occurring every few hundred years. After trying Acacia's God dish, the world leaders were deeply moved, and they decided to end the war so that everyone could enjoy this dish. In fact, God was the dish that opened the era of gourmet cuisine as it is known today. Green Park revealed that the gourmet eclipse would make the god dish reappear in the next few years, and many powerful hunters, as well as the bosses of Bishakukai, desired to obtain god. Toriko determined that he would make god the main course in his menu. However, when Green Park noticed Toriko also wanted to acquire god, he decided to eliminate Toriko. Both of them emitted extremely intense killing intent, threatening each other. As soon as Green Park used the suction tube to blow a strong breath towards Toriko, Toriko also threw a punch at him. The shock from that attack pushed both of them away. Green Park then tried to maintain distance and used his breath gun to attack Toriko from a distance because he knew Toriko's techniques were mostly close range. However, after consuming the diamond fork from the regal mammoth, Toriko's cells evolved. At this point, Toriko could use the knife and fork attack to strike Green Park from a very far distance. The damage was enough to injure Green Park, but it didn't finish him off. Green Park took a deep breath and blew an incredibly powerful breath towards Toriko evaporating everything in an instant. However, Toriko suddenly slipped behind Green Park and severed his suction tube. It turned out Toriko had waited for the moment when Green Park lost visibility due to his skills to fly over. After the fight, Green Park realized Toriko was a very powerful opponent. However, Green Park abruptly requested to stop the game and called back his pet. Toriko was amazed to see that Green Park's insect was carrying a gigantic BB corn. Green Park then jumped onto the back of the insect and left with the BB corn. Toriko realized that the sous chefs of the Bishakukai were as strong as monsters. At this moment, many reporters were gathered at the dinner of politicians, including President Roto. There were only five minutes left until the first grade tuna meat reached its peak flavor.
However, Komatsu had not yet brought back the star sauce, so the IGO business director decided to temporarily serve the president with tuna and soy sauce. Immediately after, Sonny crashed his helicopter in front of the hotel. Some reporters quickly surrounded Komatsu when they found out he was the chef for the first grade tuna. However, Komatsu swiftly ran into the hotel to complete the first grade tuna dish on time. The IGO business director then brought the tuna with soy sauce to President Roto. Komatsu suddenly appeared and stopped the president to wait for him to finish the star sauce. However, while Komatsu was preparing the sauce for the tuna dish, the tuna suddenly turned into bubbles because, after reaching its peak flavor, the tuna would transform into bubbles and disappear. After waiting for a long time without food, President Roto became very angry and demanded to leave. However, Koko suddenly brought another first-grade tuna, delighting Komatsu. He received this tuna from a seafood company as a gift after helping them catch three tunas. Another issue was that Komatsu's sauce lacked a bit of salt. Toriko appeared with a bag of salt that he obtained from the volcano on the gourmet continent. Komatsu then recreated the tuna dish with all the necessary ingredients. After trying a piece of the first grade tuna, President Roto sensed the taste of all sea creatures, and the star sauce brought the flavor of various vegetables. After finishing Komatsu's tuna dish, President Roto was no longer angry. Toriko also made a lot of BB corn snacks to treat everyone, and when drizzled with Komatsu's star sauce, the corn snacks became even more delicious. Many days later, Toriko took Komatsu to a massive culinary city called Gourmet Town. Komatsu was amazed because Gourmet Town had all the dishes from around the world. Meanwhile, Bishikokai's head chef, Koromato, gathered his subordinates for a feast. However, Green Park returned and sucked all the food from the table. Koromato felt sad after failing to hunt the diamond meat of the Jewel King, as eating that meat would elevate the gourmet cells to a new level. Nevertheless, it's not only the diamond meat that can help gourmet cells evolve, and they plan to search for the century soup in the Icehell continent to achieve evolution. Only those with legitimate citizenship cards are allowed to enter gourmet town. However, nonchalant individuals like Zong are not allowed. Knowing Toriko was famous, a kebab shop invited him to try a piece, but Toriko requested the entire giant meat skewer and ate it all in one go. After finishing the kebab, Toriko and Komatsu went to ramen Ichiraku. Toriko continuously ate over 5 million yen worth of ramen, causing the shop to close for the day. During a buffet, Toriko ate all the food on the conveyor belt. Later, he took Komatsu to a kitchenware store, where Komatsu was fascinated by the high-quality cooking utensils. However, a wealthy old man suddenly appeared and bought everything in the store. Toriko came to Gourmet Town today to meet an elderly woman named Setsuno. Komatsu was amazed to recognize Setsuno as a legendary chef worldwide. Setsuno then insisted that Toriko tidy up to visit her restaurant, which she doesn't open regularly but only when she feels like it. On the way, Setsuno revealed that she used to be a pair with the legendary gourmet hunter Jiru, as hunters often collaborate with suitable chefs to process the ingredients they find. Upon reaching Setsuno's restaurant, Komatsu was surprised to see a large castle-like structure, but in reality, Setsuno's restaurant was a humble hut next to that castle. Upon entering, Komatsu was even more astonished to find that it was a very ordinary rice eatery. Setsuno explained that today she would cook a special dish for Toriko and Komatsu, and they were surprised when they learned that the intended dish was the century soup. Setsuno began preparing the ingredients, and Komatsu was amazed by her incredible cutting skills. The restaurant used top-notch light beverages, and all the dishes were made from extremely rare ingredients. While waiting for the century soup, Setsuno used 10 egg yolks to make garlic fried rice for Toriko and Komatsu to have as an appetizer. After trying a piece of meat, Komatsu felt the harmony of the garlic and the rich flavor of the egg. Setsuno was surprised at how well Komatsu's taste buds responded. Setsuno then declared that she had finished making the century soup. However, when she opened the soup pot, Toriko and Komatsu only saw an empty pot. Nevertheless, Toriko could still smell the aroma of various ingredients, and the fragrance of the soup attracted many people, including Tina, who came to record a food review video. It turned out that Setsuno made the century soup by simmering various ingredients for half a year and then filtering out impurities, making the soup transparent to the naked eye. Although it was as clear as filtered water, Toriko and Komatsu could still perceive the rich taste of the ingredients. Setsuno then led Toriko and Komatsu to visit her actual kitchen below the basement, and they were astonished to find her supersized kitchen with rare ingredients. Setsuno took them to a giant pot used to cook the century soup. She effortlessly jumped onto the pot's rim, while Toriko and Komatsu had to climb a ladder since the pot was hundreds of meters high. Upon reaching the pot's rim, Toriko and Komatsu unexpectedly saw hundreds of rare ingredients being stewed by Setsuno. However, Setsuno revealed that her century soup was not yet complete. 
The century soup originated from nature, and after Jiru had a taste of the true century soup, Setsuno tried to recreate it as closely as possible but still couldn't find a certain flavor to perfect the soup. Feeling that Toriko and Komatsu had excellent taste buds, Setsuno asked them to find the true century soup for her. They immediately agreed because they also wanted to experience the true century soup. But before setting out, Toriko needed to buy some supplies from a bar, and the place he went to was a bar where hunters usually gathered to drink and relax. A scar-faced hunter named Max approached a young man named Takamaro, a member of the Gourmet Knights. However, upon Toriko's arrival, everyone fell silent as Toriko was a top-tier hunter globally, earning him the respect of all the hunters. Toriko asked the bar owner to pour him a beer, and he downed it in one go. As soon as Zong noticed Toriko, he approached to strike up a conversation, making everyone think that he, too, must be a skilled individual. Suddenly, a group of guards in black attire rushed into the bar, and an old man named Major Marco appeared to the astonishment of everyone. Komatsu recognized him as the wealthy man who had bought all the cooking utensils on a previous occasion. It turned out that Marco came to hire hunters to find the century soup for him, offering a reward of over 10 billion yen. Excited by the enormous prize money, everyone gladly accepted the mission, including Toriko and Komatsu, who were on a quest to find the century soup for Setsuno. The bar owner led Toriko to a secret room, where he kept equipment for professional hunters. Toriko purchased a device capable of reading the nutritional content of ingredients. The next morning, all the hunters, including Toriko and Komatsu, boarded Marco's ship to embark on the journey to find the century soup. Tina, disguised as a hunter, also joined to record the adventure. Marco informed everyone that the century soup would appear in a frigid area known as Ice Hell, which used to be a place for preserving food before the invention of refrigerators. The frozen food there piled up into a colossal tower, and every century, the ice would melt, releasing the flavors of the ingredients within. The liquid that flowed from the ice was the century soup. Each person was given an insulated suit because the ice hell was extremely cold. Toriko befriended Takamaro, as Toriko also knew his team captain. Suddenly, a group of crocodiles climbed onto the boat and attacked everyone, but Max easily slashed one crocodile into three pieces, while Takamaro used his internal energy and punch to break all the crocodile's ribs. The final boat reached the towering ice mountain known as Ice Hell, and a massive chunk of ice suddenly fell onto the boat, frightening everyone. Toriko unleashed a powerful triple-hit fist, shattering the ice, leaving everyone in awe. As the mountain was quite tall, Marco prepared a helicopter to take everyone to the top. However, due to having only one helicopter, the group had to split into two trips. Toriko and Komatsu took the first trip, with Tina following them to film. Coincidentally, Zong and his gang met Tina, and to showcase his strength, Zong decided not to wear the thermal suit. However, upon landing, Zong felt the extreme cold, and due to strong winds at the mountaintop, the helicopter could only get everyone close to the summit. Toriko then carried Komatsu and climbed to the summit along with other hunters. Once they arrived, they unexpectedly saw a dragon frozen in ice. Toriko recognized it as the most powerful creature in Ice Hell, called the Frozen Dragon. Since it was the mightiest being, it couldn't be frozen easily like this. Meanwhile, some unknown individuals had infiltrated the second flight, and Marco used a holographic image to falsely claim he wasn't accompanying the hunters. Because Tina had weak legs and soft hands, she asked Zong to carry her up the mountain. However, due to the freezing wind, Tina couldn't speak in the video. Toriko then took the role of the group leader, leading everyone into the center of the icy mountain. Zong took a separate path, instructing his subordinates to find another way. Absorbed in filming, Tina got separated from Toriko's group but luckily found Zong's group and decided to travel with them. The Toriko team struggled to move through the fierce and chilling winds, sometimes blowing ice shards as sharp as spears. When they noticed everyone was getting quite exhausted, Toriko quickly dug a square hole in the snow, and the entire group went down into the pit to take a break. Komatsu was completely exhausted from the extreme cold, so Takamaru prepared a cup of hot milk for him. Despite his dislike for Max, Takamaru made a cup for him too. Meanwhile, Toriko stood guard above, still curious about the one who froze the frozen dragon. On the other hand, a Bishakukai group also set foot on the ice hell and was led by a sous chef named Tommy who was also the one responsible for killing the frozen dragon. Seeing Toriko on guard for quite some time, Max suggested switching shifts with him. Max thanked Toriko for his assistance in getting the gang this far. Zong's group, including Tina, found a windless path but got startled when they accidentally stumbled upon the den of giant snow lions. They had to quickly run away before becoming the lion's prey. As Komatsu couldn't bear the extreme cold, Toriko had to carry him. When the group continued moving and found a type of mushroom with heat-retaining properties, Toriko immediately fed it to Komatsu to restore his strength. Soon after, the Toriko team encountered a herd of snowball. Classified as level 11. 
Takamaro activated his internal energy and swiftly struck to break the bones of one snowball. Max and Toriko easily defeated two more snowballs, and Toriko suddenly emitted a terrifying aura to drive away the remaining bulls, leaving Max astonished. Toriko stripped the fur from the herd of bulls and used them as coats for everyone. The meat was delicious, so Toriko also grilled some for a satisfying meal. Meanwhile, Tommy released some repulsive bugs from his mouth and commanded them to chase after the Toriko team, leading to a brutal attack. After finishing their meal, the Toriko team reached the central ice mountain, but only Max and Takamara remained in the group as most of the other hunters had given up along the way. Having escaped the sea lion encounter, Zong's group, including Tina, encountered a snow leopard. While trying to escape, they fell down a cliff. Tina managed to capture some footage before her potential demise. Fortunately, they landed on a small rock ledge on the mountainside and found a cave leading straight into the heart of Ice Hell. A mysterious masked individual infiltrated the second flight to get to this point. When seeing Tommy's bugs flying by, he effortlessly subdued them. Tommy and his two henchmen later discovered the dead bugs. However, the masked man had already left and entered a cave leading to the center of the island. Toriko explained that the century soup typically emits a radiant glow, inviting diners. As they conversed, a polar bear with a single horn suddenly attacked them. Toriko swiftly defeated the bear with his fork and knife technique. After defeating the one-horned bear, they proceeded to butcher it for a hot pot, and Toriko found the flavor of bear meat to be simple yet as delicious as a home-cooked meal. While enjoying their meal, Komatsu was startled to see a baby penguin behind him. Toriko expressed surprise as the penguin species was considered extinct. Finding the baby penguin adorable, Komatsu wanted to take it along. However, Toriko warned that penguin parents might be searching for it, and they could be very aggressive. After Max entered the rest tent, others asked Max's subordinates why they followed him. It turned out they were born in a poor town called Neck, and Max used to bring food there, distributing it among hungry children. Grateful, they now followed him to repay the kindness and help him find more food for the hungry kids in their town. Toriko wondered why gourmet knights allowed a rookie like Takamaru to search for the century soup. It turned out Takamara volunteered to go alone to earn money for their leader's medical treatment. People in the Gourmet Nights were all searching for the century soup to help others, while Toriko's motive was merely to fill his own hungry stomach. Mansam knew Toriko was searching for the century soup but worried he might face difficulties alone, so he instructed Koko to assist him. While walking through a cave, Zong and Tina encountered a frozen, multi-mouthed monster. In their panic, the mysterious masked person approached, revealing himself as Tepe, a talkative young man. After a brief conversation, Tepe left, leaving Zon and Tina bewildered. Meanwhile, Toriko's group, on their quest for the century soup, was attacked by a swarm of insects with incredible speed. Unable to defeat them, Tommy, the summoner of the insects, intervened. In the midst of the battle, Tommy suddenly ordered the insects to retreat, and he, along with his two subordinates, headed straight for Toriko's group to handle them personally. Upon arriving, Tommy quickly ran to hug Toriko affectionately and took the opportunity to stab him in the abdomen. However, Toriko tensed his muscles, preventing Tommy from piercing through. As Toriko was about to punch Tommy in the face, he released a bizarre monster to bite Toriko's hand. Shortly after, two gigantic penguin parents arrived and attacked everyone, thinking they had captured their child. The enraged penguin stomped continuously until the ground cracked. The group fell into an underground tunnel, revealing an ice tower filled with cooking ingredients inside. They realized that the century soup would melt from this ice tower. Toriko's right hand was frozen by the bizarre monster Tommy released earlier. Toriko explained that the century soup would melt at the bottom of the ice tower. He instructed Komatsu to go down and search for the soup while he stayed to confront Tommy. As Bogey and Barry were about to chase Komatsu, Max and Takamaro rushed forward to block their path. Komatsu promised to find the century soup for everyone. Toriko was a bit curious as this time the Bishikokai didn't use robots for the battle. He knew Tommy had strength comparable to Star June in Green Park. Nevertheless, he was thrilled to face a sous chef with skills in both bones and flesh. The two penguin parents danced joyfully upon finding their child. As they ran down the bottom of the ice tower, Komatsu accidentally encountered Tepe. Suddenly, Tepe rushed towards Komatsu, startling him. However, Tepe only wanted to swat away some level 30 mosquitoes flying around Komatsu. Tepe discovered a small Bishikokai android lurking in the area. Hearing the loud noise from the penguin family, Tommy wanted them to shut up, so he immediately released a giant centipede to kill the two penguin parents. Witnessing this, Toriko thought that Tommy was a waste of space and didn't value the lives of other creatures. On the other side, Max continued to shoot bullets towards Barry, but Barry could excrete an extremely slippery oil to deflect the bullets. Takamaru was charging at Barry when Bogey stepped in to block the attack. Takamaru used his unique move, 
popping the cork from his bottle to hit Bogey away from the bodyguard. It turned out that Bogey's ability involved taking control of other creatures' bodies and expanding his body according to his will. While being attacked from a distance by Bogey, Takamaru revealed his right eye, and Bogey realized that Takamaru was infected with a virus from the gourmet world. At this time, Koko hadn't yet gone to support Toriko but went to find Setsuno to talk. Takamaru continuously used his bottle-popping move to hit Bogey's ribcage, but it didn't work. Bogey's bone structure was entirely different from ordinary humans. While a regular person had 206 bones, Bogey had up to 4,000 to allow him to stretch his body at will. Bogey transformed his bones into a sickle and a weight and attacked Takamaru from a distance. Every time Takamaru used his bottle-popping move, his bones would instantly regenerate. Leaving Takamaru helpless against Bogey's relentless attacks. However, Takamaru continued to fight because he wanted to find a cure for his captain. While Takamaru was using his internal energy, Bogey suddenly rushed in to attack him. However, Bogey's attack had no effect on Takamaru after he had finished channeling his internal energy. Takamaru also noticed a bone segment that Bogey couldn't regenerate. Immediately, Takamaru used his bottle-popping move to knock a bone segment out of Bogey. It turned out that this bone segment was the connection between the anus and the spine. Losing this bone segment left Bogey unable to move. As Takamaru collapsed from exhaustion, Bogey also fell to the ground. Tepe tried to prevent Kamatsu from searching for the sentry soup, knowing that the tiny robot was dangerous. However, Kamatsu had promised Toriko to find the soup, and the one controlling the tiny robot was a guy named Ayu. The battle between Max and Barry was still intense, but Max's sword strike seemed ineffective because Barry wore an extremely robust armor made from the shell of a level 60 turtle. Barry's swift movements made it challenging for Max to react. Additionally, the layer of oil from Barry's body helped maintain heat, allowing him to fight easily in the freezing weather. Max's movement slowed down due to the bone-chilling cold, and he wanted to use a deadly move to defeat Barry, but it required time to channel his internal energy. His gang tried to hold Barry back for a while. However, being weak, they were punched by Barry and couldn't stand up. Nevertheless, Max and his gang successfully held Barry long enough for Max to complete his internal energy channeling. Max angrily rushed forward, delivering a swift and powerful strike with his sword. Max revealed that his sword was made from the teeth of a level 68 dragon which had bitten through the turtle shell that Barry used for his armor and consumed its flesh. After Max's strike, Barry was completely defeated, but Max also collapsed due to exhaustion. While the battle between Toriko and Tommy was still raging fiercely, Toriko had to continuously use his flying fork technique to eliminate the hard-winged bugs vomited by Tommy. However, Tommy's swarm of bugs, numbering in the thousands, made it extremely difficult for Toriko. Max wanted to help Toriko defeat Tommy, but he was no match for either of them. Tommy released a swarm of explosive bugs that attached to Toriko and detonated simultaneously. Kamatsu had descended to the bottom of the ice pillar, only to realize that there was no century soup flowing here. Tepe then approached and covered Kamatsu's mouth, writing him a message. Despite Tepe's terrible handwriting, he conveyed to Kamatsu that he needed to stay silent because Marco had planted listening devices in their outfits. If Marco learned that there was no century soup, he would undoubtedly abandon everyone here. Zong's group, along with Tina, arrived at the location and was shocked to find no century soup. Tepe rushed to Zong to silence him, but the talkative guy accidentally revealed that there was no soup here. Marco, upon hearing this, ordered his ship to abandon the hunters and return home. After the explosion from Tommy's bugs, Toriko's thermal insulation suit was blown away. To avoid getting cold while shirtless, Toriko generated an immense amount of heat by shivering. Tina was horrified to learn that Marco would abandon everyone, and upon questioning, Kamatsu unexpectedly discovered that Tepe was a gourmet reviver. After shivering for a while, Toriko produced enough heat to melt the ice on his arm. However, continuous shivering would quickly deplete Toriko's energy. Tommy revealed that he couldn't continuously generate insects and that he was nurturing over 10,000 insect eggs in his stomach. He used energy to make them hatch when they reached his throat, but he still had enough strength to give birth to 1,000 insect offspring. At this moment, Koko had foreseen that everyone was in danger in the icy hell, and Setsuno had prepared numerous food boxes. They decided to go rescue them together. It turns out that gourmet revivers like Tepe often have the responsibility of protecting ingredients that are becoming extinct, and Tepe was sent here by his master to revive the century soup as it was about to disappear. It seemed that there was no more century soup flowing from the ice. Shortly after, a baby penguin came here looking for Kamatsu. Seeing its sad appearance, Kamatsu realized that its parents had been killed. Soon after, they saw a sudden aurora, and they joyfully realized that there was still a small amount of century soup somewhere around. Toriko was still trying to eliminate the swarm of insects vomited by Tommy, numbering in the thousands. 
However, the swarm kept increasing, surrounding Toriko completely. Tommy, exhausted after vomiting so many insects, along with Max, believed that Toriko must have been devoured by the flesh-eating insects. Tommy wanted to make sure, so he rushed forward to deliver a finishing blow to Toriko. However, Toriko suddenly escaped from the swarm of insects and unleashed a powerful blow that made Tommy vomit all the water. It turned out that when surrounded by the insect swarm, Toriko's gourmet cells automatically secreted an insecticide. This substance was the same as what plants produce to prevent insects from eating their stems and leaves. Sensing danger, Toriko's gourmet cells released this substance automatically. After smelling Toriko's insecticide, Tommy's insect swarm moved slower, so he decided to unleash a set of sharp teeth and personally defeat Toriko. Thanks to the insect wings, Tommy could move as fast as a hornet, making it impossible for Toriko to land a hit on him. Even Toriko's flying knives were ineffective against his overwhelming speed. Tommy attempted to use his sharp jaws to attack Toriko, but Toriko managed to cut one of Tommy's wings when he tried to get closer. Enraged, Tommy flared up to generate an immense amount of heat. He then continuously fired powerful explosive bullets at Toriko. Toriko realized that Tommy had heated the insect eggs inside his body and sprayed them out at high speed to make them explode. Despite losing his left arm, Toriko approached Tommy and unleashed a powerful barrage of punches called the Tenfold One Point Heavy Strike. As Toriko closed in, Tommy shot off Toriko's left arm, but Toriko managed to land the Tenfold One Point Heavy Strike, making Tommy vomit. Toriko relentlessly continued to punch Tommy, breaking all his teeth with his right arm. The intense battle between the two caused the entire cave to tremble violently. Tepe extracted a seed called the forest planting seed from his ear and threw it toward the top of the cave. This seed grew into a giant vine that covered the entire ice tower, ensuring that it wouldn't collapse. Once certain the tower was secure, Tepe ran to assist Toriko. Despite the fierce fight, Toriko was noticeably weakening while Tommy remained strong. Tommy decided it was time to finish Toriko and tensed his muscles. Appearing like a giant. He charged forward and landed a powerful punch on Toriko without any resistance. Meanwhile, Kamatsu and Tina were still trying to find the century soup. Suddenly, the cave collapsed, separating the two. Fortunately, Kamatsu found the last remaining portion of the century soup on his side of the cave. But the miniature robot stopped Kamatsu and stole his portion of the soup. Toriko is currently facing a lot of difficulties because his right arm has exhausted all its strength. However, Toriko came up with a strategy using his knife and kicked Tommy's arm away. Then, he used a fork to pierce three holes in Tommy. Nevertheless, Toriko collapsed immediately due to exhaustion. Tommy, in anger, rushed to take Toriko's life despite being heavily injured. However, a bunch of vines suddenly appeared to protect Toriko before he could be finished off, and the one responsible for creating those vines was none other than Tepe. Tepe revealed that those who recover ingredients, like him, have the duty to capture the Bishakukai for their acts of destroying ingredients. Tommy and his two subordinates recognized Tepe as the grandson of legendary gourmet hunter Jiru. Just as Tommy lunged forward to attack, Tepe struck all his pressure points, rendering him immobile. However, Tommy still tried to vomit out a giant insect, a hybrid of a beetle and a spider. After releasing the creature, Tommy shrank, weakened, and collapsed. The beetle-like monster shot out an ice block, freezing Max's leg, and emitted a toxic smoke to attack Tepe, but he managed to evade. This monster could also shoot threads like a spider because Tommy had genetically engineered it from over 10 different species. Upon learning that the miniature robot had obtained the century soup, Barry and Bogey decided to leave. However, as they exited, they encountered the multi-mouthed creature they had frozen earlier. It immediately devoured Barry and Bogey. It turns out the multi-mouthed creature is the ruler of this continent, so Tepe released it. As soon as it saw the beetle, the multi-mouthed creature rushed to attack because it was very hungry after being frozen for hundreds of years. However, the beetle was also very strong, leading to an evenly matched battle between the two monsters. After tossing a peculiar leaf onto his hand, Tepe's nail suddenly extended. He used acupuncture with his elongated nails to revive Toriko. Following that, Tepe used medicinal herbs to bandage Takamaro and Max's injuries. Tina and the Zong group found Kamatsu unconscious. Upon waking up, Kamatsu cried when he realized he had lost the last century soup. The Toriko team carried the injured individuals to this location. Kamatsu apologized to Toriko and everyone for allowing the century soup to fall into the hands of the Bishikokai. However, Toriko prioritized the lives of everyone, so he did not blame Kamatsu. Setsuno had asked Tepe's master to assist Toriko in finding the century soup, but he was occupied with some important matters, so Tepe was sent instead. The two monsters were still fiercely battling outside, and the miniature robot delivered the soup he took from Kamatsu to a Bishikukai sous chef named Alfaril. Seeing the monsters causing a ruckus, Alfaril threw out six discs from his six hands to eliminate them. 
Surprisingly, Barry and Bogey fell out from inside the multi-mouthed creature. Tepe used a weed-killing medicine to wither the vines he created around the ice tower. He tried to collapse the ice tower, hoping to find the century soup, even if it was just a drop. Tepe succeeded in bringing down the ice tower, surprising everyone, and indeed, a small remaining drop of century soup appeared from the sky. Immediately after, the last drop of century soup fell into Komatsu's hands, much to the joy of the entire group. However, with such a tiny drop of soup, they were unsure who should eat it. Everyone tried to give it to each other, even though they were all desperately hungry. Finally, they decided to let Komatsu taste the drop of soup so he could experience its flavor and recreate it in the future. Komatsu promised not to disappoint everyone and consumed the last drop of century soup. After finishing it, Komatsu laughed like a fool because the soup was incredibly delicious. Alfril and his two subordinates were planning to eliminate Toriko to reduce the number of opponents. Toriko and Tepe sensed that Alfril was much stronger than Tommy. However, Setsuno appeared to block Alfril and his subordinates. Alfril wondered why someone of Setsuno's caliber was in such a desolate place. Setsuno explained that she came to bring Toriko and his friends back home, and if Alfril dared to harm Toriko, she would make sure he stayed in that place permanently. As Setsuno left, Alfril intended to launch his discs secretly, but they shattered instantly at the sound of her cough. Realizing he was no match for her, Alfril ordered his subordinates to carry Tommy and fled. Toriko and his friends finally found their way out of the cave, only to be shocked to discover that Marco had abandoned them. However, their joy returned when Koko arrived on the Emperor Crow to rescue them. Setsuno also brought a giant limousine jellyfish to transport them home. Ecstatic, everyone climbed onto Setsuno's limousine jellyfish. The limousine jellyfish, despite being a living creature, provided all the amenities of a home. Toriko couldn't contain his excitement when Setsuno prepared a feast for everyone. They eagerly indulged in the food to regain their strength after a challenging journey. Tina, on the other hand, was busy recording a video for YouTube, as she forgot to capture the century soup. However, if she could capture Setsuno's culinary creations, it was sure to attract many views. Setsuno was very angry because she had assigned the task of supporting Toriko to master Yasaku of Tepe, and he had pushed it to his disciple. Setsuno said that Toriko could heal his arm when he arrived at Recovery Country. After many hours of flying, Setsuno took everyone to Recovery Country to treat Toriko and other injured young men. As for Komatsu, she took him to Igo's hotel to study how to make the century soup. Because Max's siblings were still seriously injured, everyone had to carry them into the city by stretcher, and Recovery Country was a place where many people gathered for treatment with various types of clinics, such as acupuncture with dragon bone or shark back bath. But when Toriko saw Zong in the bath, he didn't want to take a bath anymore. In those baths, there were small fish with the ability to suck toxins out of the human body. After taking a stroll, Toriko accidentally met Sani, who was also bathing here. It turned out that Sani came to Recovery Country to enjoy items that could make his hair smooth, but besides that, Sani also wanted to find a dessert to add to his menu. After talking for a while, Sani was shocked to realize that Toriko had lost one arm like Shanks, and Tepe informed him that his master, Yasaku, could restore Toriko's severed arm. Just mentioning Yasaku, everyone suddenly saw him sitting and eating at a nearby table. So they called Yasaku to join them and recounted the whole story to him. But everyone was very surprised to find out that Yasaku was an old man who lived without any principles. Meanwhile, Koko returned to Igo to report the situation to Mansam and the vice chairman. Rin, knowing that Toriko was injured, hurriedly went to recovery country. Upon returning to the hotel, Komatsu immediately ran into the kitchen to study how to make the century soup. As for Tina, she asked the hotel manager for permission to go back to film the process of Komatsu making the soup. Upon learning that Toriko's group was injured, Yusaku immediately took them to a giant tree in the middle of recovery country, where all the material recovery experts lived inside this tree. As they entered Yusaku's house, everyone was amazed by the variety of almost extinct creatures in his house. Yusaku threw Max's siblings into some flower buds with healing properties. Then, he spat a strange liquid on their wounds and told them to sit still for self-recovery. Since childhood, Takemaru had suffered from an illness caused by a virus from the gourmet world. Diseases from the gourmet world are often incurable at the root, but Captain Aimaru of the Gourmet Knights cured Takamara's illness. Aimara had the ability to consume viruses in the bodies of others, and he traveled everywhere to save people by eating viruses. As a result, toxins were accumulating in his body. Takamaru pleaded with Yasaku to find a way to save his captain. Yasaku was deeply grateful for Takamaru's kindness toward Aimaru, so he gave Takamaru a medicine that could partially cure Aimaru's illness without taking any money. Upon arriving, Rin immediately ran to inquire about Toriko. Rin threatened Yasaku that if he couldn't treat Toriko's arm, she would spray him with constipation gas. Not wanting to smell manure, Yasaku proceeded to treat Toriko's severed arm. 
Yasako needed a lot of Toriko's DNA, so he cut off the hair on top of his head. Then, Yusaku planted a type of flower on Toriko's hair to absorb DNA. All of Toriko's DNA was stored in the glowing particle in the middle of the flower. While trying to take the particle out, Yusaku suddenly sneezed, causing it to shatter. He had to plant another tree and insert the particle into Toriko's severed arm. During this time, Kamatsu continued his research on how to make the century soup. However, he didn't allow Tina into the kitchen to film because he didn't want the recipe to be leaked. Upon seeing Toriko's new hairstyle, Sani couldn't help but laugh. During the treatment process, all the nutrients on Toriko's body would be directed to the recovery of his left arm. Consequently, Toriko had to keep eating continuously to prevent his body from shrinking. Several months later, Kamatsu successfully created a century soup that was as transparent as Satsuno's. However, he still couldn't find the final ingredient to complete the dish. When Kamatsu saw the bowl of soup, a small bird suddenly shed all its feathers and its droppings fell into the bowl. A prism appeared, and after tasting a spoonful, Kamatsu laughed foolishly, resembling the moment when he tasted the soup in ice hell. Meanwhile, Yusaku successfully helped Toriko regenerate his left arm. Toriko sensed that Kamatsu might have completed the century soup. Kamatsu couldn't believe that the crucial final ingredient for the century soup was the droppings of the bald canary. The media gathered at Igo's hotel to interview Kamatsu because reviving the century soup was a shocking piece of news. Famous culinary critics also came to taste Kamatsu's soup, but he refused to let them try it. Kamatsu wanted Toriko and his friends who had traveled with him in ice hell to be the first to taste it. Kamatsu invited Setsuno because she had taught him a lot during the process of making this legendary soup. Kamatsu invited all his friends to a VIP room to enjoy the century soup. As they opened the bowls, the room was filled with radiant prism light. Upon tasting a spoonful, Toriko felt layers of flavors accumulated from ancient times to the present. The soup also brought a sense of comfort, making everyone burst into foolish laughter. Toriko then decided to add the century soup to his divine menu. When Toriko expressed his desire to choose the soup he made, Kamatsu became extremely emotional. Kamatsu had made many soups that the Max brothers brought back to the children in their town. Toriko also asked Takamara to bring a bowl of soup to give to Aimara because, after all, Toriko and Aimara used to be close friends. At this point, Alfarol also brought the century soup he had obtained to his boss in the Bishikukai organization. However, the boss instructed Alfarol to give it to the subordinates to enhance their strength. The boss was more interested in gourmet world foods, and he dismissed human world dishes. Toriko and Kamatsu brought two bowls of soup to Yasaku and Sani for them to taste in the recovery country. However, after seeing the three of them laugh foolishly after eating, Sani didn't dare to try it. After completing his journey, Toriko decided to return home, only to discover that his house was made of candy and had been completely cleaned out by wild beasts in the desert forest. Upon smelling Toriko's scent, his wolf partner, Terry, immediately ran out, wagging its tail to greet its owner. While at home, Terry had managed to tame another companion, a two-headed mutant crocodile. Feeling hungry, the trio, consisting of one human and two animals, sought something to eat. Terry caught a wild pig, and its meat tasted as delicious as emperor crab meat. After the meal, Toriko had to find materials to build a new home. However, the forest was filled with candy and various sweets, so he could only construct a candy house. Beneath the water, there was no fresh water, instead, it was all soda. The fish were made of jelly, and the coral at the bottom of the pond, although vibrant in color, was actually soft and tasted like gummy candy. Toriko found a suitable plot of land to build his house, with an underground chocolate stream to ensure they would never go hungry. Toriko invited a famous architect to design his candy house using a variety of candy ingredients. Just build a small mansion for me, about a dozen floors, Toriko requested. A few days later, Toriko's new home was completed, and everyone came to congratulate him on his new abode. Rin, on the other hand, lost all her reservations, believing that Toriko was building a happy home for the two of them. Terry, in his own way, expressed his boredom and disinterest. Toriko revealed to his friends that the architect of his mansion was the renowned Mike, who had also designed the gourmet tower they had visited earlier. Mike's craftsmanship left nothing to be desired. The extremely luxurious mansion had an aristocratic style, and all kitchen utensils were made of candy. When hungry, one could eat directly without the need to cook rice. Turning the tap would release a stream of hot milk, the sofa chairs were made of cotton candy, and the curtains were replaced with edible seaweed, which tasted delicious. The walls of the house were made of candy, and the bathwater was sweet and carbonated, allowing for simultaneous bathing and drinking. Finally, the bedroom was made of donuts, making even slim individuals likely to become pleasantly plump in the final stage of their stay in this extraordinary home. The starving young people decided to gnaw on the walls instead of bothering to cook rice, which enraged the architect. 
Though he was upset that the house he had worked so hard to build was being eaten by everyone, the praise and joy from everyone made Mike burst into a genuine smile. Thanks to this, he remembered the laughter that he had forgotten during the challenging five months. Tina arrived with the desire to report on Toriko's new house, only to find that it had been entirely consumed by everyone. A little sad, she urged Mike to quickly return to prepare the stage for the decisive battle of the Gourmet King. Knowing that all the delicious ingredients would gather there, Toriko decided to go with his friends. At this moment, Tina began introducing the main sponsor. A young boy named Fall. Although he was still young, Fall managed a chain of French-style restaurants worldwide. He declared that the winner of the Gourmet King competition would receive a prize of 1 billion. Fall revealed that his pet was a level 34 dinosaur named Chris, an extremely rare and precious creature. Fall organized the Gourmet King competition because Chris had recently refused to eat anything, and he didn't understand the reason. Therefore, Fall wanted the Gourmet Hunters present to prepare food for Chris. If Chris agreed to eat someone's dish, that person would have a chance to win the 1 billion prize. Toriko quickly realized that the dinosaur had been starving for a long time and needed to be nourished as soon as possible. Otherwise, its body would weaken. All three heavenly kings came up with a dish to serve Chris. However, their choices were completely different. In the end, because they couldn't find common ground, the three heavenly kings decided to split up and each search for food separately. Toriko and Kamatsu took a plane to a remote island to find a plant called Granberry, which had a shape resembling a dragon twisting around. After landing on the island, which looked like a giant hamburger, everyone quickly entered the forest to search for cooking ingredients. While chasing a spice butterfly, Kamatsu got entangled in a vine and stumbled. Upon closer observation, Toriko realized that this wasn't an ordinary vine but the roots of a sweet potato plant, a grade 7 grain. Sweet potatoes from this plant tasted like regular potatoes but sweeter, hence the name sweet potatoes. In the sunny ocean, Sunny was using its sensor threads to hunt prey and quickly caught a grade 21 milk whale. Coco, on the other hand, rode on a flying bird to find honey dragonflies that nested on nine layers of clouds. Honey dragonflies were grade 28 insects, extremely fierce. However, their honey was delicious and the ingredient Coco wanted to obtain. At the dinosaur banquet hall, Chris still refused to eat anything, so Fall was very worried about its health. At this moment, Zong appeared in a princess dress. It turned out that the old man had watched a movie where dragons liked to kidnap princesses, so he wanted to try this method. Unexpectedly, Chris ate Zong's flesh, but luckily it was a bit tough, so it spat him out, saving the old man's life. It was a close call, and he could have died for real if it weren't for that. On this side, Toriko had found the Grand Berry Tree, but it was being guarded by an extremely fierce giant monster, a Great 32 Shark Turtle. Kamatsu quickly found a hiding place for Toriko to confront the Shark Turtle. It could dive deep underground, had incredible speed, and a very sturdy defensive shell. Facing an all-round formidable beast like this posed many challenges for Toriko. Meanwhile, elsewhere, after Coco tricked the honey dragonflies into diving headfirst into the sea, he successfully obtained honey from their nest. This honey had the best flavor in the world. Back at the banquet hall, because the dinosaur refused to eat anything, the audience below enjoyed a satisfying meal. They brought in a variety of exquisite dishes, but Chris still complained. Fall revealed that he had found Chris when they were both young in the forest, and since then, they had become best friends, making him no longer feel lonely. Returning to the battle between Toriko and the shark turtle, with Terry's assistance, Toriko successfully overturned the turtle's shell, rendering it immobile. After hearing Toriko's explanation, the shark turtle realized that Toriko only wanted cooking ingredients and meant no harm. It scolded him and then left. At this moment, Sunny brought whale milk to the banquet hall for the dinosaur to taste, but it seemed the dish didn't suit its palate. Coco brought a jar of honey from dragon bees, the most delicious honey in the world, but the dinosaur only sniffed it and didn't eat. Finally, Toriko presented the grand berry, a favorite food of natural lizards, but the dinosaur still rejected it. Kamatsu suddenly noticed that even though the dinosaur wasn't eating, it was still paying attention to the ingredients brought by the three of them. So, Kamatsu asked Toriko, Coco, and Sunny for permission to prepare a dish combining the three different ingredients they had brought back, the three agreed. Kamatsu immediately got to work, and in no time, he made an ice cream from granberry, whale milk, and honey from dragon bees. It turned out that Kamatsu had observed that the dinosaur loved ice cream. When its owner fed it the ice cream, it devoured it immediately. The ice cream, made from three high-quality ingredients, with the sweetness of honey, the richness of whale milk, and the fruity aroma of granberry, blended perfectly to create a perfect dessert. After eating Kamatsu's ice cream, the dinosaur evolved and grew a pair of wings, an extremely rare sight that few people had witnessed. Fall hugged Chris, saying goodbye to his dear friend. When a dinosaur grows wings and matures, it must leave the ground to find a suitable habitat. 
According to legend, when a dinosaur reaches adulthood, an apple will sprout to prove its maturity. This apple is a farewell gift that Chris wants to give to everyone. The apple is a combination of three types of fruits, apple, pear, and mango, creating an indescribably sweet taste. The next day, Toriko went to Komatsu's restaurant to eat the dish of the century. Everyone had a silly smile on their faces. The restaurant also served other delicious dishes, such as sautéed scallops, butter-fried tube noodles, and goose liver. Komatsu gave Toriko two bottles of excellent wine, the most beloved type in the restaurant. Toriko swiftly brought the bottle to his mouth and finished it in one go. He then took the remaining bottle to give it to a friend, whom he often called Old Man as a nickname. However, this friend's true identity was President Ichiryu of the IGO organization. The old man had a hobby of acting cool and skillfully handling the faulty bottle cap. After that, he wanted to showcase his drinking capacity, but the wine was too strong, and he ended up getting drunk and passing out. Just when he intended to show off a bit to his son to save face, a fish from the lake below splashed water on his face, mocking him intensely. Well, that's a bit embarrassing for sure. Forget it. The old man's profile was quite impressive. He was the first disciple of the legendary gourmet hunter who discovered the god ingredient. Now, the butler brought a plate of mixed cheeses, a bit spicy due to several failed attempts. The old man ate all the cheese, leaving none for his son. After finishing, he invited Toriko to exchange a few moves. Despite being old, the old man still possesses a six-pack that makes the lady swoon. He also innovatively created the technique of fluttering his lip edges, with not much damage but an extremely strong humiliation factor. As the battle began, Toriko unleashed his extraordinary flying knife technique, but the old man effortlessly disrupted the move with a single breath. Following that, he used the flying fork technique to launch a long-range attack. This was one of his strongest moves, yet the old man easily blocked it with just one hand. Moreover, the old man stood still, allowing Toriko to attack. However, Toriko's nail punch was like hitting an egg with a rock. Frustrated, Toriko resorted to using the strength of his legs, delivering a powerful kick that formed a ground-cutting sword. However, the old man effortlessly caught it with his bare hand. Despite Toriko's attempts, he couldn't defeat the old man. In the end, with a gentle punch to the face, Toriko was sent flying several meters away. You're still weak, my boy. You need to train diligently, said the old man. Before they bid farewell, the old man asked Toriko to gather a type of plant that grows on clouds, called ozone grass. In the evening, Toriko invited Komatsu to a barbecue, marinating the beef with rich spices for a delicious taste. The restaurant is renowned for its incredibly tasty grilled beef, which is tender and sweet without being tough. The accompanying vegetables are diverse, and eating grilled meat with lettuce helps balance the richness, preventing it from becoming too overwhelming. The best way to enjoy beef is when it's still slightly rare, preserving the original sweetness of the meat, though it still can't compare to the Galala crocodile meat in Century Soup. After the meal, Toriko invited Komatsu to join him in the search for ozone grass. Rumor has it that this plant grows on the ninth layer of clouds in a place known as the Paradise Vegetable Garden. Ozone grass is considered the king of vegetables due to its pure and magical flavor, resembling something from paradise. The next day, the two set off, with funding from the old man. Soon, they spotted a gigantic vine. If they climbed to the top, they believed they would find ozone grass. As they ascended, Komatsu encountered a peculiar flock of birds. Despite their fierce and ugly appearance, these birds were surprisingly gentle. If humans didn't pose a threat, the birds wouldn't attack. As the altitude increased, the temperature dropped, requiring the duo to eat well to maintain energy. In the afternoon, they encountered a four-winged bird, worried that the bird might be feeling cold. Toriko lit a fire to warm it up. He truly showed kindness in that moment. The next day, they continued their journey, facing the challenge of the dry high-altitude climate. Constant water intake was necessary to avoid dehydration, and chocolate became the ideal food since the thin air reduced digestive efficiency, requiring food with minimal mass but high energy content. By evening, the two had climbed a distance of 3,000 meters. Komatsu experienced a headache due to the high-altitude shock, a reaction of the brain when the body rapidly adapts to the surrounding environment. The temperature, pressure, and oxygen levels here were significantly lower than at ground level. Moreover, as they ascended, not only the monsters but even the plants became extremely dangerous. The next morning, they encountered a crazed bean sprout of level 46, which tightly entwined Toriko with its vines. To escape, he had to cut the vines. Luckily, Toriko's protective suit had wings, and the physics laws in the anime were as illogical as in Indian movies, so he succeeded in swimming to the shore. At this moment, the sky suddenly darkened, revealing the formation of a storm above them. Hidden within were extremely dangerous cumulonimbus clouds. The storm's winds were powerful, even blowing a fully grown level 30 gorilla into the sky. 
Toriko found an oxygen plant leaf to craft an oxygen mask, as Komatsu had weaker stamina. Since there was only one mask, Toriko handed it over to Komatsu. After that, Toriko carried Komatsu through the storm center. The cold air froze Toriko's face, and he had to cautiously move step by step. Facing a storm at this altitude, humans couldn't breathe normally. Fortunately, Toriko's physique exceeded that of an average person. Along the way, he had to dodge ice blocks formed from rainwater and cold air. Seeing Toriko exhausted, Komatsu offered to give up the only oxygen mask, but Toriko refused. He believed Komatsu needed it more, while he had learned a breathing technique to exhale only CO2 and retain oxygen in his lungs. He used this method to regulate his body until he recovered, coinciding with the passing of the storm. Finally, after much effort, Toriko and Komatsu successfully climbed to the top of the giant vine and found the legendary vegetable garden. The clouds here could bear the weight of the two, and exposure to stormy winds and the dry, cold climate for a long time had wrinkled Komatsu's face, making him look like an old man. Toriko discovered below the clouds an active volcano whose solidified ash formed a cloud. Plants thrived here due to minerals from the ash, undergoing photosynthesis and producing oxygen, allowing humans to breathe without using oxygen masks. Shortly after, they entered the Paradise Vegetable Garden, where the air was filled with a fresh, vibrant aroma. Toriko pulled out a radish and found it much tastier than those grown on the ground. Komatsu took a bite of a cucumber, making his skin smooth and elastic. Cucumbers had beauty-enhancing properties and were popular for their size. The garden also grew a special pumpkin that tasted like gummy candy when eaten. Venturing deeper, they discovered a pond with naturally fried potato slices. Whenever they spotted something delicious, they paused to eat until they felt full. However, due to overeating, they soon experienced stomach aches and had to run for relief. Suddenly, Toriko noticed a footprint, arousing suspicion about what kind of creature could survive at such altitudes. Setting aside this mystery, Toriko and Komatsu eventually found the ozon grass, the king of vegetables. The outer layers of leaves served as protection, while the actual ozon grass was hidden deep within. Toriko immediately peeled off a leaf to examine it, but then the entire plant unexpectedly shrank and reverted to its seed-like form. It seemed that harvesting ozon grass required the correct approach. Any mistakes during harvesting that made the ozon grass feel threatened would cause it to transform back into a seed to protect itself. After a while, the two found a forest of ozon grass and began researching methods to open it. However, no matter how careful and gentle they were, peeling off a leaf still agitated the plant, causing it to shrink back into a seed. By chance, Komatsu discovered that if he and Toriko peeled two leaves simultaneously, the ozon grass did not react. After damaging hundreds of plants, the two finally succeeded in obtaining intact ozon grass. Only the last layer of leaves remained, and they carefully peeled them off simultaneously. Inside was a sprout of ozone grass, still fresh and vibrant. It was the most vibrant plant they had ever seen, emitting a pure fragrance that made Toriko's mouth water. Unable to resist, Toriko decided to eat it right away. Surprisingly, after taking a bite, the ozone grass quickly became inedible. It turned out that to enjoy this vegetable, one had to eat two pieces at the same time. Although a bit challenging to consume, ozone grass had the sweetness of various fruits and contained immense energy. After eating a piece, Toriko's body was filled with vitality, living up to its reputation as the king of vegetables. The flavor not only satisfied the taste buds but also enhanced the power of Toriko's gourmet cells. At this moment, a black-colored creature suddenly appeared behind the two. Toriko realized it was the mysterious creature that left footprints, but to his surprise, the creature didn't attack them. Instead, it seemed curious to taste the flavor of ozone grass. After finishing its meal, the creature immediately left. It resembled a humanoid machine, but Toriko could tell it wasn't a machine because he didn't detect the characteristic metal smell. This creature was a wild beast, and why it lived on the ninth cloud layer remained unknown to Toriko. To eat the ozone grass, the creature moved its head at an incredibly fast speed to bite both pieces simultaneously. Toriko speculated that it didn't know how to eat ozone grass before but learned by observing and imitating them. Its intelligence surprised Toriko. Completing the journey, Toriko fulfilled the mission of finding ozone grass for Bossy Chiryu. In reality, Ichiria's house was not lacking ozone grass, he even used it to make refreshing tea. Ichiria's purpose was not the ozone grass itself but to train Toriko's body while searching for new ingredients to adapt to various environments. Ichiryu also revealed that Sunny and Koko were soon to face the body training challenge similar to Toriko's in preparation for the next gourmet event. It was rumored that even the last member of the four heavenly kings, Zebra, would make an appearance. This news excited everyone. When Toriko shared his encounters with strange creatures with Ichiryu, the old man's face changed color, but he remained silent. Toriko is testing his strength against a gigantic iron ore with a powerful punch, causing it to shatter into dust. 
Later, Toriko, Komatsu, and Terry eat together. Komatsu adds a few soybean grains to the meat to enhance the rich flavor. Toriko contemplates his punching power and wonders how far he can go in the gourmet world. Rumors depict the gourmet world is considered a culinary paradise, but some also say it is a hell. Not only is the weather extremely harsh, but the creatures there are also extremely fierce. In the world, there is only one gourmet hunter lucky enough to survive and return after entering the gourmet world. Due to its dangerous nature, the gourmet world has been completely isolated from the human world. It is considered a gateway to hell, and once you enter, there is no turning back. Toriko asks Sunny about the gourmet world, as Sunny had ventured into it and was severely injured, ultimately saved by Master Tepe. The reality is different from what Toriko had envisioned, and like Sunny, he might venture into the gourmet world if no one stops him. Sunny shares three paths Toriko can take to enter the gourmet world, the basin waterfall of life on Zabel Island, the demon's soul port on Yudo Island, and the path connecting the three continents of Wack. Among them, the least challenging route and the easiest to take to the gourmet world is through the basin waterfall of life on Zabel Island. Toriko thanks Sunny and decides to go alone without bringing Terry or Komatsu along. The next day, Toriko sets off for the gourmet world, a land with a significant difference in sea level compared to the human world. Every year, thousands attempt to conquer the gourmet world, but none have ever returned. Toriko quickly threw himself down, unexpectedly colliding with a giant dinosaur of an unknown level. Sensing an intruder, the dinosaur immediately attacked Toriko, causing him severe injuries and making him fall down the mountainside. Luckily, Toriko's body surpassed that of an ordinary person, so he survived, albeit with his entire body in excruciating pain and unable to move. Just then, the forest echoed with the roars of some mysterious beasts. In front of Toriko now stood an azure tiger with three heads, rushing to lick Toriko with its tongues. Fortunately, he managed to evade, and when it raised its leg to stomp Toriko, he used his flying leg technique to counter, delivering a powerful blow. The pain prompted the azure tiger to retaliate with its tail, sending Toriko flying. Unluckily, Toriko encountered a gorilla king just after, seemingly standing there waiting for Toriko to fly by. Toriko exerted all his strength to deliver a punch, causing the gorilla to fall. The two beasts clashed, allowing Toriko to escape to another location. He arrived at a forest of gigantic dragon bone trees, where the heat was as intense as a furnace. Toriko's sweat evaporated instantly upon touching the ground. Trying to drink water from one of the dragon bones, Toriko was unexpectedly attacked by a self-defensive tree, sending him flying hundreds of meters. Following that, the sky suddenly poured rain in giant droplets, as if intending to crush Toriko's body. This world truly felt like hell. After the rain ceased, more monsters appeared, but Toriko was too exhausted to defend himself. Fortunately, in this dire moment, an old man appeared before Toriko. Holding two electric spears, the old man single-handedly fought off the horde of monsters. Even fierce creatures like the three-headed tiger and the gorilla king were terrified and dared not challenge the old man's strength. Toriko stood to the side, watching in amazement. Who was this old man, and why was he so imposing? The horde of monsters fell one by one, and any aggressive creature faced the old man's electric shocks, leaving them terrified. Even the three-headed tiger and the gorilla king were afraid and dared not challenge the old man's might. Later, the two of them entered the forest to eat and talk, and the black-haired uncle turned out to be Jiro. Here, he raised his hand like a spear, making Toriko jump back. Jiro remarked that Toriko had lost his vigilance. In this gourmet world, losing vigilance for just 1 slash 100 th of a second could be fatal. From the moment Toriko relaxed for a second, Jiro knew he wasn't a professional. Jiro explained that the reason Toriko's body felt heavy was due to the altitude being over 20,000 meters lower than sea level. The closer to the Earth's core, the heavier gravity becomes. Therefore, the body weighs tens of times more than on the surface. The bleeding eyes and numb limbs were because Toriko was near the air tree. Excessive oxygen causes tissue differentiation, and the air tree is a special ingredient that needs unique processing. There's another special ingredient called thermal planet here. It has horizontal attraction equal to gravity on the surface, making movement easy and the body lighter. However, it also emits an enormous amount of heat into the environment. As for the waterfall spot that Toriko encountered earlier, it's called a waterfall tree. It shoots out water rays to kill prey, and these are just a few things about the gourmet world. Jiro advised Toriko to trust Komatsu with an open heart. He emphasized that what Toriko needed now was a teammate, and Komatsu, recommended by Jiro, had come to rescue Toriko. When Sani visited Komatsu at the hotel to congratulate and inform him about Toriko's solo journey into the gourmet world, he also gave Komatsu a phone number, which belonged to Jiro. This revelation brought tears to Toriko's eyes, marking the first time he cried throughout his journey. Perhaps he finally understood the importance of his comrades. 
At the hotel, Komatsu, working with a worried expression, was surprised when Toriko appeared. Komatsu abandoned his incomplete work to embrace Toriko. Meanwhile, a penguin was relaxing in the pool near them. And Komatsu was preparing a pot of strawberry rice and making a stuffed beef dish to accompany the rice. The beef was cooked to perfection, tender, and not too chewy. The chicken leg with corn tasted as good as chicken meat, but the highlight was the strawberry rice, emitting a gentle fragrance of fruit. Even the penguin enjoyed a grand and delicious feast, having a friend as a chef was truly delightful. After the meal, Toriko asked Komatsu if he wanted to join him in the gourmet world to continue their culinary journey. Unexpectedly, a sound of shattering emerged as Komatsu's kitchen knife broke while cooking. Though the knife wasn't particularly valuable, it had been with Komatsu since he first stepped into the world of cooking. Holding significant meaning for him. Toriko suddenly remembered the list of ingredients that his adoptive father had given him, including one called Milk Stardust. If this ingredient were used to craft a new kitchen knife for Komatsu, it would be extremely sharp. Melk was renowned as the greatest knife artisan in the world. The next day, the two of them set out to find him. However, Melk values privacy, so he bought an entire mountain and built a house on its peak, thousands of meters high, to live in seclusion from the human world. Climbing to the mountaintop required a considerable effort from both Komatsu and Toriko. Along the way, they encountered a flock of squid birds, and Toriko immediately caught some to grill and eat. Despite being bird meat, it tasted similar to seafood. After a day of mountain climbing, early the next morning, they reached the summit and saw Melk's forge. Suddenly, a level 22 scale Kong appeared behind them, but before it could attack, its scales fell off, forcing it to jump down the mountain to escape. It turned out that a young man with a sword took action to chase away the scale Kong. He claimed to be the legendary craftsman Melk, which surprised Toriko and Komatsu because Melk turned out to be young and handsome. They had thought he avoided humans because of an ugly appearance. Melk led the two into his knife-making workshop, where many blades and rare materials were displayed. The prices were not cheap, a mid-range knife cost up to 5 million yen. During the visit, Komatsu accidentally bumped into a stand, causing a knife to fall. Fortunately, Toriko pulled him away just in time to prevent a deadly accident. The sharp knife embedded itself deeply into the stone floor, and Melk revealed that it was made from the tooth of a level 55 battle wolf shark. However, Toriko sensed that Melk was trying to hide something, so he challenged him to a skilled duel to test his strength. Following that, they engaged in a showdown, and as expected, Melk was defeated by Toriko in a short period. From this incident, Toriko became more convinced that Melk was definitely not the legendary master knife sharpener from the tales. It was only then that Melk revealed the truth, Melk is his master and he was the second generation, also known as Melk II. Six years ago, Melk set out to find the materials to make high-quality whetstones, and since then, he has never returned. Komatsu expressed his desire to ask Melk II to craft a knife, but Melk stated that making a good knife would take at least three years. However, if Melk II could obtain the Melk dust, the process could be significantly shortened. According to legend, using a whetstone made from Melk dust creates the sharpest blade in the world. Melk dust is not only an excellent material for crafting knives but also a delicious seasoning for food. If Melk II could obtain a whetstone made from milk dust, he could create the greatest kitchen knife. The goal of Melk II is to become a master whetstone craftsman like his master. However, Toriko felt hungry, so he paused the conversation to go out and hunt for some delicious creatures for dinner. Today's menu included grilled squid, mixed vegetable salad, and a seafood and mushroom stew that everyone enjoyed. Each person ate six bowls of rice, and the location of the milk dust was in the deep hole about 30 kilometers north of Melk Mountain. It is the deepest cave in the human world, where milk dust can be found. Toriko prepared his belongings and set off to conquer the training his old man had arranged for him. In the middle level hole, the level of creatures is 50 or higher, making Melk the second worried about Toriko's safety. However, Komatsu reassured him and asked him to trust Toriko. In the sky, a large bat approached and frightened Komatsu to the point of tears. Fortunately, it turned out to be Kokiko, a familiar face in Melk the second's pet. Kokiko was also Melk II's first pet, responsible for transporting the requested knives to customers. After completing its mission, Kokiko quickly handed the knives to Melk and returned to its nest. Today, with many orders, Melk invited Komatsu to join him inside and help with the work. Toriko was now below the deep hole, hoping that Komatsu would accompany him on this journey. However, it seemed that Komatsu was eager to watch Melk craft knives, so he decided to stay behind and learn the techniques. Toriko had to venture alone, knowing that wherever he went, he and Komatsu would always stand side by side. Before leaving, he took Komatsu's knife as a lucky charm. Toriko proceeded cautiously, taking each step with care. In the workshop, numerous knives awaited sharpening from chefs worldwide. Melk's daily maximum output was around 100 knives. 
Komatsu held up a knife, wondering who was worthy to own it. It turned out to be the knife of the head chef Lulubu from the Gus restaurant, one of the highest levels in the gourmet tower. As for Melk, he wielded the knife of Chef Yuji from the Magura restaurant, the eight-star grilling establishment in the gourmet town, Gourmet Alley. These knives were mostly from renowned chefs who were regular customers since the time of Melk I. Melk wondered how these chefs felt when using such exceptional knives. Upon seeing Komatsu's knife, he also pondered similar thoughts. The users of these knives, crafted with love and care, were truly exceptional individuals in Melk's eyes. Melk's master only wished to create the very best knife. In front of them was a sashimi knife used by the head chef of the Yoki restaurant. It was designed for handling special ingredients. And even a 1mm crack could significantly impact the cooking process. Top chefs relied on their senses, not sight, to detect such imperfections when preparing ingredients to meet the highest standards. As for knife sharpeners like Melk, they rely on sound and touch for sharpening. The knives, once sharpened, glittered and sparkled, appearing exceptionally beautiful. Observing Melk's knife sharpening process, Komatsu recognized the similarities with his own concentration on cooking. Melk completed his work, and Komatsu was amazed that his master could perform this task effortlessly. Melk suggested sharpening the knife slowly so that Komatsu could observe the process. Meanwhile, deep below the crack, Toriko had descended more than 10,000 meters below sea level when a low growl echoed from within the cave. Suddenly, glowing red eyes appeared, it was a two-headed beast at level 44. Toriko had unintentionally entered its territory. The creatures surrounded Toriko from all directions and launched an attack, but Toriko managed to evade by studying their muscular shapes and movements between joints. However, their sheer numbers made evasion unsustainable. Toriko improved his fork and knife technique into a defensive stance that the beasts couldn't breach. He successfully passed through their territory and continued deeper below, another day passed, and Milk II remained busy with his work. He was forging a kitchen knife. After shaping and quenching it in cold water, only 50% of the work was complete. The most crucial step, accounting for half of the knife's success, was the sharpening process, divided into three stages. The rough stone was used for the initial stage, the medium stone for the middle stage, and the finest structured stone for the finishing stage. At this moment, Komatsu had just finished bathing and was wearing only underwear. Melk II, for some reason, blushed and felt embarrassed upon seeing this scene. Meanwhile, deep within the cave, Toriko had descended to a depth of 30,000 meters. The increasing gravitational force in the deep pit made Toriko's movements more challenging. While seemingly losing consciousness, he glanced at Komatsu's knife, providing him with the motivation to continue. He protected the knife as if protecting Komatsu, Toriko moved slowly and carefully, facing the increasing pressure. It seemed that Toriko's pressure was greater than the pressure of my financial troubles. Seeing a small rock rolling down, Toriko had the idea of not resisting gravity but rather relaxing his body, moving like a rolling ball. In times of difficulty, intelligence often surges. Unfortunately, while focused on rolling, Toriko dropped Komatsu's knife. Desperate, he leaped to catch it. Fortunately, in front of Toriko were red pearl crabs, a rare and high-quality species rarely found in the market. The knife glowed, and Toriko sensed Komatsu's ability to attract ingredients and find the red pearl crabs. On the other side, Komatsu was sleeping and dreaming that Toriko would eat all his food. Even in his dreams, he thought about food. Hearing the sound of flowing water, Komatsu observed Melk taking a bath and decided to prepare a late-night meal. Feeling that Melk might be tired after a hard day's work. While Melk was bathing, Komatsu quietly approached with the late-night meal. Melk, seemingly infatuated with someone, released her hair. Komatsu only now realized that Melk was a woman. The atmosphere between the two had become strange, and Komatsu was surprised to discover Milk's true gender. While Toriko was enjoying the delicious and tender red pearl crab meat, a giant creature, a level 53 scorpion beetle demon buffalo, suddenly appeared. Toriko immediately released his killing intent, ready to engage in battle, surprisingly, the creature's eyes widened in fear, and Toriko realized that it wasn't looking at him. When he turned around, he saw a giant figure pointing and whispering something. The creature obediently followed the command and left. It was Melk the first, but because of his tiny voice, Toriko couldn't hear anything. Melk took out a stone, did something with it, and then left, Toriko was still puzzled. The creature handed a stone to Melk, and suddenly his voice became louder. Bidding farewell. Toriko, full of questions, hurriedly followed. Melk sat down to enjoy the meal and shared her past. She was brought by her master from the distant mountains, far away from human settlements. Her master, rumored to be a demon, was never believed by people that he would raise a child, and she was the only one who felt love from the demon Melk, Melk the first was like a foster father to her. After spending time together, she grew fond of her master's work. However, he never allowed her into his workshop. 
she secretly observed and infiltrated the workshop, accidentally dropping a knife and leaving her with the scar she had now. But she considered herself fortunate because that accident taught her fear and revealed the beauty of knives. Every day, she sat beside her master, observing his work and being captivated by it. Melk never taught her anything directly. All her learning was through observing his forging. More than a hundred people came here every year to become disciples, but none could endure for more than three days. She aspired to become a part of her master's strength, eliminating her own weakness. She named herself Melk II, and as Toriko mentioned, she was an imposter. Komatsu found it fascinating and praised Melk for her courage. Toriko continued to follow Melk I until they reached a place emitting a radiant glow. It was an enormous arsenal of weapons. Melk I held a special stone called the Talking Stone, a miraculous stone found in the nerve strings of a stone beetle. It could capture and amplify surrounding sounds several times. The small creature next to Melk might still be a child, but Melk believed it was the champion in this deep hole. Melk I was here for a crucial task, and due to the intelligence of the scorpion beetle demon buffalo, he assigned it the duty of guarding against any intruders. Toriko was eager to hear about the important task, but he was disappointed as Melk spoke in a small voice. To solve this, Toriko decided to wrap the talking stone around Melk's neck as a necklace. Toriko felt that Melk was a talkative person, contrary to the rumors, and believed that the old man wasn't reticent but spoke too quietly that no one could hear. Fortunately, the talking stone was found. Back at the workshop, Komatsu praised Melk as a true master of knife sharpening with sincere words. While Melk I excelled in everything, Melk II, with her own skills, could produce superb knives. Melk II cried and continued her story. When her master left, she thought he would return as usual. However, days passed, and he never returned. Despite his absence, orders for knives kept coming. Instead of worrying, she maintained her faith in her master's wedding skills. Kokiko, the bat, still stood arrogantly, waiting for the return of the first. Komatsu borrowed a knife, gathered ingredients from the refrigerator, and showcased his culinary skills by preparing a sumptuous feast for Melk to enjoy. Listening to Toriko's narration, Melk I learned that Toriko was acquainted with Melk II. When he left six years ago, Melk II was only 15 years old. In the past, Melk received a request to create a sword that required a large amount of materials and took a considerable amount of time to complete, preventing him from returning home. Melk led Toriko to a glowing mine, which was the legendary Melk Stardust. By obtaining this stardust, Toriko could instantly return home. Toriko successfully brought back stones that could sharpen any material in the world. Melk II agreed to create a new kitchen knife for Komatsu. She chose the material to be the fong of an ancient dragon that lived 10,000 years ago. With the grinding stone made from Melk Stardust, the process of sharpening the dragon's fong, which usually took three years, was shortened to just one day. This is the power of the legendary grinding stone created for sharpening swords. Melk II also wanted to melt Komatsu's broken knife blade to integrate it into the new one, because she sensed that the blade wanted to convey that it could still work and did not want to disappear. While Komatsu and Melk II were busy discussing, Toriko was sitting on the side, casually enjoying the stardust. Thanks to the grinding stones brought by Toriko, Melk II only needed one morning to finish sharpening the knife blade. She placed Komatsu's broken blade into the furnace for heating, and then the two blades would be fused together to become a completely new knife. While Toriko and Komatsu were taking a hot bath, a streak of sword energy suddenly appeared, cutting the bath in half. This was a sign of the emergence of a divine being. Melk II successfully created the kitchen knife. Overjoyed, the two young men were so excited that they forgot to put on clothes, running out naked, causing Melk II to cover her face in embarrassment. Komatsu immediately went down to the kitchen to find an enormous chestnut. A few days ago, it was this very thing that caused his knife to break when he tried to cut it, proving its exceptional hardness. However, with the new knife made from the dragon's fawn, Komatsu only needed a gentle touch to split the super hard chestnut in half, using it to slice the meat into thin pieces as thin as paper. Komatsu then used the knife to prepare the ingredients for the meal and found it incredibly easy. Toriko, feeling quite hungry, sat on the side, casually using the milk stardust as seasoning. For dinner, Komatsu made a full-topping cheesy pizza for Toriko to enjoy, and afterwards, he sprinkled milk stardust seasoning on it. President Igo and Yasaku arrived at the prison to pick up Zebra, anticipating something in the future and needing his strength. After Komatsu got his new kitchen knife, Toriko invited him along with Sani and Koko for a trip on a gigantic cruise ship. However, Zong and the journalist Tina managed to sneak on board. The ship served delicious sushi, with the fish caught right on the boat, maintaining the original sweet taste of the fresh fish. However, Zong's group didn't like raw fish, and instant ramen remained their favorite, the ship reached an area with snow, and they saw two horses running while emitting smoke, looking quite pitiful. Inside, a party was being held with symphony music and wine. Perfectly matching Sani's sought-after style. 
Zong and his group were not allowed to attend the party due to their attire not matching the others. Toriko asked for a bit of wine from Sunny, but what he considered a little filled the entire table. Kamatsu approached Sunny to thank him for what he had done by providing information about someone who could help Toriko come back. Sunny believed that Kamatsu was now embarking on a more dangerous journey than any he had undertaken before, and he invited Kamatsu to dance. On this side, Koko and Toriko are dancing enthusiastically. Zong and Tina after their dance were chased by security resulting in their pants falling down. After the party Tina intoxicated stumbled back to her room. In the resting room, Kamatsu proudly showed Koko and Sunny the kitchen knife crafted by the master blade sharpener milk. The strands of Sunny's hair that touched it were so fine that Sunny couldn't help but praise it. Sunny wanted everyone to share more about the taste of milk stardust, but it was a secret between Toriko and Kamatsu leaving Sunny incredibly frustrated. Ignoring that incident, Koko asked Toriko to explain why he was on this rail instead of heading to the gourmet pyramid. Now that the train had reached the gate leading to the famous hell, those who passed through this gate were only notorious criminals who had committed serious offenses and once they entered, they never returned to the world. This place was known as the Honey Prison a secret honey prison. Toriko and Kamatsu were heading to this gourmet prison to meet Zebra. The Zong group was also now imprisoned here, looking pitiful. Zebra was a super troublesome guy but he was very powerful, and to reach the gourmet pyramid, Toriko needed Zebra's help. Toriko took this train because he wanted Koko and Sunny to go down together to meet Zebra, but the response from both was negative. Toriko and Kamatsu were then chased off the train, forced to walk despite the prison being tens of kilometers away. However Toriko sensed Zebra's breath, a breath of destruction and death, inside the most dangerous gourmet prison in the world, Zebra also sensed Toriko approaching. After entering the dungeon, Toriko and Kamatsu were welcomed by Deputy Warden Oban. The Deputy Warden revealed that this place also had another name, the Honey Prison, built deep within the earth. The maximum number of prisoners the Honey Prison could hold was over 100 million people, surrounded by extremely dangerous creatures that prevented prisoners from daring to escape. The elevator quickly stopped on the top floor and the staff working here all had fierce expressions. Indeed it was the most dangerous gourmet prison in the world. Deputy Warden Oban led the two to menu room 4, but in reality this place was used for torturing prisoners. Depending on the severity of their crimes, prisoners would face different punishments. For minor offenses, prisoners would lose their sense of taste, unable to enjoy the delicious aroma of the food. For serious crimes, prisoners would be shown delicious food but not allowed to eat it. The ones who committed heinous crimes and were considered unredeemable would only be given water and left to starve to death. Finally Toriko and Kamatsu were led to the office of the warden. Unexpectedly, the warden turned out to be a child dressed as a queen bee. However in Toriko's eyes, the warden appeared as a beautiful young girl. It turned out the warden could mesmerize others by emitting pheromones like a queen bee. With this ability the warden could control any creature she desired. However there was one person unaffected by the warden's pheromones, and that was gourmet emperor Zebra. Curious Kamatsu asked Zebra what crime he had committed. The warden replied that he had eaten so much that more than 20 rare and endangered species had gone extinct. The warden then led the two to the room where gourmet emperor Zebra was held captive. Zebra's limbs were bound by four beasts at each corner, but for him, it was just a form of entertainment that he could escape from any time he wanted. Zebra's roar shook the entire prison, and as he was about to attack Kamatsu, Toriko intervened. Just as the two gourmet emperors were about to engage in a fight, the warden mesmerized Toriko. However, this trick had no effect on Zebra. Everyone was puzzled about what the child was trying to achieve. The warden announced that Gourmet Prison would grant Zebra his freedom with one condition, he had to capture 500 wanted criminals and discover 100 new cooking ingredients. Zebra devoured the feast in just 5 minutes, still feeling hungry and wanting more. He then looked at Kamatsu with a hungry gaze, frightening him. At this moment, the deputy warden announced the appearance of Forest Beat, a dangerous turtle. Whenever it appeared, the surrounding monsters would become extremely fierce, and they began attacking and devouring each other. People referred to this phenomenon as the death hunt season. The forest beat they mentioned was a magma turtle at level 70. Right after finishing his meal, Zebra wanted to expend energy. He quickly mobilized his internal energy, sucking all the air around into his stomach. Then, with a thunderous roar, Zebra unleashed a shockwave that startled the monsters, followed by using his noise missile technique to blow away the level 70 magma turtle. Even the legendary forest beat couldn't withstand Zebra's attack. Now, everyone understood why Zebra was considered the strongest among the four heavenly kings. The next day, Zebra joined Toriko and Kamatsu's group to explore the desert cactus garden for new ingredients. However, there was a catch, Zebra kept eyeing Kamatsu, making him constantly fearful. According to Toriko, anything that caught Zebra's interest would be relentlessly pursued and devoured until extinction. 
With nothing else to do, Zebra and Toriko decided to fight each other to pass the time. Even the beautiful house they were in got damaged during their brawl. After exchanging techniques, they felt hungry and instructed Komatsu to go to the kitchen and prepare some dishes for them, warning him that they might just eat him if he didn't comply. However the only remaining piece of meat in the fridge led to another brawl between the two, both eager to claim the last piece of food. Truly they were both gluttons. Komatsu fed up decided not to say anything and pretended not to notice. After a while, the group arrived at the desert garden, which turned out to be a small town. While walking, Zebra spotted a stranger and immediately asked if there were any delicious dishes available, displaying his uncouth manners. Komatsu couldn't help but doubt if this was one of the four heavenly kings. On their way they stopped at a shaved ice shop, ordering two cups of sand ice made from a type of rock that didn't melt even in extreme heat, and was a hundred times colder than regular ice. The refreshing sensation lingered in their throats for a long time. The owner also helped them prepare sunblock and other necessary tools for venturing into the desert to search for cooking ingredients. As they ventured deeper into the desert, the group found a village. Upon Zebra's appearance, the villagers warmly welcomed him. It turned out that many years ago, there was a civil war in this place, and Zebra was released as a war machine to eradicate all enemies, ensuring peace for the residents. At that moment a giant creature emerged from beneath the sand, a level 23 eight-tailed scorpion beetle. A single drop of its venomous tail could kill any living creature. The beast swiftly attacked a girl in the village, but Zebra's punch cut it into three pieces, saving the day. In reality Zebra's personality wasn't bad at all. Despite his gluttony and a bit of a hot temper, he always helped those weaker than him which was why the villagers valued him. After spending some time with the villagers, they generously gave the three of them two specially equipped camels to ease their travel in the desert. These camels could store a significant amount of water in their humps, allowing the group to access water whenever needed by simply turning a valve. Their destination required them to cross the hauntingly beautiful desert maze, also known as the Graveyard of Gourmet Hunters. The group continued their journey through the desert, where the daytime temperature could reach up to 60 degrees. Without the camels it would have been extremely challenging to traverse. While Zebra was gnawing on a chicken leg, he suddenly stopped sensing something approaching. It turned out to be desert sand sharks. With just a shout from Zebra, they quickly retreated burrowing into the sand to hide. Toriko revealed that Zebra could release ultrasonic waves that humans couldn't hear. He always knew how to find sounds that would terrify his enemies using them to launch attacks. After a day and night of traveling, the group finally reached the desert maze where the sand beneath was scorched red by the blazing sun, emitting heat far more intense than a regular desert. Suddenly, something frightened the camels and amidst the calm. Komatsu went missing. When the group regained their composure they discovered a massive creature emerging from the sand. Zebra began inhaling air into his stomach and released ultrasonic waves in all directions, quickly pinpointing Komatsu's location. Meanwhile, the desert beast formidable as it was couldn't stand up to Toriko's powerful punches. It seems that Komatsu has fallen into a deep cave deep beneath the ground. Meanwhile Zebra and Toriko have entered the heart of the desert maze. Despite their seemingly simple steps, a single misstep could lead them to fall into endless pits. A gigantic sand whale sensing the hunger of the two heavenly kings, offered itself to be captured. Touched by this gesture Toriko prepared a sashimi dish from the sand whale, showcasing not only its kindness but also its delicious meat. Zebra's stamina surpassed Toriko's and he didn't need to adapt to the desert, the desert had to adapt to him. After crossing the desert maze, Toriko and Zebra witnessed a colossal pyramid, its size hundreds of times larger than the largest pyramid in Egypt. However Zebra mentioned that this was just a small part of the gourmet pyramid. Beneath the sand, an even more enormous architectural structure was hidden. Komatsu found himself on a lower level of the pyramid. Upon waking up he started exploring to find an exit. Unfortunately he encountered a gigantic creature, but it sensed Zebra's presence and fled without daring to turn back. Zebra then warned Komatsu to remember to cook for him when they meet again, or else he might end up becoming his meal, a contradiction between Zebra's good intentions and his fierce appetite. After ensuring Komatsu's temporary safety, Zebra and Toriko continued to advance into the depths of the gourmet pyramid. Suddenly a monster blocked their path, unaware that they were facing two gourmet hunters. Encountering an unexpected delicious meal, the two of them enjoyed a satisfying feast. Shortly after, they entered the maze of the pyramid where the surroundings changed positions periodically. Toriko noticed that Zebra was showing signs of fatigue, he had used his sound waves excessively. Utilizing this technique required an immense amount of energy, in the order of millions of units. Facing a three-headed wolf at level 60, Toriko took the initiative to engage, allowing Zebra to recover his strength. However when Toriko was about to be attacked, Zebra disregarding the danger stepped in and took the blow. He quickly focused his strength on his hand, delivering a punch that sent the three-headed wolf flying into the wall. 
However this victory came at the cost of completely depleting Zebra's energy, temporarily rendering him unable to speak. Meanwhile below the gourmet pyramid, Kamatsu discovered a very familiar footprint, belonging to the mysterious creature that had appeared in the vegetable sky garden. Back above the two heavenly kings had devoured the three-headed wolf, but Zebra's energy was still insufficient for a full recovery barely reaching 2%. In terms of calorie storage capacity? Zebra's body was supposed to be 1.5 times stronger than Torikos. However at this moment, Zebra couldn't open his mouth, unable to speak and had to resort to signaling with his hands a somewhat melancholic situation. Zebra can quickly recover but now he can't speak, so he communicates with Toriko using sign language. He instructs Toriko to continue forward and Zebra pounds on the wall, signaling Toriko to break it. With a single punch Toriko shatters the rock revealing a secret staircase. Below Kamatsu faces a monstrous snail rushing to attack him. Fortunately Zebra protects him with a sound armor, causing Zebra to lose his hearing temporarily. Since everything can be potential ingredients, Kamatsu takes out a kitchen knife from his luggage and slices through the rock layers he is standing on. Above Zebra and Toriko confront a group of monsters and Toriko uses his flying fork technique to subdue them. Kamatsu luckily falls into a water pool in an underground leakage channel leading to the pyramid. Using a device to check the correct direction Kamatsu's device detects a monster. Curious Kamatsu ventures into the direction indicated by the device, but he is chased by a monster causing him to lose his pants. While escaping from the pursuing monster, Kamatsu inadvertently reaches a hidden location with numerous coffins. There are many strange paintings on the walls and a distant glowing object turns out to be a book. Kamatsu approaches to examine it but is unexpectedly attacked by a monster from behind. After consuming the energy Toriko's recovery reaches 60% but Zebra's recovery is only about 7%. The journey continues with multiple paths, a fanged tiger awaits below and its meat appears to be delicious. On the other side, Kamatsu is continuously attacked by the mummy-like monster. Fortunately, thanks to Zebra's sound armor he remains unharmed. However the mummy-like monster turns its attention to another one-eyed monster, allowing Kamatsu to seize the opportunity to retrieve the mysterious book. Toriko and Zebra continue their journey after replenishing a significant amount of calories. Now they proceed to clear out the monsters in front of them and resume their eating expedition. They devour any creature they encounter on the way, leaving only dry skeletons behind. After eating to their satisfaction Zebra regains his voice. Both of them fully recover their strength after consuming all the monsters they encounter on the journey. Zebra takes a deep breath and uses sound waves to locate Kamatsu. Meanwhile Kamatsu inadvertently encounters the strongest creature in the gourmet pyramid, a fire dragon sphinx at level 92. Although Zebra informs the sphinx that Kamatsu is his disciple the monster shows no fear. Zebra immediately activates the bazooka sound to destroy the floor, revealing Kamatsu's location on the lower level. Feeling the formidable strength of the monster ahead Toriko notices a strange scent and recognizes it as Kola. After a roar the sphinx blows Toriko and Kamatsu away. Zebra confidently stands his ground, ready to face the monster alone. First he uses sound bullets, followed by taking a deep breath and utilizing the voice cutter technique. When the Sphinx loses its vigilance, Zebra delivers the finishing blow with thunder voice. However despite the consecutive attacks, the Sphinx stands defiant and retaliates with its tongue against Zebra. Toriko joins the battle and informs Zebra that he smelled cola emanating from the Sphinx. Recalling a conversation with Melk the First, Toriko shares information that Melokola is located inside the Gourmet Pyramid, and the owner is the Fire Dragon Sphinx. Melokola will ripen inside the Sphinx's body because the scent of cola is spreading throughout its body. The Sphinx raises its leg, gently waving it causing the ground to tremble. Zebra laughs wickedly finding the outside world fascinating. Both of them release their aura, summoning two demons to prepare for the battle. Kamatsu examines the book he found, although it consists of ancient characters, he can still identify it as a recipe book. Both attack the Sphinx directly but it remains unfazed, effortlessly dispelling their auras with a simple leg wave. Toriko jumps using his flying fork technique, but the Sphinx catches it in its mouth and throws it elsewhere. Zebra using a barrage of sound bullets, can't penetrate its thick skin. Toriko attempts a foot-swinging knife attack, but the Sphinx easily dodges. Zebra then employs a sound slash, causing some of the Sphinx's hair to fall. The book Kamatsu holds mentions the tears of the Sphinx as the Melokola, and it also provides instructions on how to process special ingredients. Toriko reminisces about their journey, unintentionally discovering the correct way to defeat and enjoy the creatures they encountered on the way. Though Kamatsu cannot read all the crazy symbols relying on the images, he guesses their meaning, drawing on his experience reading hundreds of different cookbooks over the years. Toriko praises Kamatsu, and he appears delighted. Zebra acknowledges Kamatsu's talent in finding unique ingredients and both decide to trust Kamatsu. Following the instructions in the book he found. As they prepare to confront a strange creature passing through places Toriko and Zebra have visited, the creature looks up at the commotion. 
On one side Zebra and Toriko charge together, but the Sphinx continuously uses its hair to attack them, making Kamatsu nervously watch. After receiving Zebra's encouragement, Kamatsu imagines intensely the moment when he will butcher the Sphinx following the book's instructions. The first step is to gently knead its entire body, similar to tenderizing meat with a meat hammer, using just the right force. While the Sphinx continues attacking Toriko and Zebra relentlessly, Zebra instructs everyone to cover their ears and then uses the bazooka voice skill. The scream resonates affecting the Sphinx, and Zebra's attack softens it as per Kamatsu's imaginative vision. Next is the chest area, where Toriko will strike the upper palate with a force that's just right. Due to Zebra's recent skill usage, he now has only half of his energy. Following Kamatsu's guidance, Toriko will attack while Zebra provides support from behind. Zebra creates a shield of sound to counter the Sphinx's hair, allowing Toriko to approach easily and deliver a tenfold spiked punch to the upper palate. The Sphinx falls and Toriko's attack consumes 300,000 calories. Angry and revived the Sphinx retaliates by scratching Toriko and Zebra with its legs. Kamatsu continues to imagine cooking methods with Toriko and Zebra as utensils. Next they have to scrape off some scales from its back. Zebra attracts the Sphinx's attention and Toriko jumps up, using his leg knife technique which consumes over 500,000 calories. Though the scales fly off lightly. The task to obtain the cola doesn't end there. Both must continue to stimulate its instep. Zebra shoots sound bullets into its instep and quickly changes positions. Then he plucks a feather from each wing simultaneously. Both jump up and synchronize a 1-2-3 rhythm, easily pulling apart the two feathers. That action caused the tear ducts of the Sphinx to swell up. Following this trend if stimulated according to the principles outlined in the book, before releasing CO2 gas it would dissolve into its tears, turning into carbonic acid and ultimately into mellow cola. Kamatsu enlightened by the supreme being, saw the completed dish after the massage, feather plucking and now Zebra and Toriko had to gently massage the flesh on the Sphinx's shoulders from the inside. Both immediately used their techniques to massage the Sphinx. When Kamatsu noticed them struggling with the Sphinx's mane, he remembered that cutting off the mane would be fine. Zebra somewhat annoyed said, why didn't you say that earlier? They continued persistently exchanging blows with the Sphinx, battling for nearly half a day. They fought until both were exhausted, but the Sphinx showed no signs of relenting. In the final step both had to strike with all their might, using 100% of their remaining strength to attack its serpent tail. Zebra and Toriko combined their flying fork and sound bullets on the Sphinx's tail. This attack was as powerful as a nuclear bomb, and finally the Sphinx couldn't endure the pain inflicted by both, shedding tears in two streams, and its tears were the mellow cola. However at that moment, Kamatsu was unexpectedly attacked from behind by the bird-headed monster, causing him severe injuries. The incident happened so quickly that Toriko and Zebra couldn't react in time. Then the bird-headed monster rapidly transformed, delivering a powerful punch to each of them at lightning speed. With a single breath, it quickly sucked up all the mellow cola that everyone had worked so hard to collect. This left Zebra and Toriko extremely frustrated. It turned out that the monster chose death, and only they had been the ones to plunder food from others until now. This monster was cunning beyond expectations. Toriko immediately rushed to attack the bird-headed monster. The collision of two powerful punches caused both of them to be thrown far away. Seizing the opportunity, Zebra jumped in to unleash his sound bazooka technique on the creature. However it still wasn't enough to defeat the powerful monster. In desperation, the two had to cooperate to have a chance at overcoming this ancient creature. Zebra used his super sound bazooka technique to amplify Toriko's speed several times. Then Toriko threw a supersonic punch at the creature, sending it flying and causing severe internal organ damage. Zebra quickly drained the creature's life force, leaving it shriveled up like a dried corpse. The truth was this monster had endured hunger for thousands of years inside the Gourmet Pyramid, and it took both Gourmet Kings to defeat it. Suddenly a noise came from behind, surprisingly Kamatsu was still alive after taking a hit from the creature. It turned out that Zebra had silently created a sound a more covering Kamatsu's entire body to protect him. Despite his rough exterior, Zebra cared deeply for his friends. Meanwhile the Sphinx still lay there, crying and mellow cola flowed in all directions. When everyone tasted it, they discovered an irresistibly pure and sweet flavor that surpassed even the finest premium wines. It filled Toriko's cells with energy and vitality, truly living up to its reputation as the world's most delicious cola. After obtaining mellow cola, Zebra suggested that Kamatsu become his personal chef. If judged solely by strength, even Toriko was slightly inferior to Zebra. If Kamatsu agreed to be his assistant, they would form a powerful gourmet hunting duo like never before. However Kamatsu declined Zebra's offer because he trusted Toriko, and believed that one day Toriko would create the world's finest menu. To collect mellow cola, Kamatsu used a gourmet liquid storage device. He pressed the start button, and it sucked all the liquid inside. 
After the Sphinx finished crying, it became extremely angry and chased Toriko and the others away. Back in the desert village, Toriko thanked the villagers by giving them some ingredients and mellow cola for providing the two camels. As the journey concluded, Komatsu also made a significant harvest by obtaining the ancient cookbook inside the gourmet pyramid. This book was part of the culinary heritage passed down by ancient people. Guiding new discoveries in the gourmet era. The next day, Komatsu invited Toriko and Zebra to his restaurant for a meal. While waiting, the two gourmet kings feeling restless, engaged in a martial arts exchange. Soon, a fully prepared table of food emerged. Toriko and Zebra started with a refreshing glass of cold cola before focusing on the main course. In just five short minutes they had cleaned the entire table, living up to their reputation as gluttonous gourmets. News arrived that the IGO organization sought the corpse of the defeated monster for research. Representatives from the Zero TH biotope, a secluded area within the gourmet world, were sent to collect it. These warriors possessed terrifying strength and were recruited by the gourmet Yakuza boss. Even the master knife sharpener Milk the First and the resurrection artist Yusaku were members of the Zero TH biotope. Mansam the director revealed that the creature Torikos group encountered above the vegetable sky and beneath the gourmet pyramid was called a nitro. It is said that nitros have existed on Earth for hundreds of millions of years. One of their remarkable abilities is their incredibly robust vitality. When the environment deteriorates, nitros can enter a state of dormancy automatically. In extreme cases, they can continue to hibernate for thousands of years without needing food and water. Yesterday, the IGO organization received news that another nitro was still inside the gourmet pyramid. Currently no one knows its whereabouts. Since ancient times, nitros have had an instinct to seek delicious ingredients. There are even rumors that these creatures are the key to approaching the legendary gourmet god ingredients. When the gourmet eclipse occurs the time when god ingredients appear. A battle for gourmet supremacy is inevitable. The next day, Toriko and Komatsu were sponsored for a vacation at a beach resort. The main sponsor was the young billionaire owner of the colossal dinosaur, Chris. The young billionaire did this to express gratitude for Toriko and Komatsu helping Chris successfully evolve. The high-speed train quickly took Toriko and Komatsu to a crowded beach, a culinary paradise known for its affordable and exquisite dishes. At the beach they encountered some familiar faces, including Setsuno, the alcohol-ridden old man or the knocking master Jiro, and Rin, who were also on vacation. Every year Rin came here to enjoy seaside cuisine. Toriko began to try famous dishes. Such as the musical watermelon that played music when eaten and the squid ramen with a built-in bowl, making it a hot and fresh seafood ramen. Toriko also visited a friend's curry rice shop at the beach, but to his surprise the place was closed. This friend was cumin and he explained that two days ago, his younger sister Safra, went to the sea to find curry ingredients. However two days had passed and she hadn't returned, causing cumin great concern. Cumin revealed that their family's traditional curry sauce originated from a curry meteorite that only appears on Earth every 99 years. Its flavor intensifies over the years during its cosmic journey. Cumin's father collected the curry ingredients from the meteorite when it fell to Earth. From those ingredients, he researched and created an incredibly delicious curry sauce. Cumin pleaded with Toriko to help find his sister, and Toriko agreed. The group quickly located Safra in a sea area about 10 nautical miles from the mainland. However, Safra was still searching for ingredients to make curry sauce, so she couldn't return with everyone yet. Most of the ingredients were rare and couldn't be bought in the market. So she had to go to the sea to hunt for them. At this point, she was only missing one ingredient, the water tiger, a fierce wild beast living on Horse King Island. Toriko decided to go to Horse King Island to help Safra find the water tiger. For some reason and somehow, Zong's group was also on this island. Suddenly, a roar echoed in the forest, and a gigantic water tiger appeared before everyone. With a level of 70, it was considered a formidable opponent. Indeed, Toriko's knife skills were easily nullified by the water tiger. He swiftly punched it in the mouth, but as the tiger's body was made of water, physical attacks were ineffective. After observing for a while, Toriko discovered the weakness of the tiger and lured it to another location. Once out of the shaded forest, the tiger's strength rapidly diminished. The water in its body began to evaporate. It was at this moment that Toriko rushed in, delivering a powerful punch to finish off the level 70 water tiger. Finally, everyone successfully gathered all the ingredients to bring back home for cumin to cook a truly delicious curry pot. The smooth and fragrant sauce emitted an enticing aroma, and pouring this sauce onto the plate of curry immediately illuminated it, as they tasted a piece with the rich and sweet flavor of water tiger meat melting inside their mouths. Seeing the delicious food, the gluttonous zebra immediately appeared, asking what his brothers were eating that was so delicious and wanting some for himself. 
The next day, Toriko and Komatsu headed to a mysterious forest to gather ingredients as IGO's boss had requested Toriko to collect. Toriko suddenly stopped as there were strange footprints in front of him. A glowing creature in the grass turned out to be a rabbit, but behind it was a giant ox chicken. Toriko used a fork to create a barrier, dodged the attack, and then gathered strength to deliver a powerful punch, sending the unfortunate ox chicken flying straight into the sky. Earlier, Toriko had consumed a ton of mellow cola, which helped his gourmet cells develop, but Toriko was not satisfied with himself because there would always be higher mountains. Koko and Sani were also diligently training according to the boss's list. Sani headed to the Wack Trail, the path connecting the gourmet world and the human world, where he encountered a member of Biotope Zero, who was detaining a person. And that person was Giman, the gourmet gang leader. In a dark and impoverished city, accompanied by strong waves, Koko felt like everything there was an illusion, life having its ups and downs. At Bishikokai's castle, Su Chef Alfaro and his servant Jojo went to the place where the newest model robots were stored, preparing for the upcoming battle to seize God. The next day, Toriko invited Komatsu to a special place in the forest, revealing that there was an incredibly delicious restaurant inside. Due to some undisclosed reasons, very few people knew about this restaurant. It was a house situated in the middle of a blackwater lake, named Barmeria. At this moment, with no customers inside, the owner immediately came out to greet the two and inquire about what they wanted to eat. A unique aspect was that the owner of this restaurant was not a human but a robot. As soon as the food was brought out, Toriko's mouth watered profusely. Despite being a simple fast food dish like a hamburger with meat and french fries, its flavor was incredibly delicious. The owner also recommended two specialties here, rat potatoes and black rice with jewelry meat, which were truly exquisite. These were the best-selling dishes and favorites of the restaurant. Suddenly, Toriko noticed that someone had been sitting behind him since earlier, and he hadn't noticed. Komatsu immediately recognized him as the mysterious person who had controlled the robot and once tried to steal his knife. His intention was to obtain God, an ingredient that could control the entire world. The intense clash of auras between him and Toriko immediately created waves in the lake. The man's real name was Star Jun, one of the strongest chefs in the Bishikokai organization. Temporarily avoiding direct conflict with Toriko. Star Jun left the restaurant. If the two were to truly confront each other, Toriko wasn't certain of the outcome. A few days later, with some free time on their hands, Toriko once again invited Komatsu on a pilgrimage to a temple to seek good fortune. The place they visited was the world's largest gourmet temple, covering an area of over 80,000 square kilometers and welcoming around 9 billion visitors annually for food purification rituals. As usual, wherever Toriko went, the relentless food reporter Tina and the enthusiastic Zong were not far behind. Although it was referred to as a pilgrimage, Toriko's true purpose in coming here was to savor the delicious dishes the place had to offer. He enjoyed a bowl of seafood stir-fried noodles, explored various snack vendors, and indulged in a food tour. Relishing the affordable and tasty treats. After eating, both of them participated in the food purification ritual using pure spring water within the temple, leaving them with a comfortable and pleasant feeling throughout their bodies. Later, Toriko hired a sheep taxi service to explore the scenic surroundings of the temple. The staff reminded them to fasten their seatbelts and wear helmets because the sheep could run very fast, reaching speeds of up to 150 km per hour. Next, they toured the snow pine forest inside the gourmet temple, where gigantic trees soared to heights of over a thousand meters. Upon exiting the forest, they reached the magnificent shrine dedicated to Acacia, the gourmet hunter. The greatest in history, who discovered the god ingredient and used it to end a bloody war, restoring peace to the world. Outside, a knife-pulling competition was taking place, with many attempting their luck, but no one had succeeded so far. Zong, the big brother, stepped in to showcase his strength, but despite his efforts, the knife remained firmly in place, embarrassing his younger siblings. Encouraged by Toriko, Komatsu decided to give it a try. To everyone's surprise, with just a gentle force, the knife was pulled out effortlessly from the wooden surface. Finally, Komatsu earned the title of the luckiest person and received the blessings of the gourmet temple. The food tour concluded, and the two of them rode the sheep taxi back home. The next morning, Komatsu, accompanied by a penguin, arrived at Toriko's house. The two bosses of the house welcomed them, but before they could knock, Toriko opened the door, startling both of them to the point of almost wetting themselves. Toriko explained that he used this method to scare them as a preparation for hunting a specific ingredient they were going to find. The miraculous fruit in question is the apple that Toriko and Komatsu, along with the fortunate IGO employee, will set out to find today. This surprise apple originates from a local variety on an island known for endless battles, aptly named the Battle Island. IGO brought seeds from that island back several years ago, intending to cultivate them naturally. It is a special ingredient, and the more unexpectedly it develops, the more delicious it becomes, adding to the intriguing nature of this surprise apple. 
In an instant, the group arrives at the Surprise Island, the only island exclusively dedicated to cultivating these special apples. To enhance the flavor of the Surprise Apples, they are strategically exploding bombs in the orchard in a clockwise direction. Stepping onto the island, the sound of gunfire echoes, making Komatsu quite uncomfortable. Every year around this season, 10,000 people from all over the world gather here for the festival of threatening the surprise apples. The festival adds a lively atmosphere to the island, and no festivity is complete without the King of Jesters, the antagonist of Sorrow, Zong. Here are the members of the G7, renowned food tasters from Apollo, and Tepe has also joined. Rin, anticipating her crush Toriko's arrival, has been waiting here since yesterday. Of course, Tina doesn't miss the chance to record a video and upload it to YouTube. The official Surprise Apple Festival begins. These young people seem like the Mafia, always using guns for scaring. Toriko takes out a stone he obtained from Milk the First, takes a deep breath, and shouts, shaking the entire island. The apple immediately widens its eyes in fear. The esteemed food critic rates this as the highest astonishment level 27 for apples today. Kamatsu asks Tepe about the astonishment level, and Tepe, in his usual manner, speaks endlessly. Apollo succinctly explains that the levels range from 0 to 100, and Toriko is currently at level 27. The young men continue to use guns to scaring the apples. Instead of scaring, Tepe approaches the apples, continuously talking about the hardships of his life. Zong imitates him, making the apple look genuinely terrified. Komatsu cooks for Toriko, and just one bite leaves the plate spotless. After eating, Toriko sings Gangnam style to scaring not only the apples but everyone around. The cute lady is Sarara Mama, the head chef of Snack Bar Sarara, one of the 50 greatest chefs in the world. Instead of scaring, Mama only needs to say a few threatening words to astonish the apples to level 20. Truly, a top chef only needs to speak to make the apples fearful. Rin also tries and achieves a level of 20, matching Mama. On the other hand, Tepe keeps talking endlessly, and his stories are so long that he puts the apple to sleep, only to wake up startled, reaching an astonishment level of 30. Terry's gentle scaring earns him a level of 40, and the cheerful penguin's presence frightens the apple to a level of 25. Toriko with a mighty fist, stops just in front, terrifying it to a level of 50. However due to excessive force, it faints on the spot. Apollo reveals that so far, only three people have scared this apple to a level above 90, President Igo with 92, Jiro with 95, and a mysterious person whose name is unknown. There's an apple that Apollo picks up, astonishing at level 80. Zong unable to scaring it, resorts to using a fart-based technique to scaring, a foul odor even I outside the screen can imagine. He manages to the apple to level 80. Although it's a record-breaking scene for the day, Tina refrains from filming due to its repulsiveness and smell. Toriko and Komatsu enjoy the surprise apple together. Afterwards, Komatsu orders a glass of apple soda and a glass of freshly pressed apple juice to savor the moment. Today Komatsu is in a joyful mood. Upon Toriko's inquiry, he reveals that he bought a lottery ticket and perhaps after the temple visit, luck was on his side winning the 8th prize. Though the amount is not substantial, with 1 million yen it's still a substantial win. A jackpot would likely be over 100 billion yen. Komatsu unfamiliar with holding a million yen, decides to buy a gift for Toriko. Fortunately, Toriko is also looking to purchase a piece of land, and today's trip is to check out that land. However, with only 1 million yen, it seems challenging. The piece of land for sale has a meager area of 3,300 square meters, starting at an initial bid of 10 billion yen. The reason for its high cost is that there's a tiger chicken currently nesting there, and its eggs are exceptionally delicious. However, this species is introverted, so it will only lay eggs in familiar, preferred places, and the place it chooses to lay eggs is that piece of land. The landowner is an old man named Yaki, renowned for being stubborn. Many powerful gourmet investors and extremely wealthy individuals have come to buy, but their offers have all been completely rejected. At Yaki's house, these young men are opening a suitcase containing 50 billion yen but are immediately looked down upon and told to leave. Indeed, people with money have a different perspective. If they met me, they would sell for just 10 billion. In the sky, a chicken tiger is flying over. As the negotiation breaks down, the Mafia wants to capture the chicken tiger. Toriko, feeling indignant, uses his flying fork technique to knock down their weapons because who would disturb a mother chicken tiger about to give birth? Toriko steps into Yaki's house, immediately smelling the aroma of chicken tiger eggs. Without hiding anything, Toriko expresses his desire to buy the piece of land today. However, more importantly to Toriko, he wants to taste one of those eggs with a cute, handsome face. Seeing Toriko's sincerity, Yaki happily takes out an egg for him. Komatsu also cheerfully introduces himself to Yaki to prepare chicken tiger egg dishes. The dishes Komatsu makes include soft-boiled eggs, egg milk, pork and eggs with mushroom cream. Watching Toriko enjoy the meal. 
Yaki is reminded of his wife. In a blink of an eye, the sky darkens, and Yaki talks about his past as a gourmet hunter. He found a chicken tiger chick in a field a long time ago and has nurtured it to this day. Toriko believes that Yaki raised this mother chicken tiger despite the danger because of greed. In life, everyone is greedy, only Kamatsu isn't greedy. Yaki's wife passed away when he was still a gourmet hunter. He went hunting extensively to find ingredients to earn money to take care of his sick wife at home, but the situation worsened, and she couldn't recover. When she passed away, her last words were a simple wish for a family meal with him. He pursued money to the extent of forgetting his dearest loved ones. Indeed, sometimes money can bring happiness, but it's not everything in life. Toriko believes that Yaki, in pursuit of money, forgot how to truly enjoy food. Yaki remembers that his wife's favorite dish was chicken tiger eggs, and the piece of land someone wants to buy is where he and his wife shared their meals. People say that while you can. Try to do things, don't let them slip away and only view them as memories afterward. Toriko wonders why, after raising a large chicken tiger, Yaki wants to sell the land, which holds sentimental value. Yaki simply answers that he is nearing death, and he doesn't know when he will pass away, so when he dies, no one will own that piece of land anymore. Yaki asks Toriko how much he brought. Toriko has only a sincere heart, surprise apples, and 1 million yen from Kamatsu. Toriko's sincere words resemble those of Yaki's wife. The happiness from those things cannot be bought with money. Even if those others offer 50 billion yen, it's not worthy of the happiness Mr. Yaki desires. After his passing, he hopes Kamatsu and Toriko will come to play with the mother chicken tiger and her newly hatched chick. The next day Toriko invited Sunny and Kamatsu to have a meal. After finishing the meal, Toriko revealed that he was looking for a new cooking ingredient called Shining Gurumi, also known as Crystal Fish. This fish species resides in the Death Falls, one of the three greatest waterfalls in the world, with an estimated 1,000 trillion liters of water pouring down every second. Despite its colossal flow, Death Falls is so powerful that not even a cannon can penetrate its intense current. Incidentally Sunny introduced his new teammate, a giant snake from the gourmet world named Queen. Although still a juvenile Queen's potential size could reach the length of the equator. With the reliable Queen as their water taxi, the three immediately set out towards Death Falls to search for the legendary luminous crystal fish. Sunny chose Queen as a pet because of its stunning appearance, while Sunny was indifferent to everything else. Outer beauty was Sunny's top priority. Ten minutes later Queen transported the trio to the Moors Mountain Range. Deep within this mountain range lies one of the world's three great waterfalls Death Falls. It is an extremely dangerous place where even the mightiest creatures dare not enter. Feeling hungry the trio caught some fish to make a grilled fish dish. Toriko held two delicious fish in his hands, and Kamatsu suddenly noticed that the water below was exceptionally clear. If the water was clear, it meant there was a lack of nutrients and no living organisms could thrive. It turned out that the location and structure of Death Falls turned it into a natural filtration system, absorbing all the nutrients and producing the crystal fish. Quickly they reached the source of the waterfall, where the pressure was so intense that it could tear everything apart. At this moment, a level 48 mountain dinosaur and a level 49 elephant monkey attempted to cross the falls but failed, falling into the powerful current of Death Falls. The two monstrous beasts were instantly crushed into pieces without a trace left. The swirling currents below created enormous water vortexes, functioning like high-powered washing machines. Even someone as powerful as Toriko would ascend to heaven if they fell into it. Sunny gently landed on the water's surface, using his sensory threads to form a makeshift raft. At this moment, a level 9 shark hippo unexpectedly leaped onto the water's surface, intending to attack everyone. However it quickly became a meal in Queen's belly, as it was devoured moments after opening its mouth wide to capture its supersized prey. Despite just having gulped down an immensely large catch, Insani's Ice Queen looked truly magnificent. To prepare for crossing Death Falls, Kamatsu had to wear protective clothing and an air-supplying mask. Toriko and Sunny, having conditioned their bodies in harsh environments, did not need any protective gear. As they approached the waterfall the wind became stronger, and countless water jets compressed under tremendous pressure could cut through diamonds. When shot onto the body it caused excruciating pain. Fortunately, Sunny applied tiny sensors on his head to create a shield against wind and water, using a technique called hair shield. As they successfully passed through the water vortex area, Toriko immediately used his knife technique to carve out a path. However the overpowering flow of death falls pressed down on his attack. At this moment Sunny suddenly remembered a peculiar encounter during his training. He had met a man named Demon, the gourmet gang leader who was meditating. Suddenly, someone startled him from behind and he jolted in surprise. Demon's unique training method involved eliminating all distractions in his mind, paying no attention to anything around him. Thus he often appeared absent-minded. A dragon suddenly appeared behind the two, but Gemon showed no reaction. 
Despite the bizarre appearance, he remained unfazed and unresponsive. When the dragon was about to attack, Gimon, without looking since the threat, drew his sword and swiftly cut the dragon into two in the blink of an eye. It happened so fast that Sunny couldn't see anything, and Gimon returned to his nonchalant demeanor. From that point on Sunny began training with Gimon. He tried his best but still couldn't change Gimon's expression. Indeed Gimon was the legendary leader of a notorious gang, and even Sunny using his most powerful technique, the hair punch couldn't land a hit on Gimon not even once. Gimon revealed that he activated the infinity technique. Once in this state human instincts would be heightened to the extreme. Instincts weren't something inherent, they were accumulated through training and experience. To perceive instincts one needed to first learn to cleanse the mind. A clear mind leads to success, while a mind entangled in illusions deeply traps in nightmares. Sunny found this explanation reasonable, and finally he had an epiphany, adopting the world-weary expression of his elder. Suddenly a group of saw shark sharks appeared. Sensing the danger demon's body instinctively annihilated them without conscious thought. Later that evening Sunny cooked a pot of saw shark sour soup. After eating Gimon's expression remained emotionless, truly speechless. Returning to reality, Toriko inspired by Sani's story began awakening his own instincts. Indeed after activating the infinity technique, Toriko's calm mind and water-like composure reached a new level. With just one punch he penetrated the flow of the deathfall, astonishing Sani. When did this guy become so powerful? In the end, the group successfully infiltrated the cave inside the waterfall. However the powers of Toriko and Sani were completely depleted. The two were exhausted to the point of immobility. To find food to help Toriko and Sani recover their strength, Komatsu decided to venture alone into the cave. He used milk star dust to create markers, marking the path he took so that he wouldn't get lost and his friends could find him. Upon reaching the end of the cave, Komatsu saw a glowing and radiant lake. The golden glow beneath the water was the shining Gurumi fish, also known as crystal fish in legends. Komatsu immediately assembled a specialized fish catching rod and scooped up a fish from the lake. However when Komatsu touched the fish, its body suddenly turned black, as if, poisoned. The fish vanished from the world, and it seemed that to catch this species, a special method was needed much like the puffer whales. After several failed attempts, Komatsu became convinced that these fish turned black and were inedible. Then Komatsu noticed the liquid beneath the fish tank, not water but a refined fish oil. Inadvertently, Komatsu touched the head of one fish, and he discovered that only after the fish glowed could he catch it without turning into a dead fish. Komatsu managed to obtain two boxes filled with fish and with the group, rode Queen to the top of a high mountain to enjoy the fish and admire the sunset. When the box were opened, a pleasant fragrance immediately wafted out. The fish oil, free of any greasiness, contained essential nutrients beneficial for the heart and brain. The lake was the place that absorbed all the nutrients from the mountain range, and the crystal fish were the crystallization of those nutrients. Looking at the glowing fish, Komatsu suggested making tempura fish. First, he used fish oil instead of regular oil, heated a pan of oil until very hot, then seasoned the fish and coated it in flour. Once the oil was sizzling, he placed the fish into the pan. The fish, fried in refined fish oil, didn't have a fishy taste. After frying, the oil in the pan remained vibrant. And the crystal fish oil could be reused multiple times without deterioration. In the end, they had a plate of golden and crispy fried fish, with a crunchy outer layer and tender, juicy meat inside, boasting a rich and flavorful taste. Anyone hungry, comment your address, and I'll send you some to try. Feeling that something was still missing, Komatsu combined the fried fish with milk stardust seasoning, and indeed, with a touch of seasoning, the crispy crystal fish became even more delicious. The fishing trip today was truly worthwhile. Komatsu wanted to invite Zebra next time, but Sunny disagreed because he found Zebra quite irritating, mainly due to his unappealing appearance. One day, Toriko and Komatsu were having a meal when the Milk Seconds vampire monkey suddenly came to see them. It turned out that the milk second wanted them to find an ingredient for making knives called fig crystal, a type of fruit that bears fruit only once every 10 years, with a hard diamond-like outer shell but an extremely sweet inner flesh. Coincidentally that evening the city would organize a culinary competition. The first prize of the competition was a giant fig crystal, so everyone decided to participate. The program's MC was the reporter Tina and there were three judges sitting behind to score the contestants' dishes. The competition quickly started, and unexpectedly the first contestant was Gourmet Emperor Sani. Sani used his sensing threads to sculpt three beautiful statues from Fig Crystal. His performance earned him 275 points. The second contestant was Uncle Zone dressed as a princess. Due to his appearance he was taken away by a security guard. The third contestant was Komatsu, he blended a Fig Crystal and mixed it with flour. After cha-cha dancing and making the cake simultaneously, he put it in the oven and made a fruit cake. 
The cake was delicious but for some reason, Komatsu only scored 195 points. It turned out that one of the judges had been fired for eating a morning cake, so he was upset and marked Komatsu down. Next was the second disciple and she made fig crystal jelly, a dish to cool off in the summer with added ice. The dish was super delicious and the judges scored her 285 points. Then came Jiru, the old man who with just a bottle of wine and a few figs crystal, created a dancing lion wine and temporarily took the first place with 295 points. Finally it was Toriko's turn, he used a sparkling crystal stone to create a beautiful fireworks display, but Uncle Zong accused him of cheating because he didn't use fig crystal as an ingredient, so he was disqualified. At this moment, Milk's second vampire monkey also wanted to showcase its skills. It climbed onto the giant fig crystal, and unexpectedly started glowing. The color of the melon truly resonated with it. The judges immediately awarded the vampire monkey the maximum score because it chose the fig crystal as its ingredient. In the end, the vampire monkey offered the prize to Milk's second. Indeed, it's Milk's pet. The next day, Toriko invited Komatsu to search for new cooking ingredients. This time, they were looking for a type of fruit that grows inside the Autumn Mountain Range, with an area of up to 20,000 kilometers long. The place is called the Autumn Mountain Range because the weather only experiences endless autumn. And the cool climate of autumn is very suitable for plant growth. When the fruit ripens, it will have a delicious and juicy taste. This time, Terry the wolf and the baby penguin also joined the two to enjoy delicious food. Seeing some grape clusters on the vine, Komatsu wanted to reach down and pick them, but unexpectedly discovered that they were level 30 dancing grapes. Toriko warned that in this forest, there are very peculiar creatures, so everyone needs to be careful and vigilant. For example, here is the supersonic mushroom, small but runs very fast and is difficult to catch. Inadvertently, they trespassed into the territory of a level 25 emperor bee, so the entire swarm of bees chased after them. Causing everyone to run away without their pants. Surprisingly, Coco was also present inside this forest, so Coco used his poison to drive away the bee swarm and save everyone. After that, Sonny quickly appeared as well. It turned out that the goal of the three heavenly kings was the same, they wanted to find a super juicy fruit called the Suppears. To make the trip more interesting, the whole group organized a small competition to see who would be the first to find the Suppears. Even Komatsu and the baby penguin participated. Coco's pet, Emperor Crow was both black and large, so he took advantage of the high ground to observe the terrain below. Sunny's baby queen has super sharp heat sensing senses, so no creature can escape its observation range. Although the baby penguin was somewhat useless, it had the advantage of being cute. Terry the wolf on the other hand, marked its territory strongly wherever it went. At this moment two unexpected beasts leaped down from the mountain. They were level 33 sheep pigs. The movement speed of these sheep pigs was extremely fast. One attacked Toriko, while the other captured Komatsu and the baby penguin to take them to their den. Toriko immediately rode on Terry to chase after them. When he reached the foot of the mountain, he encountered Coco and Sunny who had returned. Coco and Sunny's pets used their bodies as leverage to help Terry and Toriko climb the mountain at the fastest speed. After defeating one sheep pig, Toriko discovered that there were three immature offspring in their den. Coco noticed that the actual body under the wool of the sheep pig was extremely thin and weak. They had been hungry for a long time and needed food to feed their young. At this point, Toriko suddenly smelled a faint fragrance from within the clouds. Following the scent, he climbed to the top of the mountain and saw a giant tree. On the branches of that tree were the suppears, fresh and juicy. Toriko immediately picked one to taste. As soon as he took a bite, the fruit's juice filled his mouth, an irresistible delicious taste. The pure fragrance of the autumn range was mixed with the clouds, explaining why these legendary pears were so juicy. With these pears, the sheep pig family would no longer go hungry. On a gloomy and desolate island, occasionally, the carcasses of bizarre creatures fall from the sky, becoming delicious prey for the beasts below. Above is a secret stronghold of the Gourmet Corp organization, where chefs are preparing food. After cooking, they pour the used ingredients and garbage down below. The white-haired chef is the executive chef named Nicini. He is trying to find a way to enhance the gourmet cell level for each member in the organization. The pink-haired one is the insect controller who once faced Toriko in a battle on Ice Hell Island to compete for the soup of the century. Currently, Gourmet Corp is preparing to execute some plot, and to do this, they need to abduct many chefs as slaves. The top server Earth chefs are powerful, so the organization dare not touch them and can only capture those chefs without the ability to resist. Additionally, the organization has successfully researched and developed the latest model of combat-capable robots. Returning to the Gourmet Hotel, Komatsu was in the kitchen preparing a new cake with the ingredients he collected, longevity sugarcane, pears, and fig crystal. The diners here are all very satisfied with the dish Komatsu has just prepared. 
After completing his work, Komatsu stays in the dressing room and reads a cooking book. In the evening, Komatsu meets a friend named Otaki, the owner of the Fairy Tale Castle restaurant, ranking 99th. Otaki suggests steps for Komatsu to help the restaurant grow, which includes asking gourmet hunters to search for famous ingredients to cook new dishes. Otaki says Komatsu was naive to have a powerful hunter nearby and not know how to take advantage. A professional chef should earn a lot of money through cooking. If you cook well but don't have money, you can't make it in this world. Otaki has ambitions to climb to the top and is not hesitant to use any means to reach that pinnacle. Komatsu recalls the past when they both studied the craft together, and now Otaki has changed a lot. Indeed with money, everything becomes different even a person's character can change. On the other side, Toriko and Terry have entered the scenic garden with just one jump surpassing the 300m wall. The guards can only pretend not to notice and hope the wall will be upgraded. But not everyone has legendary beasts, and the guards worry too much. Coco has also arrived Sonny couldn't make it and Zebra decided not to come. He wandered off somewhere. The four heavenly kings when they were young, were told by the IGO president that in the gourmet garden number 8, there is a mark of an exquisite treasure unique which is the appetizer in his divine menu. Each gourmet garden will have a total dish with 8 courses. If found they can use all the items in his divine menu. Toriko and Coco enter a cave containing a large box that the group couldn't open when they were young. Moreover, now there's a two-headed chicken with incredible strength guarding this box. Coco will deal with this chicken, and Toriko will be responsible for opening the super gigantic box. Toriko flexes his buttocks and inhales deeply, Toriko's muscles swell. Then he uses the nail punch to punch hard into the box. At Otaki's restaurant, Komatsu is preparing to enjoy the dishes of his friend when he is surrounded by reporters. One introduces himself as Morita from Kalori magazine and expresses the desire to interview an idol like Komatsu someday. Komatsu is treated with cotton candy and beeswax candles by his friend, expensive ingredients. Komatsu glances at his friend and sees him bribing the reporter. In the gourmet guard Toriko and Koko are still struggling with their tasks. This two-headed chicken continuously attacks Koko. Now Koko uses a complete toxic armor covering his entire body. Koko jumps and slashes with a poisonous sword, causing the chicken to collapse. Toriko is surprised that Koko dealt with it so quickly, however Toriko still can't open the box. Earlier Toriko's old man said that even with rare ingredients from his menu, it's hard to find a skilled chef who can cook them. Toriko thinks back and decides to unleash the twin nail punch. At the restaurant, Otaki and the reporter discuss finding talented chefs. Otaki believes that in this gourmet era, with rare ingredients and media coverage, many customers will come without caring about the taste. Komatsu has noticed that some reporters came here, just for the money without eating anything, because they already had a scripted scenario in their heads to PR Otaki's restaurant. For Komatsu all customers deserve respect, as well as those who helped him understand the importance of enjoying food. On the other side Toriko still can't break through the gigantic box. Despite the hard training and overcoming difficulties to stand here today, he is determined not to give up. Toriko uses all his strength, giving 100% power to unleash a powerful blow, finally opening the gigantic box. Powerful electromagnetic waves spread throughout the earth and Komatsu, Otaki, along with many other famous chefs worldwide notice it. Toriko thought it was a whole feast inside but it turned out to be a tiny bean. Otaki thinks that Komatsu is advising him out of envy for his achievements. Komatsu thinks that money has shattered Otaki's personality, then turns and leaves, saying that when combined with Toriko he will reach the top in his own way. Despite the strong words, he cries when remembering the joyful past with his best friend. Otaki inside drinking is contemplating when a Bishakukai robot suddenly appears. At this time, the IGO president is probably sitting on the back of a noble white horse, hoping that the four heavenly kings will train diligently. Toriko and Koko have arrived at his office but the old man is nowhere to be found. The staff here informs them that he is currently interested in something related to the four heavenly kings' training. The next day, Toriko went to a barbershop to freshen up his handsome appearance. He chose this place because the owner used to be a famous chef. While getting a haircut, customers would be treated to free food. Truly a paradise for food warriors the gourmet hunter. After Toriko finished devouring more than a dozen appetizers, the owner told him to lie down for a hair wash. The owner's movements were extremely professional even from the little details, one could see that he used to be a chef with decent culinary skills. Finding it quite interesting Komatsu also wanted to try, and the owner immediately massaged him in a way as if he were tenderizing meat, before cooking to make it more delicious. Next, the owner brought out two plates of cheese-covered beef tartare. The beef was cooked just right not tough, and retained the delicious tenderness and juiciness of the meat. After finishing the meal, the owner used scissors and a comb to cut Toriko's hair, making it the most unique hair salon in the world. Oh dear, with mossy green hair, you've set a new trend.
At this point Coco also entered the barber shop to get a haircut, but the owner accidentally cut too much, so Coco's hair didn't look much different from Toriko's. Afterward, Coco and Toriko revealed to Komatsu that they were searching for the menu of Igo President. The menu had hidden a total of eight different ingredients, inside the eight botanical gardens of the IGO organization. Yesterday the two of them found a bean in botanical garden number eight. It was the bean of the million tree, a type of tree that grows in the gourmet world. It has the ability to emit sounds similar to the voices of ingredients. That's why chefs around the world heard its call echoing when Toriko opened the chest. While everyone was talking, somewhere else a group of chefs including Otaki, was being held captive by the gourmet corporation. On this side, everyone suddenly received an urgent message from Director Mansam, so the whole group had to quickly board a plane to Honey Prison. The warden and Director Mansam were waiting for everyone there. As soon as they entered the prison, the warden flirted with Toriko, making Rin jealous because he dared to flirt with her crush. The story is that a high-ranking member of the gourmet organization has just entered the ice holiday forest to find an ingredient called the sweet nectar tree. However, it has been several days and he has not returned, so Mansam and the warden asked Toriko's group to find him. They heard that the sweet nectar tree can be entirely eaten, from the trunk to the leaves, and it usually grows in winter in places with temperatures lower than minus 100 degrees. After a while Rin detected the missing group's walkie-talkie signals, indicating that they were nearby. At this point the group was suddenly surrounded by a herd of goat-headed frogs, but Sunny appeared and drove the frogs away, revealing that he was also asked to search for the missing people. Toriko about to turn the frog group into a meal, suddenly saw the frogs running away very fast, as if they were afraid of something. In another location Zebra while hunting, encountered a devil bat. He punched it and the bat died instantly. Zebra being ferocious needs to find 100 types of ingredients, and capture 500 wanted criminals to finalize his contract with Juventus. On this side after searching the entire morning, the group finally found the sweet nectar tree and fortunately, the missing individuals were still alive. After eating the fruit they quickly regained their health. Toriko immediately used his knife skills to peel the tree bark, revealing a layer of soft and smooth sponge cake with an incredibly delicious taste. The leaves had a cool and gentle minty flavor. Even the frozen dewdrops tasted as sweet as sugar. The layer of soil below was top quality chocolate. Sunny used his sculpting sensors to turn those ice blocks into a sphere, decorating the sweet nectar tree and turning it into a Christmas tree. Toriko and Coco went to find some rare ingredients in the forest. Although it looked quite large, it was actually quite light and tasted like cotton candy. At this moment, Rin suddenly spotted a wild beast approaching a level 7 swordhorn, which was the reason the frogs were frightened away. Swordhorns are herd animals so when one appears, its entire herd is likely to be nearby. Komatsu was assigned the task of preparing the ingredients, while the others would confront the herd of swordhorns. These creatures were quite powerful but luckily, the group successfully delayed them, waiting until Komatsu completed the final decoration for the Christmas tree. The five-pointed star made of glowing stones quickly emitted the radiant light, making the swordhorn herd less fierce and much more gentle. At this point the missing old man that the group rescued informed everyone that Director Mansam still had a very important task for them. Mansam wanted them to transform into Santa Claus and distribute gifts to underprivileged children worldwide on Christmas Day, and he had already prepared a sufficient amount of gifts. Initially Mansam also intended to call Zebra, but he was busy with something else and couldn't assist. Each member had highly reputable and quality pets to take on the responsibility of transporting goods. The pets moved at supersonic speed, swiftly loading boxes of candy onto their bodies. With all preparations complete the group immediately set off. These gifts were purchased with the huge profits gained from gourmet arena betting matches. Mansam used the money from the wealthy to support impoverished children worldwide. He also revealed the natural fish oil that Komatsu had found, highly praised by the culinary world. It seemed that he might soon enter the top 100 ranking of the world's top chefs. Rin was delighted to be traveling with Toriko. Terry was carrying them at a maximum speed of 350 km per hour. The destination was a country that had just experienced a civil war. At this moment, a mantis spider was preparing to attack a boy to make a tasty meal. However before it could harm the boy, Toriko quickly dealt with it using his exceptional knife skills. Toriko and Rin inquired about the boy's situation. Due to hunger the boy had to risk going outside to find food. Seeing the boy's plight Toriko decided to help him. In another location, Director Mansam and Komatsu were distributing gifts to the poor. For those who usually struggled to have a good meal, it was an extremely joyful occasion. Komatsu even fried chicken legs with the refined fish oil he found during the crystal fish hunting trip. He wanted the children to experience a fresh and lively atmosphere. On this side Sunny was also distributing gifts to the children. He even created a gigantic Christmas tree using hair, bringing smiles and happiness to the kids. Over here Coco was handing out gifts when he noticed a poor girl. He approached her, offering words of comfort and predicting a bright future for her. Coco assured her that his predictions would come true. 
In another location, Zebra was taking a stroll along the beach when a daring fish leaped onto the shore, attempting to feast on him. However Zebra quickly dealt with it and in no time, the fish was grilled and emanating a delicious aroma. It turned out that Zebra unintentionally eliminated a ferocious sea monster that often troubled the villagers providing a full meal for the local children. Meanwhile, Toriko had taken the unfortunate boy back home and provided food for his siblings. Afterwards, he continued distributing gifts to the children in the area, bringing not much, but enough to exchange for many smiles and tears of happiness. Snow had started to fall, and it was a rare type of snow with a unique flavor, known as flavor snow, which appeared once every few decades. Even in paradise, the joy of the blessed children with food was celebrated. Komatsu, Koko, and Toriko all wore white suits, looking like sophisticated gentlemen as they were on their way to the world's largest casino. This place was beyond the reach of the law, attracting many pleasure seekers and underworld figures who desired to visit. The casino housed exotic and addictive ingredients, including high-quality ones that were difficult to obtain legally. These ingredients frequently circulated through illegal channels, and one of the targets of today's trip was the meteor garlic. This mysterious garlic was believed to grow in places where meteors rarely fell. Consuming it would provide enough energy for an entire month, making it an excellent ingredient for gourmet cells of gourmet hunters. It was the prize at the gourmet casino. This casino also served as the Kingdom of Jadar, where Coco had come to train. Despite being the world's largest casino, the people here lived in abject poverty. As Toriko descended, he was confronted by a few fake mafia thugs who attempted to threaten and rob him. Toriko, feigning fear, put on a cute expression that was ironically terrifying. When one of them fired a gunshot, Toriko effortlessly caught the bullet with two fingers and then unleashed his intimidating aura, causing the fake mafia members to hastily flee. The group proceeded to the city's marketplace, where even highly toxic ingredients like killer whale were being sold. An old lady approached Komatsu, inviting him to buy some lucky stars. However, Toriko intervened, recognizing them as poisonous stars that caused addiction. He recounted an incident where these toxic stars appeared in a marketplace, resulting in the destruction of an entire city and millions of lives in that area. All the items on display seemed to range from mildly addictive to severely harmful, with nothing appearing to be healthy. Suddenly, they came across a stall selling mushroom sushi, and Toriko wanted to buy it as it could serve as a betting ingredient. Despite the outward appearance of poverty in the city, the central district was opulent, attracting the wealthy elite who came here to launder money. Any attempt at robbery here would likely result in death rather than imprisonment. Toriko, feeling indignant, extended his hand to help, as the rich were willing to gamble with the lives of others. Another thug tried to pick Komatsu's pocket, but fortunately, Match intervened. Just by looking, Match deduced that they had come here for reward ingredients. He disclosed that the area was reserved for VIPs, and the gourmet Yakuza, led by his boss, managed it. With Match in charge now, many illegal and addictive ingredients were being transported to the city. Match came to investigate, suspecting that underground chefs were involved, and the mastermind behind it all was Livebearer. Match drew his sword and charged into the base of the underground chefs. Coco realized that trying to confront Livebearer head-on with Match's strength was futile, so their best option was to disrupt Livebearer's casino. Toriko, seeing Match's determination, convinced the group to join forces in dismantling the rigged casino run by Livebearer. Everyone quickly descended to observe the situation. Komatsu strolled, admiring the magnificent scenery. Their every step was closely monitored by the casino's cameras. The prize for today was not addictive ingredients but rather premium ones that looked very delicious. Match believed that the addictive ingredients were likely in the VIP area, so everyone decided to go there. Toriko and Coco immediately went to withdraw money with the black gourmet card in hand. Toriko decided to go big, withdrawing 100 million gourmet dollars. The wealthy people withdrew money in such a distinctive manner, and the shiny coins were presented, indicating they were edible. Coco, being modest, took only one gold coin, but with that single coin, Coco planned to conquer the entire casino. Toriko tested his strength with the strength testing machine, resulting in a score of 666. He placed a bet of 1 million, and now he had won 6 million. Coco, with just one coin, had now won a heap of rare ingredients. Coco glanced at the camera, signaling everyone, and the group quickly dispersed to attract the casino's attention. On Match's side, he had won big. Toriko continued to play with the strength testing machine, playing so much that the staff eventually stopped him. Komatsu was playing odd or even, and Toriko accidentally bumped into him, causing Komatsu to drop a coin and win three coins. Toriko suggested finding another place with more significant stakes. The group gathered at the famous hundred-faced slot machine of the gourmet casino. The machine had 100 vertical and 100 horizontal faces with 60 different patterns, spinning at speeds ranging from 100 to 150 meters per second. Coco immediately inserted a coin into the machine, and the spinning speed was dazzling. Using his extraordinary eyes, Coco observed the machine's movement and continuously pressed the stop button for each row. Now the audience had filled the entire area. 
After three years, only Coco had solved the casino puzzle with just one coin. However, the casino staff noticed Coco's apparent ease in winning games in this area and decided to take them to a more enticing section. Another staff member went to a dark room to inform their boss that Coco and Toriko were present. With just one coin, Coco won one trillion worth of valuable ingredients. Now, I understand why fortune tellers don't go gambling. If making money is as easy as this, who needs fortune telling? Coco mentioned that it wasn't luck but skill. The staff then took Coco to a more exciting section. As they stepped in, they expected to see dazzling lights. But what they saw was the reality of the underworld. A man had just been poisoned by devil poisoned apples. Most ingredients here were not only illegal but could also be deadly. The antics in this place treated others' lives as garbage. Money could indeed make people do anything here. The despicable individuals Komatsu encountered earlier in the lobby were now present as VIP customers. Those participating in life-threatening challenges were people who had not settled the debts they owed to the casino. Another person was playing a game with the chance of a durian bomb, every 10 bombs would kill the guy who ate it in less than 5 minutes. The staff member attempted to use psychological tactics, however Coco refused to play this game, and Match welcomed the challenge, urging everyone to bet on him. A giant figure appeared, expressing a desire for a more interesting wager, surpassing even the VIP area. This person was the owner of the casino and the underworld culinary world's boss, Live Bearer. The group followed Live Bearer, who referred to this place as the secret VIP area, accessible only to the most special VIP customers. The nobles in this area had their gourmet memories extracted. Coco was aware of this, here, they gambled memories of the food they had tasted in the past, known as gourmet memories. During his time in Jadar Kingdom, Coco had learned about these things. What he most wanted to find was a drink from complete menu of the holy acacia called Adam. Live Bearer believed that Coco might find some information within the memories of someone here. The elderly man was having his memories taken away, not just memories of food but also memories of his daughter's birthday. Live Bearer aimed to monopolize the most gourmet memories in people's minds. If memories were completely lost, the heart could stop beating, leading to the end of the game. After the conversation, both sides were ready to fight, but Toriko still wanted to play and bet his own memories to obtain the meteor garlic. Komatsu worried about losing the wonderful memories that both of them had worked so hard to create together. After the deal, Live Bearer led everyone down to a deep underground floor, welcoming them to what seemed like Squid Game, my mistake it was actually the Gourmet Arena. Both sides would play a culinary card drawing game. If a player drew two cards that didn't match, they would lose their turn. If they drew two cards with the same ingredient, they would get to eat. However, if the player couldn't finish the depicted dish on the card, all the points would go to their opponent. If a player drew 10 times without a match or failed to finish the food in two consecutive draws, they would be declared the loser. The boss also warned that in one set of culinary cards, there would be two prank cards, and the dishes depicted on those cards would be extremely difficult to eat. Due to suspicions of potential cheating, Match spoke up. However, the boss claimed to be a chef with the pride of a gambler and insisted he would never stoop so low. Before the game started, the team assigned roles. Coco, with his highly accurate precognition ability, was chosen as the card drawer, while Toriko was assigned the easy task of sitting still and enjoying the food without having to do anything. The boss revealed that he had played this game 214 times and had never lost, making Komatsu a bit nervous. Next, Match would flip a coin, with the boss choosing heads and Coco abstaining. Whoever guessed correctly would get the first chance to draw cards. Surprisingly, after the coin landed, it stood on its edge without falling on either side. Coco had correctly predicted this outcome and earned the right to draw the first card. He drew two cherry apple cards, each worth 10 points. The chef immediately brought a serving of cherry apples matching the images on the cards. Toriko simply sat back, watched, and enjoyed an easy 10 points. Coco continued by drawing two cards depicting shattered mushroom, worth 20 points. Komatsu used these ingredients to create a rich and creamy mushroom ice cream, inviting Toriko to savor it. After eating, the team had a total of 40 points and was currently leading against the boss. Now it's his turn to draw cards, and even the boss has to admit that Coco's foresight ability is formidable. He drew two sausage cards, each worth 50 points. With these ingredients, the boss prepared a dish called burning sausages. After eating, he also received 50 points. Next, he drew two mushroom cards, each worth 70 points. But don't be misled by high-scoring ingredients, as they are often challenging to cook and consume, requiring a chef of exceptional skill. In the final card draw, the boss revealed a 100-point egg fruit, bringing his total score to 220 points after three consecutive meals. The card drawing round shifted to Coco, and with a 180-point gap, Coco decided to make a bold move by drawing two high-scoring cards, putting cards worth 150 points each. Immediately, a giant pudding appeared before everyone. Toriko had to consume the entire pudding within 150 minutes, or he would lose the match. Toriko started savoring the delicious and creamy layers of pudding. 
Concerned about Toriko consuming too many sweets and increasing his blood sugar, Komatsu prepared a sauce using garlic, nuts, and bananas to regulate the body's sugar absorption and aid digestion. In the end, Toriko finished the entire plate of pudding, bringing an additional 150 points to the team. Next, Coco drew two summer whiskey cards with an alcohol content of 83%, an extremely potent liquor. Despite its strength, Toriko, being the gourmet hunter, downed the entire bottle in one go. Following that, Komatsu prepared a plate of cheese cabbage to help Toriko recover from the effects of alcohol. In the final round, Coco drew two hazelnut bullet cards, each worth 70 points. These nuts fell rapidly like bullets, releasing a toxic substance upon impact. After finishing the plate of bullet nuts, the total score for the team reached 310 points, surpassing the boss by 90 points. It was at this moment that the boss realized Komatsu, besides the two heavenly kings, was no ordinary chef. Komatsu's brain intrigued the boss, and he was determined to acquire it. Koko observed and perhaps sensed something unusual about Livebearer. The real battle was only beginning. After three rounds, it would be Livebearer's turn, and what he drew was a stone rat worth 70 points. Although valuable, it wasn't easy to handle, with a level reaching 60. With just two strikes, Livebearer effortlessly captured and threw the stone rat with three horns into his cooking pot. After consuming it, he continued the game. In this round, he selected a poisonous lizard worth 150 points, a highly toxic ingredient. With two swift slashes, he easily killed the creature, then undertook the challenging task of cooking and consuming it. For his final draw, Livebearer struck big, garlic crab worth 200 points. This Livebearer guy played this game in a mysterious and deceptive way. Match still couldn't figure out the trick he was using. In three rounds, Livebearer earned an additional 420 points, bringing his total to 640 points. Komatsu admired his talent. Despite winning high-scoring ingredients, Livebearer could effortlessly cook challenging materials. However, what no one knew was that Livebearer's cooking techniques were extracted from the memories of many chefs who lost here. Coco remained calm like still water and deliberately chose two cards that didn't match, forfeiting his turn and passing it to Livebearer. After consulting with ChatGPT, Coco's strategy to win this card drawing game was deduced as avoiding drawing large losing cards during the game and forfeiting strategically. Livebearer believed that even if his trick was exposed, winning against him was impossible. However, whether this anime character's name was Livebearer or not, viewers were already aware of the outcome. During Livebearer's turn, he effortlessly accumulated high points with winning cards, and his total score reached 930 points, far exceeding Toriko's team. It was Koko's turn and he once again made the wrong choice, causing Komatsu and Toriko to panic amidst the crowd. The turn was again transferred to Livebearer. Continuously drawing high-scoring cards, he now raised his total points to 1190, surpassing Toriko's team by 880 points. At this point, Koko stated that the most challenging opportunity was also the only chance for the entire group to reverse this one-way game. This time, Koko made the right choice with the Emperor Crab. Toriko entered the fray, using his flying fork technique flawlessly and then passing the cooking task to Komatsu. The Emperor Crab and spicy chili sauce emerged from the oven, presenting a perfect appearance. Toriko folded his hands in prayer, expressing gratitude for the meal. As they say, with great power comes great responsibility. In any vulnerability the team placed their trust. Coco flipped his card, revealing the highly toxic devil's poison potato. An ingredient that not even Setsuno had notes on how to remove its toxicity. It was considered 20 times more toxic than the puffer whalefish and could only be consumed and cooked within 10 minutes, with a mere 10 points. Finding it extremely challenging to eat, Coco skipped his turn, passing it to Livebearer. He drew a furious bear card, a fierce creature with a level of 80, but its value was 250 points, corresponding to its worth. Livebearer quickly drew another card, the cheese insult, a substance emitting such a foul odor that it couldn't be processed. Due to the significant point difference, he chose this to avoid the hassle of dealing with an level 80 monster. In Coco's turn, he drew a sea urchin mouse and a snake centipede, both with capture levels above 50, but their points were only 10. Coco made the wrong choice in trying to eliminate these two tricky cards. In this tense moment, the Toriko team could potentially turn the tide of this game. Due to the point difference, Livebearer discarded all the challenging dishes and confidently waited for Coco's mistake. Coco trusted Toriko and decided to reveal the Furious Bear card to show Livebearer why this anime was named Toriko. Simultaneously as Toriko engaged in the battle, Coco had a private conversation with Komatsu. Allow me to provide more information about this gourmet casino for you to understand. Beasts with capture levels above 60 at the gourmet casino were kept in a special underground vault. Almost all the guests who went there never returned. If they could consume these tricky playing cards, they could exchange one card with Livebearer, creating a dramatic turnaround for the entire group. Toriko took the battle seriously and directly attacked the Furious Bear. He swiftly avoided its attacks, but it was not an easy task. The Furious Bear charged fiercely and launched a relentless assault on Toriko, who then disappeared from sight after a series of punches. A ferocious beast, Coco explained that the Furious Bear was the number one ruthless omnivore. Capable of clearing an entire ecosystem of living creatures on a mountain in just half a day. 
Toriko concentrating his strength and unleashed the 18-hit nail punch. He charged forward to deliver a straight punch to this furious bear. Kamatsu was delighted, but that wasn't enough to defeat this beast. Toriko had to strip off his shirt, revealing his truly powerful muscles. The furious bear charged and punched at Toriko, who, now much more agile, managed to evade all attacks. Koko referred to Toriko's skill as intuition, fighting without thinking, relying on previous combat experience. Toriko unleashed his sharpness, delivering 36 consecutive nail punches, then continued to punch the stomach of the enraged bear. This time, it truly fell. Now it was Kamatsu's turn. Koko had previously whispered to Kamatsu, trusting in his abilities. Observing Toriko's endurance reaching its limit due to excessive use of techniques draining his stamina. Kamatsu cooked the bear, placing the steamed meat on vegetables and wrapping them in large paper. He brought it out, adding soy sauce and sauce for Toriko to enjoy. Before Kamatsu finished explaining, Toriko had already finished eating. Koko used the advantage of winning the tricky card and took the crab garlic card for himself, then handed the summer whiskey card to Livebearer. This decision puzzled Livebearer because whiskey was a high-scoring card. Kamatsu continued to prepare the crab garlic in sashimi form, Toriko quickly finished it before Koko even finished his explanation. Livebearer analyzed the remaining cards and understood Koko's plan. He thought the chance of success was nearly zero, but let me remind you that the anime name is Toriko, Mr. Livebearer. Now Livebearer had to drink the summer whiskey, an addictive ingredient that Toriko had consumed earlier. Livebearer shared that this was his favorite drink. After that, he ate cheese cabbage like Kamatsu did for Toriko. Koko quickly chose to forfeit his turn, allowing Toriko to rest. Livebearer realized this, so he also skipped drawing cards, not giving Toriko any rest time. However, these were Koko's cunning calculations all along. The next two cards chosen by Koko were the Firecracker Dragonfly and the Cheese Insult, both with only 10 points. Koko asked Toriko and Kamatsu to do their best for this stage. Next was the Cheese Insult with only 10 points. This was a high-risk ingredient, but Kamatsu found a unique way to prepare it, placing it on a crisp biscuit and adding a little apricot jam to make it more palatable. Though it had a slightly strong smell, Toriko easily ate it. With Kamatsu's culinary skills continuing the winning streak, the last card Koko prepared was the Bomb Cherry, a tricky ingredient with only 10 points and challenging to process. This was the only way the team could turn the game around. Kamatsu, with a tense and careful face, precisely inserted the bomb cherry into a 6 degrees Celsius environment, the ideal temperature for the bomb cherry. He maintained the temperature, separating the layers through delicate adjustments and avoiding any small collisions. Kamatsu was meticulous and careful, feeling nervous about this cherry. Toriko, realizing this, approached and simply put the bomb cherry into his mouth, and it began to explode inside him, creating a loud sound that even I could feel. Toriko believed there was no winning or losing with ingredients, everything was a gift from nature. After standing up confidently, he affirmed that all the ingredients he had eaten were delicious. Koko noticed that the bomb cherry had likely caused severe damage to Toriko's internal organs, but now the gourmet cells in his body were beginning to regenerate those damaged organs at full capacity. The live bearer's face twisted in a perverted delight, seeing Kamatsu dripping with saliva due to the memories of his cooking. Koko exchanged a lightning lemon for live bearer, giving him furious bear instead of a 10-point card. Match realized the potential for victory lay in making Livebearer give up in this round so that the team could receive all the points. However, Livebearer also caught onto this plan and ignored the bear, believing he had read Koko's intentions and avoided being psychologically manipulated. Kamatsu prepared a lightning lemon with a special sauce made from dragon honey, creating a lemon piece with an electric potential of 10,000 volts when eaten. Despite the challenging nature of the dish, Toriko flawlessly consumed it, stating that if a delicious dish was in front of him, he would be ready to eat it without hesitation. Koko's score was now 1290, turning the situation around in a blink. All three rounds had passed, and now it was Livebearer's turn again. He revealed an electric banana, an addictive ingredient worth 180 points. Livebearer grinned maliciously, revealing that he cooked the banana in sugar syrup to completely eliminate the addictive substance. Now he easily consumed it and claimed the 180 points. Livebearer was delighted because, even if everyone finished the remaining ingredients, Coco's team still couldn't surpass his score. He generously invited everyone to finish the remaining ingredients. Coco thanked Livebearer for doing exactly as he predicted. Toriko and Kamatsu easily consumed all the remaining challenging ingredients, and Toriko's body had fully recovered. On the table remained only one last ingredient, the deadly poisonous potato card, the worst card in the game. Livebearer asserted that there was no ingredient he couldn't eat in process, even the monstrous beasts that he could easily kill. Therefore, there was no chance for Toriko's team. Koko already knew all of this because those who were fraudulent were easy to spot. He knew that Livebearer would never include ingredients he couldn't eat in this game. Koko concluded with the statement that this would be the last thing Livebearer would ever eat in his life, the chain of the worst foods for the poisonous potato, leaving Livebearer shocked and sweating, realizing he had fallen into Koko's carefully crafted scenario. 
Komatsu further explained that when consuming multiple dishes simultaneously, it could be either beneficial or detrimental, citing an example that eating watermelon and drinking beer together might have a diuretic effect that is not good for the body. However, pairing liver and garlic enhances the absorption of vitamin B in the liver, which is excellent for health recovery. Koko continued Komatsu's story, explaining that potatoes contain a harmful substance called solanine found in the plant sprouts. However, the toxic potatoes contains a new toxic element called neosolanine, which is about 40,000 times more toxic than solanine. Completely removing neosolanine is impossible. Nevertheless, depending on how the food is combined, the toxicity can return to its original nature. Indeed, sir toxic along with predictive abilities, the scenarios Coco prepared all unfolded as predicted. Everything in the food chain that Lightbearer was psychologically manipulated by Coco had been planned by him after Lightbearer ate the golden shrimp. All of this was orchestrated thanks to Coco's intuition and Lightbearer's arrogance. These elements made it easy for Coco to manipulate Lightbearer psychologically, and the bomb cherry card was what Coco bet on for Toriko. In return, it caused trouble in Toriko's food chain before eating that dish. Coco strategically planned for Toriko's recovery by having him consume the meat of the furious bear. This was why Komatsu preserved the meat, not wanting to lose the essential nutrients like vitamin B1. The combination of vitamin B1 with allicin in the garlic when Toriko consumed it expedited the recovery process. Furthermore, Toriko consumed the firecracker dragonfly meat just before the bomb cherry, neutralizing the explosive ingredients. Lastly, the disgusting smell of the cheese insult served to protect Toriko's nose from inhaling toxic fumes from the explosion. That was also why Komatsu didn't completely remove the explosive core of the cherry but processed it to maximize its taste, and the lightning lemon afterward stimulated a strong heartbeat, aiding in the recovery process. Match is impressed by the perfect script that Coco has written. Indeed, there is always someone stronger. While the whole group explains their script, Lightbearer quickly enhances his body to eliminate any sensations of pain in his brain. Additionally, he has a layer of biodegradable plastic covering his internal organs, ensuring that toxins cannot permeate his body. He proudly declares himself the lord of the gourmet underworld, confident that he cannot be defeated. Coco closes his eyes and adds a final note when drinking the summer whiskey and suitable vegetable is the cheese cabbage, which contains a large amount of bacteria capable of breaking down alcohol and biodegradable plastic. He drops this information casually, surprising Lightbearer, who didn't anticipate that Coco would consider the fact that he covered his internal organs with biodegradable plastic to avoid toxins. Lightbearer, unwilling to accept defeat, urges his subordinates to the match. Of course, Coco had planned for this from the beginning. Coco, not just a fortune teller but a powerful gourmet hunter, offers to take on this crazy chef himself. He effortlessly defeats Lightbearer using his toxic armor, and Komatsu takes the opportunity to finish preparing the toxic potato and lizard ingredients, the sea hedgehog, and the snake scorpion. They are the ingredients calculated by Coco to assist in the consumption of this final dish. Toriko, after consuming the poisonous potatoes, as expected by Coco, saw the gourmet cells of Toriko evolve after neutralizing the toxin. Toriko proudly declared that Kamasu was his true teammate, making Lightbearer hear it. Finally, the whole group together descended into the casino to search for the meteor garlic, with guidance from Lightbearer. Lightbearer wondered why they didn't use all the data in his head. Toriko explained that doing so would be no different from Lightbearer because food is not sensed through thoughts but through the mouth. During the investigation, Match and his Yakuza comrades found the meteor garlic that Toriko needed. Upon arriving at the location of the meteor garlic, Lightbearer mentioned that it is also a special ingredient and questioned if Komatsu could process it. Komatsu, with a confident face, stated that he would try his best to process it. Koko and Toriko went to the top floor to admire the cityscape, leaving Komatsu with Lightbearer in the kitchen. Under the kitchen, Komatsu struggled to peel the meteor garlic, and Lightbearer thought that this special ingredient would be too much for Komatsu. Just as he thought so, he looked back and saw Komatsu finding a way to peel it without any hints. In a moment, Komatsu completely peeled the garlic, then asked Lightbearer about the cheese bacillus. He believed that the bacteria in the cheese cabbage could peel off the tough shell. Coco's knocking was now ineffective, and Lightbearer quickly approached Komatsu. However, instead of causing harm, he sincerely guided Komatsu in the right direction. Perhaps seeing Komatsu's passionate dedication reminded Lightbearer of his own past. This is also true in Coco's prediction. Restraining Lightbearer for a short time is also because he believes that with Komatsu's love for cooking, they can wash away the wickedness in Lightbearer's heart. Placing this garlic on the table immediately exploded, shooting light across the beautiful sky, illuminating the entire city. Everyone praised and enjoyed the exploding garlic, and the edible part was the core of this garlic. The delicious piece of garlic split into five pieces, and everyone thanked Lightbearer, inviting him to join the table because with him, the whole group could eat, and the more people, the merrier. As each person took a bite, Komatsu and Match's muscles swelled up, resembling bodybuilders, while Koko seemed like a giant. Perhaps this is the dish that matches his gourmet cells, and this time Lightbearer will be the chef, a genuine chef. 
Toriko also began to eat, feeling the meteor garlic tearing through his clothes and muscles, with his body developing just as impressively. Lightbearer handed back the casino management to match and gave him full authority to remove any illegal ingredients. Everyone thanked each other for the delicious meal. On the Toriko helicopter, Toriko and Tom discussed the gourmet match. It seems that match has now managed to eliminate all illegal ingredients. Lightbearer has taken responsibility for managing order in the casino. After a conversation Toriko skydives to a certain area and bids farewell to Tom. President Igo Ichiria walks alone in a cave, facing the entire Bishikukai group, from head chef to sous chefs. The eldest among them doors, introduces himself as the executive head chef and asks Ichiriu about his intentions. Ichiria smiles and states that he just wants to talk to one person, the boss. A white monkey comes forward, introducing itself as vile and expressing the desire for Igo Ichiria to taste its appetizer. The sous chefs immediately unleash their techniques to restrain Ichiryu, with assistant head chef Kuramato explaining that some of the younger chefs have become stronger and want to test their abilities on him due to the significant evolution of their gourmet cells. The monkey creature takes flight, but Ichiryu effortlessly neutralizes all their supposedly strongest techniques, surprising Nicini, who informs his subordinates that Ichiryu was once known as the world's top figure. He commands the group to unleash their full strength to stop him, and although they intensify their killing intent, Ichiryu casually steps forward. He activates his conqueror's hockey, a power of sheer attraction, causing the entire group to tremble. After suppressing the Bishikukai chefs for a while, the boss named Midora finally steps forward. Midora is one of the three disciples of Saint Acacia, akin to Chairman Igo Ichiryu, and he is the youngest and most favored by Saint Acacia. Ichiryu desires to enjoy God alongside Midora, but Midora immediately refuses, stating that he will take God for himself and keep it exclusively. Despite the potential outbreak of war, Midora asserts that once he finishes speaking, Ichiria should leave and if he stays, he will be killed. Ichiria declares that this will be their final conversation. Emphasizing that he still sees Midora as a younger brother. He warns that if God appears, he won't show mercy. After Ichiria's response Midora vanishes. Returning home, Ichiria indulges in hundreds of dishes. Setsuno criticizes Midora for being foolish to reject Ichiria's conditions. Ichiryu believes that in the future, only the four heavenly kings might share a table and savor such worldly delicacies. Setsuno observes Ichiryu eating voraciously, suspecting his intention to awaken all the gourmet cells in his body, indicating the situation is becoming increasingly serious. At the gourmet hotel, after a long break from work, Komatsu was about to receive a scolding from the manager. However, seeing the positive reaction of customers to the dish he just prepared, the manager hesitates and decides to go elsewhere. Meanwhile Toriko was alone in a forest, preparing equipment to search for clues about the sixth ingredient. Unbeknownst to him, someone lurks behind. Toriko enters the skill garden forest, discovering colorful crystal flowers, paper lotus flowers, and a large tree known as the lacquer tree, with resin harder than premium cement. While investigating, a skill garden craftsman warns Toriko to speak quietly, or else it will arrive. It turns out to be the devil plant horse, hungry and agitated. Toriko uses flying fork and flying knife, but it evades swiftly, even faster than an angry bear. After catching his breath, Toriko remembers the lacquer tree, uses the flying fork on it, and the resin immobilizes the unfortunate horse. Toriko delivers a thunderous punch, rendering the creature unconscious. The craftsmen thank Toriko, as the horse prevented them from working. The mysterious observer revealed as Manchi, a sushi fortune teller, greets Toriko. Then Toriko goes to Manchi's restaurant to enjoy some sushi. He informs Manchi that he is searching for the sixth ingredient of Ichiryu but is unaware of its location. Despite Koko's attempts at prediction, they are unable to obtain any conclusive results. Manchi believes that all they need is a strong belief in life. While Manchi philosophizes, Toriko devours hundreds of sushi dishes. Toriko's sixth training ingredient is located in the lost forest. Manchi, upon hearing this, screams, causing a tremor in the sky. He deems it a significant prophecy, emphasizing the need to gather sufficient ingredients. The next day, Komatsu is called in to assist Toriko. To save on fuel costs, the pilot has Komatsu jump down. Luckily, the seat is equipped with an automatic parachute, preventing potential disaster. Toriko quickly goes out to welcome Komatsu. He introduces the place where they are standing as the second landscape garden. This garden is specifically dedicated to researching ingredients from the ocean. Inside, it resembles a miniature ecosystem with various marine species, as they are nurtured in an extremely ideal environment, enhancing their flavors compared to naturally raised counterparts. Toriko and Komatsu sit in a sea turtle boat, diving underwater to a renowned underwater restaurant serving premium seafood. They choose seats by the glass window to enjoy both their meal and the scenic beauty of the ocean. Toriko orders the restaurant's two best-selling dishes, slow-cooked beef with potatoes and oyster chowder pasta. The beef is tender, paired with creamy potatoes, and the pasta is immersed in a rich oyster sauce. 
To finish, they indulge in a refreshing glass of plum Elan soda. After the meal, Toriko reveals that he is searching for an ingredient in the lost forest. As the world's largest forest with an unknown ingredient location, Toriko sought the guidance of sushi fortune teller Manchi. Manchi explains that by gathering the right ingredients for a feng shui sushi roll, it will guide Toriko to his destination like a compass. Meanwhile, member of the IGO organization suddenly approached Toriko to reveal shocking news, the stew pond, renowned as the treasure of the gourmet world, has been frozen. If the freezing condition persists and the temperature continues to drop, the survival of fish species in the pond will be threatened. Due to the severity of the issue, all members of the four heavenly kings have been summoned, and it has been a while since the brothers gathered. This place is an ideal habitat for penguin chicks, so it really like here. Toriko quickly sensed the aroma of seaweed emanating from below the water, and the pond seemed like a high-class hot pot in nature. Toriko came here to catch a freshwater fish and Rin quickly followed in Komatsu, she didn't seem to care much. The desired fish not only has an extremely delicious taste but also possesses a luxurious and elegant appearance. Resembling royalty, hence being called the madam of all fish in the world. At this point, Coco began using his precognitive abilities to determine the location of Madam Fish. He discovered an ice hole used for fishing in front, and Coco immediately dropped the bait down. However, the success rate of catching the Madam Fish is only 40%. Nearby, Sani used his thousands of hair strands to sense the smallest vibrations at the bottom of the lake, while Zebra did the same by releasing sound waves. Kamatsu didn't rush to catch Madam Fish because he had to take care of the penguin chick. On this side, before fishing, Toriko had to consume a block of cold ice to cool down in the summer heat. Tasting like a high-class hot pot. However, during the recent times of fishing all morning, they only caught a few ugly fish that no one knew the species of. It seems like Madam Fish also sensed the danger, so it dove deep under the lake bottom and hit carefully. The worst part is that Sani kept catching some weird-looking fish, and he even body-shamed them disgustingly. At this moment, Toriko smelled a faint aroma, and then the eyes of the other three heavenly kings quickly focused on Komatsu. It turns out that a madam fish had taken his bait. The four heavenly kings beside him enthusiastically cheered to encourage Komatsu. After a few minutes of struggling with the fishing rod, Komatsu finally succeeded in catching a grade 83 madam fish. Suddenly, an eagle swooped down from nowhere trying to snatch the fish, but luckily for the eagle, the eagle's meat wasn't tasty. The four heavenly kings only chased it away instead of harming it. After finding the madam fish, Toriko and Komatsu continue to the Firewater Island to search for ingredients to make sushi. The fish on the island borrow the alcohol to drown their sorrows and often forget the way back home because the surrounding seas are made up of various types of extremely strong alcoholic beverages. The boat quickly arrived at the Firewater Island, also known as the Drunken Kingdom, alongside the Champagne Island and the Cocktail Island, where various types of mixed drinks are found. After bidding farewell to the boat captain, Toriko and Komatsu set foot on the island to find the world's best rice vinegar, known as the king of all vinegars. It is made from a high-quality alcohol yeast on the island. Both are eager to taste it because the place has a high-grade alcohol waterfall, causing the animals here to be intoxicated every day, paying no attention to hunting. Toriko immediately took a sip of the delicious-smelling alcohol, which only had 40 degrees, making it suitable for anyone to drink. Then, they found a stream of shining golden beer, a tree full of French fries to be enjoyed with beer, making it all delicious. Even when it rained, it wasn't ordinary water but a high-quality champagne rain. After a while, they found a great 48 emerald dragon, rumored to carry a lot of wine on its back. Coincidentally, Jiru, who is currently on the back of this dragon, invited them up to enjoy the wine lake. The wine here is extremely delicious, and Jiru regularly drinks wine for 7 days a week. Converted to market value, a small bottle of wine taken from the back of the Emerald Dragon is worth billions. Its rarity and value are evident. After three days of dining on the beer island, Toriko also brought back the best rice vinegar for Manchi. However, the ingredients they have are still not enough to make sushi. Toriko comes up with the idea to seek Tepe's advice, thinking about the information obtained from Jiro. Based on Tepe's years of experience and training, he reveals that ant armor is made from coffee beans, the head is made from milk, and the abdomen is made from syrup. When boiled, it creates a drinking called ant coffee. Tepe also wants to introduce a few other ingredients to Toriko and Komatsu. Recently, Tepe has revived some important ingredients and is both worried and afraid of violating Igo laws. One such ingredient is the world's most foul-smelling fruit, the bomb durian, nicknamed the stink bomb. Which looks like a weapon. The Igo organization is restricting its release into the market. Toriko and Komatsu set out to find this bomb durian. As they step outside, the intense smell prevents everyone from going except Toriko and Komatsu. Toriko mentions that the bomb durian is about 100 kilometers away, and he can still smell the durian faintly here. This smell is not yet the strongest of durians. 
When the fruit ripens and falls to the ground, it releases a foul stench worldwide. People say that plants within 100 kilometers wither, and fish that smell it float to the surface and die. Despite the odor, it is considered the most delicious fruit globally, so its taste should not be judged solely by its smell. Kamatsu wonders how Toriko, with a nose 10 times more sensitive than normal, can remain so calm. Little does he know that Toriko is also trying to maintain the image of a professional gourmet hunter, while a chef like Kamatsu should understand him. Kamatsu mocks Toriko for enduring the strong smell. After they finish talking about the scent, both of them age several years in appearance. This journey is indeed filled with stench and hardship. Soon, it becomes dark, but they continue to move forward in this foul-smelling atmosphere. The smell becomes increasingly strong, and finally, they reach the bomb durian. The faces of the two men upon seeing the durian tree were truly comical. As the ripe durian was about to fall, their clothes instantly disintegrated due to its smell. Both of them stared blankly in the final moments, and never before has a journey to find food been this difficult. The stench permeates so strongly that even people far away can smell it, not to mention that Toriko and Kamatsu are right there. Sani, with an air of arrogance, took a step forward, smelled the odor, and immediately fainted. The two young men in this place lay unconscious, looking clueless. Toriko woke up, mumbled something nonsensical, and promptly fainted again. After a month of struggling, both of them conquered the foul smell of the durian. As they entered the restaurant, everyone ran away. Sani walked in and fainted immediately due to the stench. Kamatsu and Toriko were overjoyed, tears streaming down their faces because they no longer had that horrifying smell on them. The solution to neutralize the durian smell was to eat it. Even Terry, the loyal wolf, had to keep his distance from Toriko for quite some time due to the odor of the durian. Now, to make Feng Shui sushi, only one missing ingredient remains, which is seaweed according to Mr. Manchi. Toriko has no information about seaweed, but thanks to Terry, they can rely on its scent to determine. This is where Toriko used to live, and he has an old friend here. On the nearby mountain, a handsome man introduces himself as a member of the Gourmet Knights and apologizes for mistaking Toriko as an intruder. Takamaru also comes out to welcome Toriko, and Toriko notices that Takamaru has become more refined and mature through the challenging battles they have experienced. The leader of the Gourmet Knights is also Toriko's old close friend, Aimaru. Aimaru greets Toriko and Kamatsu. On the way to the Gourmet Knights residence, the members introduce themselves. Raimaru from the Blue Sky Group, Yukimaru from the same group, Kajimaru with a scarred face from the Hidden Lead Group, and Tsukimaru from the Milky Way Group. Toriko praises the group for being all handsome men, then goes to pat Yukimaru on the shoulder, feeling he is too thin. Aimaru scolds Toriko, stating that they have experience with proper eating habits. Both of them argue back and forth, exhausting each other. On the other side, Takemaru asks Kamatsu about the ingredient they are looking for today, which is Iko Nori, a type of seaweed. There is a nearby village called Iko Land where seaweed grows on the back of an electric turtle. Takemaru says that all the food in this place is pure, with a simple diet, and seaweed is the best. Toriko eavesdrops on the conversation and relies entirely on Takemaru. In the evening, Aimaru and Toriko talk about the old days, both having a common goal of obtaining the god ingredient. Aimaru has completed his entire menu, with mostly pure ingredients matching his restrained eating habits. Of course, God is the main dish he aims for. And Aimaru promises to share it with Toriko if he obtains it. The two argue back and forth throughout the night. The next morning, Takamara leads both of them to gather seaweed. He shares that the village uses everything from nature, no Wi-Fi, no phones, no gas, and no service personnel. Life is peaceful and quiet over the months and years. An old man in strange clothes throws bombs at rabbits for being disruptive, then scolds Kamatsu for daring to look at him. The village chief, Nanchi, reveals that he is Machi's twin brother and discloses that there are up to five people like them. Everything here is a gift from nature. In the evening, Nanchi leads the group to the turtle with seaweed, which provides electricity for the entire town. What Toriko needs is a thin layer on its back, and that is seaweed with a pure, sparkling scent. The recent bad weather has prevented the turtle from absorbing enough energy to supply electricity to the town. Therefore, Nanchi asks Toriko to help manually replenish energy. Toriko, with his strength, completes this physically demanding task. As soon as he finishes, he breathes heavily, and the villagers, along with a herd of energy turtles, come over to welcome Toriko. Working tirelessly from night to morning, Toriko has obtained tons of seaweed. They express their gratitude and then return to Manchi's sushi shop with many ingredients they have diligently searched for. As for the durian bomb, it needs to be placed in a bag because the fruit is so putrid that the smell can't be tolerated. Quickly, a makeshift arena is set up, and Manchi prepares the ritual and performs the cooking process by wrestling with the ingredients. This is Manchi's way of expressing gratitude and love for the ingredients, the more intense the struggle, the more he values the food. After three days and nights of wrestling in the arena, Manchi completes a gigantic feng shui sushi, which will guide Toriko and Kamatsu to the lost forest. 
The length of this sushi roll is supposed to reach thousands of meters, and its top has touched the ninth layer of clouds. At this point, the Feng Shui sushi starts shaking violently as if it's about to collapse. Indeed, right after that, the gigantic sushi roll falls to the ground, creating a powerful shockwave. The exact location where it fell is the path leading to the lost forest. Toriko just needs to eat the sushi roll, and he will reach his destination. The ingredients used to make the sushi are all top-notch, and Toriko eagerly indulges in the delicious meal. Although the sushi is delicious, the surrounding animals dare not approach because it still retains the scent of durian. Toriko continues to enjoy the meal slowly. After eating half of the sushi roll, Toriko sees the lost forest. It is the largest forest in the world, covering a total area of 30 million square kilometers. Toriko's goal is the bubble fruit, an ingredient that no gourmet hunter has ever found. At this moment, a ninja youth attempts to steal a piece of Toriko's sushi. After being discovered, he immediately runs away. Seeing this, Toriko quickly chases after the thief. While chasing the thief, Toriko unintentionally discovers a mysterious restaurant hidden in the forest, specializing in serving hard-to-find ingredients. However, when he reaches to open the door to enter, the restaurant suddenly disappears in front of the two, and a moment later, it reappears. A voice reminds them to bow and show respect before they can enter. It turns out that the owner of the restaurant is Chef Kairu, ranked 15th among the top 100 chefs. Kairu designed her restaurant deep in the lost forest to protect the ingredients from outsiders. The restaurant is constructed from invisible wood in the gourmet world. It disappears when it senses unfamiliar approaches to protect itself. But then Toriko discovers that the thief who stole his sushi is an employee of the restaurant. The thief explains that he only took a small piece because someone else had stolen the entire sushi roll before. However, Kairo still asks him to apologize to everyone. After entering, Toriko saw the guest who had previously helped him enter the restaurant, an old man with no hair wearing a red traditional costume. Since the person was busy eating, Toriko didn't want to disturb and ordered his food first. Chef Kairu personally brought a bottle of Eseku extracted from seaweed, but Toriko, not knowing how to drink it properly, accidentally made the wine fly away. It turns out that the cuisine of the restaurant is very unique, and each dish has a different way of eating. Even the smallest mistake can lead to failure. For example, this super small tomato dish will break if the customer uses too much force. Here is a bowl of glowing rice, and if not eaten quickly, the rice grains will transform and become inedible. So, the lunch for the two ended without being able to eat anything. Now they understand why this restaurant cannot thrive in crowded places. If customers come in, order food, and cannot eat it, the restaurant closes. However, the old man continues to enjoy the dishes. After finishing his meal, he introduces himself as Chin, Kairu's master, the owner of Shokurin Temple, and one of the gourmet living legends. Chin is a person with both power and money, with no hair, but he looks genuinely cool in Kamatsu's eyes. Kamatsu, knowing Chin's reputation, wants to become his disciple. Toriko asks Chin about information regarding the bubble fruit, and Chin laughs, calling the two to follow him. As they leave, Kairo thanks them for coming and invites them to return to enjoy more dishes next time. Chin asks Kairo about an old lady named Chio, and he learns that she hasn't returned. It's said that she is a top 5 chef. Chin promises to return to taste the dishes that Chio cooks next time. Chio, the first head chef of the disappearing cuisine restaurant, is also known as the genius Chio. Each of her knives is worth 100 million, and she has been recognized as a culinary genius equivalent to Setsuno, ranking fifth among the top chefs. Kamatsu recalls the upcoming cooking competition and wonders how his friend is doing now. Chin reveals that Chio disappeared without reason, and since then, chefs around the world have disappeared to an alarming extent. Chio used to be the head manager at Shokorin Temple and was Chin's traveling companion. After a while, Chin asks both of them to look down at their feet and sees a massive hole. Chin is the one who created this black hole and eats Toriko's sushi. Chin instructs them to observe the surroundings with sincere and respectful eyes because only then can they see where they want to go. Both bow sincerely, and a Shokorin temple appears in front of them. It turns out that you have to be sincere in whatever you do. Just as they were about to step up, various traps appeared inside the Shokorin temple, attacking Kamatsu and Toriko. Chin tells them to trust and respect because the wood used to make this temple is not ordinary, it not only turns invisible but also attacks those with disrespectful behavior. Inside the temple, the fire is spreading wildly due to the disrespectful attitudes of Toriko and Kamatsu. Toriko rushes to extinguish the fire, but as soon as it's done, the fire flares up again. Chin approaches, prays, and then conjures a giant spoon, putting the flame in his hand and extinguishing it. Without mastering the culinary rituals, touching the bubble fruit is almost impossible. The challenge outside was difficult, and inside, it's full of Kamatsu's cries of frustration.
Toriko use flying fork techniques to assist Komatsu, but the challenges continue. Rocks and wooden stakes continuously fall from the sky, and Toriko and Komatsu keep dodging. Shin says that when praying, the heart will be serene. Trust and putting faith in the essential principles of culinary rituals are the most crucial. Both seem to have understood something, sincerely pray, but suddenly, Toriko bursts into laughter, causing a large column to fall on his head, making him dizzy. Now both focus intensely and continue to move following Chin. In front of them, there are thousands of people like an army. Shin says that every year, about 100,000 people from young to old enter the temple to learn how to behave in cuisine. It is the strictest training place in the world. However, the people here are not guests but prisoners brought here. If they complete the tasks, they will be free, but most prisoners give up and escape. This young man is Shou, the manager of the temple, who comes to greet everyone. However, Chin introduces Toriko and Komatsu as Tom and Komi since he has a very poor memory for remembering other people's names. Toriko hopes to learn how to scoop fire like Chin, and she reveals that Chin's training is very rigorous. The 5,000-meter mountain swept the Toriko, Sani in the deadly waterfall, and it's the mountain Chin excavated from this place. Toriko admires the way this master conducts his training. Despite the cheerful atmosphere, if one accidentally dies, it would be unworthy of Chin's training program. The Fengshu Sushi disappears in the forest because Chin skillfully dug it up. The reality is sometimes too overwhelming. After learning about Chin's harsh training methods, Komatsu and Toriko follow Shu to begin their training. In front of them is the main Shokorin Temple. The culinary ritual training is divided into three levels, basic, intermediate, and advanced. This temple is where the final exam for the advanced level takes place. To obtain the precious bubble fruit, at least Toriko and Komatsu have to pass the advanced level, and the fruit bubble is somewhere in this magnificent garden. That's Toriko's plan, and unexpectedly, he thinks it's simple but turns out to be true. It is right under the lake in this splendid garden. Toriko touches it, and it immediately breaks. Shu believes that Toriko now resembles a predator stalking its prey. And Toriko regrets losing the opportunity to obtain the ingredient. After analyzing Toriko, Shu wants to challenge Toriko to a fight. Both enter the arena inside, and the rule is whoever says give up first will lose. While Komatsu complains from above, after this match, it will be Komatsu's turn. Toriko attacks head-on with immense power, but it doesn't hit. Continuous long-range attacks from Toriko, but she gracefully dodges them all, even avoiding the flying knives. Toriko doesn't underestimate his opponent anymore and seriously activates his killing intent, turning one hand into a knife and the other into a fork, unleashing a deadly technique. However, she still manages to evade. Toriko launches continuous close-range attacks, but Shu avoids them all effortlessly. Toriko believes that running away won't defeat him, but as he finishes speaking, Toriko's clothes are torn. It's Shu's skill called Knife Leaf. Although Toriko's strength seems to be superior and Shu doesn't appear powerful, what Shu possesses is something Toriko cannot grasp. The fight continues, Toriko uses his ultimate power, and the strength is terrifying, but Shu hasn't broken a sweat, teaching Toriko in the process. In an instant, Toriko shatters the entire arena. However, this technique is useless against Shu, and it is inaccurate. Shu believes that Toriko's strength is meaningless. And if Toriko can comprehend the culinary ritual, it can significantly improve his current situation. Finally, Toriko says give up, but they make an appointment for a rematch. The next match for Komatsu is a cooking competition in the kitchen, and the rule this time is simple, whoever finishes turning the cabbage into threads first wins. Komatsu is confident in his ability to complete it within a minute because his hand movements are quite fast. He takes out Milk's kitchen knife, and the match begins. Just as he finishes speaking, before Komatsu can cut half of the cabbage, Shu has already completed it with a normal knife. Komatsu looks at him in awe. Shu gives advice that, although Komatsu's approach and emotions towards the ingredient are excellent, there are still many unnecessary movements, and he needs to practice the culinary ritual. Toriko bows and begs Shu to cook a delicious meal so that he can appreciate Shu's skills. Toriko's wish is granted as Shu cooks, but eating like this might dislocate his hand. Eating beans with these 5 meter long chopsticks, eating each color separately, is like a torture chamber. At 3 am, Toriko and Komatsu were peacefully asleep when they were awakened. Shu handed them both martial arts uniforms, instructing them to put them on and meet him in the training hall. The exercise for the day was meditation, both had to keep their minds calm and clear of any distractions to focus on listening to the essence of ingredients. The candle in front of them was made from torch horsetail, and it would extinguish immediately if the inner thoughts of the two fluctuated. They had to ensure the flame continued to burn for 30 minutes to be considered successful. After finishing meditation, she led the two to breakfast, which consisted of rice among eggs dish, fragrant and delicious but as delicate as an eggshell. Toriko tried to use chopsticks to pick it up, but they all broke, so he had to begin the morning training session on an empty stomach. 
Today, Xu taught everyone the basic greeting posture of culinary rituals, emphasizing the importance of expressing sincere gratitude to the ingredients. Any slight mistake in their movements would trigger the cactus to shoot them like porcupines. Then, Xu gave each person a seed to plant, the seed of the rose ham flower. They had to tend to the plant until it bloomed before they could eat rice, or else they would remain hungry. The next day, the tree bloomed, and a butterfly bread flew over to form a meat-filled sandwich. In order to obtain the fruit bubble, Toriko had to undergo rigorous training at the Shokorin Temple. The people there were well-versed in culinary techniques, so they were very strong. Kamatsu believed that with diligent practice, the two of them would surely overcome everything. In the following days, both progressed rapidly. While it took an ordinary person a month to complete basic meditation, they only needed three days. To increase the difficulty, Shu decided to extend the candle's burning time to two hours. Breakfast was changed to super slippery eels, and even during the greeting posture practice, they had to balance a pudding cake on their heads. If they blinked, the cake would melt, signifying training failure. The exercise of picking beans with chopsticks was also upgraded from a pair of 5-meter chopsticks to a pair of 10-meter ones. While they were taking care of the rose ham flower and a butterfly bread flying in and nibbling on a piece, Toriko, angered, waved his hand to shoo it away, inadvertently triggering a devastating technique that destroyed an entire building. Shu explained that due to Toriko's heightened focus, his movements were becoming stronger and more precise, preventing energy wastage. This, he revealed, was the true power of culinary techniques. Not only Toriko but also Komatsu made significant progress. While previously it took him 20 minutes to remove toxins from a puffer whale, now he only needed 20 seconds, with the fish barely realizing the poison sac had been removed. There was even a tail of a fish being filleted to the bone but still living and swimming for years due to the chef's top-tier skills. The two progressed rapidly. They could now maintain 10 candles for 2 hours, easily pick up rice among eggs and slippery eels, and enjoy a delicious meal. Toriko could now effortlessly split a large rock with a gentle wave of his hand, while Komatsu could julienne vegetables thinner than hair. They completed the training much faster than Shu imagined. After hearing the news, Master Chin came to congratulate them but couldn't remember their names. After a brief moment, he named them Tom and Colin. Later, Master Chin took Toriko to a pond to try retrieving Bubbles' fruit. This time, when the bubble touched their hands, it didn't explode like before. However, Master Chin revealed a surprising truth, the fruit bubbles here were just fake, used for disciple training. Now, Master Chin will lead the two to find the real bubble fruit. However, before setting off, he senses something dark approaching from above the clouds. At this point, Master Chen leads the two into a bubble forest. The bubble fruit is an extremely timid ingredient, so only one of them will accompany him inside, and Toriko is chosen to pick the bubble fruit while Komatsu waits outside. Master Chen says that if Toriko can show extreme gratitude, he will obtain the bubble fruit and also learn the secret of food's end, a powerful technique that only a few can master. Then, Toriko begins to follow Master Chen into the bubble forest. They walk tirelessly on the endless path until their feet start to ache, yet nothing is in sight ahead. It's only then that Master Chin returns and tells him that the journey ahead is still long. Somewhere in the sky, a creature carrying the breath of darkness is approaching the Shokorin Temple. On this side, the journey continues. Toriko feels like he's been here for a week already. Master Chin reveals that Aimaru once obtained the bubble fruit. Not wanting to lose to his friend, Toriko is forced to push forward with all his might. Toriko wonders why Master Chin is still energetic after such a long walk. Master Chin explains that despite his small stature, he weighs over a ton. Through the technique food's end, he can store countless amounts of food inside his body to provide energy when needed. At this moment, the Shokorin temple suddenly disappears, as it has detected unknown intruders. Only an old lady's scream shatters the defensive state of the temple, revealing her identity as Chio, the fifth-ranked chef in the world, who mysteriously disappeared half a year ago. Accompanying her is a giant green-skinned monster and a young man dressed in white, surprising everyone as the young man turns out to be Otaki, Komatsu's old friend. They immediately begin to attack the disciples of the Shokorin Temple, causing many innocent people to be injured. Meanwhile, Toriko continues his journey to find the bubble fruit. The path ahead is still long, but Toriko is starving to the point where he can't take another step. The hunger overwhelms him, causing him to collapse and lose consciousness. In his haze, Toriko sees the shadows of his friends who fought alongside him in many battles. He feels his body becoming light. Could it be that he's truly dead? He hears the pounding of his heart, the voices of the ingredients once harmonized within his body, and he sends them sincere gratitude from the bottom of his heart. Suddenly, magic happens. Glittering fruit bubbles quickly appear and illuminate the forest, radiating warmth to all living creatures. Master Chin officially congratulates Toriko for successfully obtaining the bubble fruit. 
Toriko begins to eat one of the fruit bubbles, its sweet aroma instantly melting in his mouth. With each chew, its flavor intensifies. The bubble fruit becomes part of Toriko's body, and he masters food's end. The bubble fruit continuously supplies energy to every cell of Toriko's body. Shortly after, he rises with a body full of vitality. Sensing danger, Master Chin quickly returns to the temple. Elsewhere, without Master Chin's protection, his disciples must face a formidable enemy. Chio has joined the gourmet organization, and an elderly man wields a few staff moves to demonstrate his strength, only to be swiftly defeated by Chio. She wields a pair of sharp dual swords, capable not only of attack but also defense, making her the most formidable opponent. Meanwhile, Kamatsu is delighted to meet his old friend Otaki, who suddenly stabs him in the abdomen. Sho, on the other hand, is knocked away by the giant green golem due to its overwhelming strength. The situation is now extremely dire. As Master Chin rushes back at the fastest speed, Toriko sits eating fruit bubbles to store energy, his strength reaching new heights. As for Kamatsu, after being stabbed unexpectedly, he surprisingly doesn't bleed. It turns out that Otaki's weapon is a resurrection knife, a tool prohibited from use in the gourmet world. Otaki reveals that he has joined the gourmet organization and realizes that absolute power, not money or ingredients, is what controls this world. In the moment of deepest despair, Master Chin returns. Seeing his disciples defeated by Chio and the gourmet organization, he is filled with righteous anger. He releases a ton of energy reserves stored within his body to transform into a giant. Hearing their opponent is too powerful and the battle will affect those below, Master Chin and Chio take to the sky for a decisive showdown. With sufficient energy replenished, Toriko quickly appears with long, sleek blue hair even more luxurious than Sani's. Chio is terrified when Toriko masters food's end in a short time. Taking advantage of this, Master Chin uses two giant spoons to seal off space and trap her. Below, the green golem appears. Shu reveals it to be the scrum beast, a hybrid of hundreds of natural predators. Despite his long hair, Toriko doesn't rush into battle. He cuts his hair short to maintain his handsome appearance. Then, with a light flick of his hand, Toriko dismembers the entire right arm of the scrum beast, which regenerates only to be smashed by his 18 rapid and powerful punches, shattering its body. At this moment, the pair of spoons in the sky is opened, but the result is not as expected. Master Chin is defeated by Chio in the decisive battle. Seeing this, Toriko is enraged and wants to seek revenge, but Master Chin reminds him to stay calm, not to let emotions override reason. Before Master Chin can finish speaking, Chio launches her decisive move to end him. Sensing the danger posed by Chiyo's dual swords, Toriko realizes that a direct hit from them could be fatal. He immediately retreats, creating distance from his opponent. Toriko then unleashes knife leg technique, but Chiyo manages to block it with her dual swords. Seeing Chiyo rapidly closing in, Toriko is forced to use his fork armor to confront her sharp dual swords head-on. The clash of weapons results in a surprising outcome, Chiyo's dual swords shatter into pieces within moments. It turns out that the swords she wielded were fake, while the one she holds in her hand is her true weapon. At this moment, a gigantic creature suddenly appears in the sky. It's the Gourmet Corpse Tyrannical Shark. Atop which is a white and red trimmed GT robot. Toriko senses that this is the most powerful GT robot he has ever seen, and their enemies decide to retreat, boarding the Tyrannical Shark to return to their base. Before leaving, they challenge Toriko to a future duel in the Gourmet world. As the tyrannical shark disappears, Shu reveals that it is one of the most powerful beasts controlled by the Gourmet Corp, a formidable force under the Bishakukai's command. The GT robot said that the boss is very angry because Chio was injured while fighting against Master Chen and still insisted on fighting Toriko. Toriko also realized that the name controlling the new generation GT robot is Star June. Kamatsu, overwhelmed with emotions, recalls fond memories with Otaki. Toriko suspects that Otaki might have been injected with gourmet cells and instructs Kamatsu to wake him up as they are close friends. Kamatsu wondered why Chio joined the Bishakukai. Master Chin, lying exhausted on the other side, also said he would explain it clearly to everyone, but now he was very cold. Suddenly, a mysterious figure emerges, wielding two swords, none other than Kairu, the proprietor of Disappearing Cuisine. Seeing that Master Chin was severely injured, she decided to use the forbidden technique, the resurrection knife, gently performing minor surgery on his wounds. After a while of treatment, it was done. Toriko brought many fruit bubbles for Master Chin to eat for recovery, and his wounds healed immediately. Kairu explained that the resurrection knife is made from various species of animals with cell regeneration abilities, but her skills are limited to healing wounds. Kamatsu recalled that Otaki had also used this technique, and the rapid recovery of the wound left him with no sensation. Because Igo feared that this technique would disrupt the food chain, it was strictly prohibited. Despite its potency, it cannot resurrect the dead, as Master Chin revealed that attempting to revive the deceased was the reason Chio joined the Bishakukai. 
If the thin outer layer of the fruit bubble is peeled off, the flavor will be much better, which is Chiyo's favorite dish. During the battle with Master Chin, Chiyo also revealed something. She sought the eighth ingredient in Acacia's full course menu to resurrect her deceased son, and the one who told her was none other than Mid Aura. He told Chiyo that gratitude is meaningless in this world. Despite her son's death, Chiyo still harbors deep resentment, and she directs all her anger towards Master Chin. Acacia sealed seven ingredients in the full course menu, but the eighth ingredient is not something Acacia intended to keep hidden for himself. Surely, God is not the only ingredient that the Bishakokai is seeking. This information needs to be quickly relayed to IGO. In the gourmet world, at IGO's secret facility where ingredients are researched and processed, the zero TH biotope, Giman remains emotionless, indifferent to love's conversation. Yasaku and Milk the First are also present. Everyone enters the dining room, where 20 members, each possessing tremendous strength, have gathered, invited by the IGO chairman. They all sit down to eat together. The woman with pink hair is gourmet literary master Malisma, also known as the gourmet living legend. The elderly man is gourmet Sitai master Malaye, specializing in therapeutic massage and alignment. Next to him is ultimate pot artisan Kirebo, gourmet mountain bandit goblin Ramon, gourmet magician Manon. Tak, a warrior of the Garo tribe, assassin Megarodras, martial artist gourmet hunter Sakura, gourmet astronomer Rala, gourmet hermit Kasaru, and gourmet surgeon Adashino. Everyone discusses Master Chin's attack and the mysterious eighth ingredient that the Bishakukai is seeking. Today's main goal is to gather forces for God. Then, the IGO chairman asks gourmet astronomer Rala about shortening the gourmet sun's time, ensuring it will happen in about six months. Fighting the Bishakukai is inevitable, and if it happens, the IGO chairman hopes that the Zero TH biotope will remain unique. As the meeting concludes, everyone leaves. Rala informs the chairman about the four beasts awakening from their lone slumber. A task he still needs to complete. Ichirio probably thinks the four beasts' matter will be handled by his reliable disciples. In a month, the world chefs will gather again, and the Bishakukai will likely come to capture them. Kusero volunteers to be their protector. After the battle, Master Chin bid farewell to Toriko and Komatsu, the only disciples he remembered. Meanwhile, at the castle, Starjun also tasted the fruit bubble, and Midora was engrossed in eating passionately to enhance his strength. At that moment, Alfaro stood lost in thought when Su Shefu informed him that Boss Midora was still craving food and they needed to find even more delicious ingredients because the bubble fruit alone wasn't enough. Su Shefu revealed that he had been investigating Acacia's menu, and the key to that menu might be the Infinity Bee. The legend about the bee species that could help locate Acacia's ingredients that these bees usually appear in places with bright sunlight. Based on this folklore, Su Shefu speculated that it might be hiding in the human world. You would undertake this mission along with the GT robot. Toriko returned to Komatsu's restaurant and enjoyed the dishes that Komatsu prepared. Toriko was impressed by the new ingredients that Komatsu could cook with after their training session. Suddenly, gourmet treasure Sedano came to meet Toriko and Komatsu because she heard that the two of them had mastered culinary principles. So she wanted to see if it was true. Setuno highly praised Komatsu's dishes on the table because they were all made from difficult ingredients. However, she had an important task for Toriko and Komatsu, which was to find a particular ingredient. Both of them immediately accepted the task and went with Tom to the sea. The special wheat Setuno wanted to find was the type used to make phantom noodles, which included flavors from ramen, udon, spaghetti, and many others, attracting the appetites of thousands worldwide. Everyone was eager to taste it because in the gourmet world, the exquisite flavor of these noodles couldn't be overlooked. First, they had to find the golden wheat, which was part of Komatsu's training with Setuno. Komatsu felt a bit overwhelmed when he heard about the honorific food. He thought that although he handled the puffer whale fish easily, he still hadn't reached the level of capturing the bubble fruit, feeling inferior to Kairu. Setuno mentioned that the golden wheat was in this sea area, but as they didn't know exactly where, Toriko asked the nearby fisherman, who directed them to a glowing island. The entire group ascended to the dazzlingly bright island, rendering them unable to see anything due to the blinding light. At that moment, Toriko suddenly snatched Tom's glasses and casually harvested the golden wheat. While they were harvested, Toriko stopped and told Tom and Komatsu to run because right in front of them was the GT robot. Toriko wanted to ask about the robot's purpose, but Chef Yu, the robot's controller, attacked Toriko. Yu's main goal was to wait for the sunlight to rise high to catch the infinite bee, but his temper was a bit hot, so he attacked Toriko upon seeing him. Meanwhile, Komatsu was busy picking up the fallen strands of golden wheat. Surprisingly, Yu immediately leaped to attack head-on, then vanished. This GT robot was equipped with biological camouflage to blend into its surroundings, only revealing itself behind Toriko to deliver a powerful punch. Jojo at the castle praised Yu as the most outstanding controller of the GT robot in the Bishakokai. 
Toriko hurled his fork straight at the GT robot. But you asserted that even though it couldn't dodge in time, the GT robot wouldn't be affected at all because its armor was made of a new alloy, a combination of titan and the hardest material in the gourmet world, the shell of the clam. Despite Yu's claims, Toriko continued to attack relentlessly, proving theory and reality don't always align. You vanished again, but Toriko used his heightened senses to strike you. Unable to withstand Toriko's attacks, you attempted to use psychological tactics to distract Toriko, but Toriko not only grew stronger but also more determined. You signaled Jojo and intended to use the stored power of the GT robot. The robot's eyes glowed, but Toriko declared he would destroy the robot to protect the ingredient. You revealed that the machine was specially designed to move freely in any harsh environment. On the other side, Kamatsu had gathered enough golden wheat. You rushed forward to kick but was blocked by Toriko, who retaliated, sending you flying. You persisted with another kick but was effortlessly thrown aside by Toriko as if they were just playing around. Toriko remarked that he hadn't fully exerted himself yet, mindful that the golden wheat material could be damaged. Despite Yu's reluctance to retreat in disgrace, he charged forward to punch Toriko directly, then disappeared stealthily. You rushed towards Kamatsu's rear to capture the Infinity Bee, only to be drawn in by the golden wheat. It was acknowledged that Kamatsu indeed had a lucky culinary touch, attracting both the Century Soup and the Infinity Bee. After seizing the Infinity Bee, you vanished as the GT robot had reached its limit. Both of them were sure that Setsuno knew Bishikokai would come there, but when they arrived at the restaurant, it wasn't the case. It was all because Setsuno was busy with something else. Setsuno requested Kamatsu to come down to the kitchen, and Kamatsu himself would cook Setsuno's noodle dish. Toriko assured him to be confident since he had just gone through a more challenging training session. Setsuno would guide Kamatsu on how to prepare the dish and instructed him to listen to the voice of the ingredients. Kamatsu took out his kitchen knife, swiftly removing unnecessary parts in a blink of an eye, handling everything very naturally. Setsuno handed Kamatsu a bottle of Air 777, an ingredient, and told him to use it naturally since she had plenty of it. Toriko feared it would expand, but to their surprise, the golden wheat absorbed all 100 liters of water. Golden wheat was an extraordinary ingredient, when needed, it could produce sounds similar to human voices. It was Kamatsu's first time making the golden wheat emit sounds, which pleased Setsuno greatly. As Kamatsu needed, punched, the sounds of the golden wheat became clearer, sometimes even sounding like, subscribe, subscribe. After kneading the dough all day, the golden wheat flour was finally ready. Setsuno felt very satisfied with its hardness and glossiness, similar to a baby's cheek. Today, phantom noodles would be sold again. And the live broadcast's host today was none other than Tina. It had been a while since they had seen this lovely reporter, and surely everyone remembered her well. Before the noodles appeared, Rin had already arrived, embracing Toriko. Kamatsu would be the one selling instead of Setsuno today. Phantom noodles could transform into various types of noodles depending on the cooking method. After some cutting and boiling, udon noodles were ready, and if the dough was cut thin and boiled with century soup, it would become century ramen. The two girls ate the noodles, their faces turning silly with delight. Toriko was no exception, enjoying the noodles with a blissful expression. Tom also arrived to indulge in the feast. And Kamatsu gifted him a bowl of noodles shining brightly like sunlight. Kamatsu continued to create another dish, a special yakisoba stir-fry to treat the early arriving guests, along with soy sauce ramen and bamboo slide noodles, nagashi somen. As the days passed, the guests became more and more crowded, bustling about. In no time, the evening sky had settled in, and Toriko's belly felt as if it contained a ton of food. Tina felt disappointed for arriving early and not being able to eat much. Setsuno believed that meeting those top chefs had made Kamatsu mature a lot. The experiences and lessons had taught Kamatsu valuable lessons. All he had been through were the most precious lessons. Setsuno's words sounded like poetry, like literature, captivating to listen to. At that moment, Coco walked on a grass field, scaring away a frightened scorpion, while Sunny calmly sat eating mush roses among the crowd. All three of them were still training to prepare for the battle before the gourmet four beasts awakened. Setsuno informed Tepe that all four heavenly kings had now learned all the culinary secrets. At the Bishikokai castle, you had brought back the infinity bee. Tepe felt concerned because he had recently sensed a dangerous smell without knowing the cause. In the gourmet city, where the atmosphere is unusually quiet, at the king's gourmet restaurant on the 330th floor, one of the symbols of the gourmet tower, the four heavenly kings are gathering for a meal. Suddenly, on the television, Tina delivers an urgent message from IGO advising people to follow IGO staff instructions to find immediate shelter. Meanwhile, Terry is carrying Kamatsu along with luggage. Coco and Sunny are boasting to each other about their aristocratic eating habits, while Toriko and Zebra need no introduction. Kamatsu has also arrived to pick up Rin. 
While dining, Sunny mentions that in life, one cannot predict what will happen, so it's essential to eat what you like and marry the one you love. Coco, on the other hand, believes in saving the best for last, thinking that things will taste better if eaten later. Toriko immediately states that as long as you enjoy what you're eating, any dish will suffice, while Zebra prefers actions over words, wishing the dishes in front of him would turn into his favorites. During the past week, Kamatsu and Kairu at the disappeared restaurant learned how to cook bubble fruit. Today, he will bring it to the four heavenly kings to enjoy. Rin boasted about a monster-level measuring device with a level over 100, which made Kamatsu worry for the four heavenly kings. Today, the group sits down to discuss their final training ingredients, all of which are sleeping beasts in the gourmet worlds. Four Beasts Outside, people are seeking refuge due to IGO's warning of an impending storm, alongside a notice that the four beasts will destroy two gourmet world areas and advance toward the human world. 30 billion people are taking shelter at the center of the human world, the television program here concludes as everyone evacuates to Food Plaza Park. Mr. Masan said to the IGO business director that perhaps the favorite food of the four beasts is humans, so they have come a long way here. Humans will not lose because President Ichiryu will defeat them, but now the president is in the zero th biotope, so hopefully, trust will be placed in the four heavenly kings. While the world worries, Toriko and Zebra continue to fight over a steamed bun. Koko and Sani remain calm, considering it an everyday occurrence. Head chef Yuda brings the food to the group and is pleased to see the four heavenly kings not tense despite facing the four beasts, so he offers them all the top dishes. Yuda has evacuated all his staff. Toriko admires his courage in not evacuating like others. As Toriko speaks, Zebra devours all of Yuda's cooked dishes. Rin and Kamatsu bring the bubbles fruit they prepared for everyone to enjoy. Kamatsu is so impressed with the top chef that he asks for his autograph. Everyone sits down and enjoys the bubbles fruit. After being cooked, the intensely sweet tastes like melted pudding on the tongue. Just as Master Chin mentioned. Taking just one bite, the gourmet cell of the four heavenly kings grows significantly. Rin also has an important task here, which is the chairman giving her a video message to request. The four heavenly kings open the video, and the chairman instructs them on how to defeat the four beasts. They divide into four directions, east, west, south, and north, advancing into the human world. Humanity is hiding at the center, 1,000 square kilometers away from them. To fight, they need to divide into four directions to swiftly defeat the four beasts and prevent them from entering the restricted area. If they manage to enter the restricted area, it will be the end for humanity. After finishing their meal, the four heavenly kings called their pets to prepare for battle. Zebra's pet is a gigantic Daruma horse, its level unknown, borrowed from a hermit. Meanwhile, volcanic eruptions signal the awakening of the gourmet four beasts after hundreds of years of deep sleep, and the four heavenly kings have divided themselves into four directions to stop their return. All the armies are immediately mobilized, and on the screen, there are many scenes of desolation, where the gourmet four beasts have passed, all life is destroyed. On the human side, there are over 100 tanks, missile-equipped aircraft, and the most modern naval warships. However, when facing the gourmet four beasts, the entire fleet was wiped out in just 10 minutes. They truly are machines of destruction bringing catastrophe to the human world. At the moment when humanity feels most desperate, the four heavenly kings have appeared at four different battlefronts. Toriko and Battle Wolf Terry's opponent is Fong King, level 100. Rin and Kamatsu also follow to observe. To be cautious, they maintain a distance of 5 kilometers and use smoke to mask their sense so Fong King cannot detect them. Fong King immediately strikes, but Terry manages to dodge. Despite being far away, the impact is strong enough to blow Rin and Kamatsu away. Taking advantage of Battle Wolf's extreme speed, Toriko approaches Fong King and delivers 30 consecutive blows to its abdomen. He also wore a scanning device on his hand, which is designed to measure the level of the opponent. It is made from the tongue of a flower-eating tiger. Toriko used this device to scan Fong King and assess its danger level. The reading displayed on the device is 127. Sunny's King Octopus Kong is 132, Zebra's Mount Turtle is 130, and Coco's Invade Death is 140. Among them, Invade Death is the creature with the most antibodies in the Gourmet Four Beasts, so it is not afraid of Coco's poison. Coco is greatly suppressed by Invade Death. Moreover, Invade Death's shell is extremely tough, and even Coco's poison sword cannot harm it. Sunny's opponent, King Octopus Kong, is both strong and resilient, possessing infinite endurance, a quality in which Sunny is vastly inferior. Mount Turtle possesses fiery breath that incinerates everything, and when facing Zebra's destructive sound waves, it is equally matched. At this moment, all of humanity is watching the battle on the screen, the confrontation between the four heavenly kings and the gourmet four beasts. Fong King continuously absorbs Toriko's attacks, becoming more ferocious with each strike. 
King Octopus Kong on this site is also formidable, growing numerous suction cups. Despite Sonny's attempt to restrain it, it throws him far away. Mount Turtle, on the other hand, unleashes increasingly powerful shots, catching Zebra off guard. Invade Death enlarges its head and fires a barrage of toxic projectiles at Coco and Kiss. It bombards the sky with so many poisonous bullets that both Kiss and Coco are hit and fall. The situation worsens, causing the people to fall silent in worry. Some even collapse, but Tina still believes in the four heavenly kings. Fong King's attacks are blocked by Toriko. While Zebra remains unaffected, these blows do nothing to him. Sunny worries about his hair being damaged in the battle with the ugly octopus. Although Invade Death is formidable, Coco is a master of toxins. When the four heavenly kings are seen unharmed, the people cheer up again. The emotional changes happen too quickly. Rin opens her laptop to review Chairman Igo's messages, as Zebra did not listen earlier. Invade Death now pumps poison directly into the ground to shoot it into the sky, covering a vast area. Coco puts on armor to confront Invade Death because he is not afraid of poison. Queen restrains the octopus's legs, Sonny uses his super long and smooth hair to attack, and Zebra uses the sound bazooka to blow away Mount Turtle. In the sky, a shower of shooting stars falls directly on Invade Death. Toriko asks Fong King a few questions and will let it know what the principles of gourmet food are and why this anime is called Toriko. Chairman Igo reveals the truth, there are not four true beasts, only one. The true beast sent these four into the human world. In other words, they are the limbs of the true beast. But more importantly, someone is controlling these four beasts in the shadows. The people now cheer for the four heavenly kings. Tepe looks at the monitor but senses something underground. Fong King roars angrily. Toriko tells Terry to stay aside while he fights Fong King alone. Toriko rushes forward with a flying sword technique. But Fong King, with its fast speed, evades. Toriko then concentrates his strength, creating thousands of forks and gathering them into one giant fork, which he thrusts forward. In the sky, Fong King, unable to evade in time, is knocked down. Coco has now created a bow of arrogance and fights Invade Death with toxins. He shoots toxic arrows into its body, creating a new toxin called the Virus Toxin, which breaks down the antibodies of creatures with many antibodies like this one. Coco's hand creates a poisonous spear, and he throws it straight at Invade Death, making it stand still. Sonny believes that the octopus's many tentacles cannot compare to his beautiful hair. He uses his hair strands to tightly bind the octopus, then employs his devilish hair to practice boxing. Finally, he delivers a devastating blow that the octopus cannot defend against, sending it flying sideways for meters. Zebra then says Mount Turtle is just a slow, small turtle. He rushes forward and delivers a sonic punch to the turtle's face. Putting this turtle in a pot to stew with vegetables would make a fantastic soup. That way, Zebra could eat 10 of them in one go without any problem. Zebra then determined to defeat this turtle to have a delicious meal. Rin then relayed the message to the four heavenly kings and said that there is only one beast, which is the final message from Chairman Igo. The four beasts then jumped up and burrowed underground. Zebra immediately used sound waves to search for them and found that they were fleeing, so he rode his horse to chase after them. The leader of the four beasts, its roots, had grown strong underground and formed large creatures over many centuries. In the past, President Ichiryu alone would handle it, but now he hopes the four heavenly kings will unite to defeat it. At this moment, the monster is changing its plan to enter the center of the human world. People in the evacuation area are ecstatic about the four heavenly kings' absolute victory, but after observing the TV screen, they notice something abnormal. Underneath the submarine, something suddenly appears and blocks it. They are roots creeping all over underground. Terry is accelerating to take everyone to where the monster is hiding, Coco uses electric waves, Sunny uses connection abilities, and Zebra and his horse are following their own sound waves. In the city, the tree roots have emerged from the ground and are attacking central buildings. The city is deserted, and the monster freely destroys the buildings in delight. After wreaking havoc for a while, the monster emerges from the ground, revealing its true form. In the gourmet city, the people are stunned by its appearance. It continues to ravage the city as if nothing happened. Terry, Toriko, and Komatsu are rushing at full speed to reach the monster. People in the city are evacuating in panic. Mr. Zong appears out of nowhere and stops Tina, asking why they are panicking like this. He's really clueless, the situation is critical, people are running away, and he's here asking questions. The monster destroys all the skyscrapers and grows more tentacles to capture the remaining people. It senses the aura of the four heavenly kings behind it. Tepe below uses trees to protect the collapsing buildings. Below ground, the four beasts gathered with their master, who absorbed all the nutrients from them. The four heavenly kings, observing from a distance, noticed that after being satiated, the monster became even larger and more powerful, spewing a kind of foam into the sky, creating a green rain. Coco described it as a cursed rain, stating that if humans were hit by this toxin, they would die within an hour. Therefore, Coco urged everyone to go to Yuda's gourmet tower to bathe immediately, as he had detoxifying food. Yuda, observing from afar, also noticed the dire situation. 
At that moment, Komatsu and Daruma Horse were tasked with retrieving the antidote. The four heavenly kings assembled a battle plan to defeat this monstrous green creature. On the other hand, Mr. Zong still thought it was a film trick, while Tepe continued repairing the collapsed buildings. Toriko couldn't detect any scent emitted by the monster, Zebra heard its normal breathing and heartbeat, Koko observed that its electric waves were not chaotic, and there was no sign of imminent death on its body. Sani, unimpressed, criticized the ugly monster. Before everyone could prepare, Zebra ran to inform them. Koko acknowledged his actions, recognizing the need to send a message to millions of people in the area. Zebra's threatening messages were indeed effective. Then Zebra used thunder sound, followed by a thunderous punch on the monster. Komatsu reached Yuda, who hesitated to provide the antidote, saying it was impossible at the moment. On the other side, Zebra was punched far away by the green-skinned monster, infuriating him. Kiss disrupted its vision with its fur, while Koko covered himself with poison armor, but their attacks were futile. Yuda could produce the antidote, but providing it for 100 million people at this moment was impossible. Even at the fastest pace, only 100,000 people could be helped. Queen tied its legs, Sunny used his hair demon to strike, but the punch transmitted through the creature's body and struck Queen, leaving Sunny unable to move and falling down. Toriko below used continuous punches, but the resilient monster remained unaffected. Rin measured its power level to be 320. Yuda needed skilled individuals, and Setsuno and her apprentice Nono arrived. Is the top-ranked cooking server high enough for Yuda? Now the level of the monster has not stopped at 320 but has risen to 350. Seeing the national treasures arrive, Mr. Yuda was delighted, but he believed that several more chefs were still needed. The head chef of the Disappear restaurant, Kairu, had also arrived, along with the top underground world chef, Livebearer. The top 4 Damala Sky 13 from Damala's Curry Restaurant, Lulubu, the head chef and owner of the 7-star traditional Japanese restaurant, Zarara Mama, ranked 31st as the head chef of Snack Bar and Sumire. The cafeteria manager at Nakam Gourmet School, all came. All the world's top chefs had gathered. The person inviting them was Johannes from Igo, a cool and dangerous guy with black glasses. Outside, the four heavenly kings had been knocked down in all directions, Rin saw the situation was not good, so he sprayed smoke to conceal everyone. Toriko advised Rin to stay away from this place because normal people would dissolve due to this green rain. Tepe summoned plants to help them cover from the rain and temporarily escape the monster's sight. Tepe revealed that the toxicity of this rain was very strong, and the longer it lasted, the weaker the four heavenly kings would become. He discovered that Rin's mist could weaken the curse rain's density. Tepe told her to stand in a high place and spray mist to reduce the toxicity in the rainwater. After Rin left, Tepe revealed to everyone his suspicion that someone had secretly incited the four beasts to rise and destroy the world. Inside the top restaurant, Yuda revealed that the antidote was machi, a traditional Japanese rice cake made from glutinous rice. Based on the principle of opposing colors, the machi had to be purple to neutralize the toxicity of the green rain. However, with limited time, everyone feared they couldn't make enough antidote for 100 million people. Moreover, machi had to be made from special ingredients. Meaning any slight mistake in the preparation would ruin it, something only world-class chefs could handle. Even if everyone tried their best, they could only save a maximum of 50 million people. At this point, when the rain began to show signs of stopping, Rin was on the roof of a high-rise building using mist spraying devices to limit the rain. On the other hand, the monster was too powerful, even though the four heavenly kings continuously attacked it, it could still knock everyone down one by one. On this side, after hearing that only 50 million people could be saved, Komatsu asked everyone for a chance. He was determined to find the simplest way to make a purple machi even an ordinary chef could do. Livebearer also called his friend Tylan, the 19th ranked chef in the world, whom nobody understands about poison as he does. After thorough discussion, the chefs decided to give Komatsu 10 minutes to come up with the simplest way to make purple machi. They provided Komatsu with a quiet space to be creative. In the kitchen, Komatsu was dealing with the most critical ingredient for making the purple machi, which was the color-changing glutinous rice. He had to mix different colored rice to balance them and achieve a perfect purple color. Any minor mistake could lead to the rice losing its color and the experiment failing. Meanwhile, the city residents received a message from the Igo organization. Thailand revealed the truth about the curse rain, those touched by the rain would ascend to heaven within an hour. At first, Zong was clueless and didn't believe it, but after hearing that Thailand was an expert in cooking poisonous dishes, Zong and his gang became serious and concerned. Thailand instructed everyone on acupressure methods to slow down the toxin's development in the body and prolong life. Three minutes had passed for Komatsu, and as he remained silent, people outside grew worried. Kairu, who had witnessed Komatsu's cooking technique and learning ability, believed Komatsu would not disappoint. Facing difficult circumstances, he would progress quickly. Outside, the four heavenly kings continued to be pummeled by the monster. If they weren't all powerful hunters, they would have been defeated long ago. At this moment, Komatsu had only one minute left. 
Everyone thought he had failed, so they prepared to follow the initial plan. However, Komatsu emerged with a bag of purple machi in hand, proving himself. Everyone in the room quickly summoned the chefs, all of whom had to obey Komatsu's orders. The Igo organization gathered all the chefs worldwide, totaling over a hundred thousand, in a short time. Now everyone was working together to save the world. Komatsu then instructed everyone on how to make purple machi. First, they had to soak the color-changing rice in water and salt. After soaking, the rice was steamed for 30 seconds. Then ground into flour after steaming. A little sesame oil was added, and finally, the mixture was kneaded into round shapes, resulting in deliciously soft machi. Komatsu took only three minutes to make this machi. Actually, the sesame oil wasn't necessary, but it enhanced the flavor of the machi, making the antidote taste better. Everyone was horrified to find the four heavenly kings incapacitated, with zebra barely able to breathe. The poison from the green rain had weakened them immensely. Suddenly, Toriko remembered Godfather saying that when the four beasts were heavily injured, their meat would taste as delicious as the finest fruits and vegetables. It turned out the meat of this monster was indeed delicious. Everyone tried their best to defeat it and then cook it. The monster, hearing this, unleashed a wave of destruction energy toward everyone, but Zebra protected them with his sound armor. When the monster attempted another attack, Terry kicked into its mouth. The pet force was tasked with dealing with the monster to buy time, while the four heavenly kings prepared to perform a technique Godfather had taught them. The condition for using this technique was for the four of them to reach an extreme hunger state. If successful, they would generate a special energy of the top predator in the gourmet food chain. On this side, the monster had its one arm and one leg broken by Queen, but quickly behind its back. Hundreds of giant tentacles regenerated. The monster used these tentacles to grab Terry and threw him to the ground, brutally beating him, causing Terry severe injuries. Coco's Emperor Crow and Sonny's Queen were also quickly defeated by the monster, losing their ability to fight. Suddenly, something unexpectedly started shining, it turned out that the four heavenly kings had successfully created gourmet energy. The monster immediately rushed forward, but the scenery around suddenly changed. The monster found itself on the dining table of the four hungry demon kings, and in gourmet culture, delicious food should be shared. The gourmet energy had awakened, turning into a mouth and entering the body of the monster. Starting to bite and swallow everything inside it. When it was full, it emerged outside again, even devouring the newly grown arm of the monster. The four heavenly kings stood watching with great joy. Gourmet beasts were just food for gourmet energy. Inside the body of the monster, everything was about to be eaten up. Despite all its efforts, it couldn't escape. As the mouth kept eating, the monster quickly shrank until it was tiny. When the sun shone through the clouds, only two small orange pieces of meat remained, and the monster had been defeated. Elsewhere, Tepe discovered a mysterious figure in a black cloak, suspecting him to be the mastermind behind the awakening of the four beasts. Luckily, the four heavenly king's pets were only slightly injured and quickly recovered. Komatsu then brought purple machi to everyone to neutralize the poison in their bodies. The machi was soft and chewy, and the antidote was delicious. At that moment, the meat in the sky suddenly exploded, it turned out that those who had been eaten by the four beasts were still alive. They quickly reunited with their families. The remaining meat fell down, emitting a tantalizing aroma. Zebra seized the opportunity to eat a big piece, making Sunny furious. The remaining meat was quickly transported to the chefs to prepare food for everyone to enjoy. There were fried rice, curry, hamburgers, beef steak, gourmet grilled meat, and many other dishes served to everyone. The four kings also sat down to eat enthusiastically. Zebra even called for more delicious dishes to be brought up. Finally, humanity was saved, and everyone enjoyed a satisfying meal of gourmet meat. In the four kings' assembly, there were still two people eating, so Komatsu had to stay behind to serve Toriko and Zebra. Tepe, in a daze, encountered a nightmare and gasped for breath as he woke up on a recovery bed. He was in the laboratory of a four-armed girl named Pukin, with the Saisiya Medical Town having rescued Tepe. Pukin provided Tepe with hazelnuts, butter, and calorie-rich bananas, all foods meant for recovery. Later, Pukin informed Tepe that the mystery person who scared him was her master, Mohayan Sheishai, a Saisiya possessing the world's strongest technique, also one of the gourmet national treasures like Ms. Setsuno. Therefore, it was possible that he was the one who revived the four beasts. After talking with Tepe for a while, Pukin noticed that Tepe's scar was getting bigger. In the gourmet city, people were still eating and discussing the group's victory. Zebra was still not full and kept demanding more food from Komatsu. There was an abundance of food on the table, and Zebra's greed knew no bounds. Yuda and Setsuno praised Komatsu's cooking skills, noting that besides hearing the voice of ingredients, what made Komatsu outstanding was his affection for them. Setsuno wanted to introduce him to the G7, but Yuda believed Komatsu was already among the top-ranked chefs. 
While they were enjoying themselves, Toriko pondered about the words of the GT robot, promising to meet him at the cooking festival. While accompanying everyone to find the ingredients assigned by Chiryu, Toriko felt his strength increase significantly with each battle. Everyone looked up at the endless starry sky and thanked Kamatsu wholeheartedly. In the gourmet world at Snow Mountain Hill, Igeo's president learned of the defeat of the four beasts by the four heavenly kings, but the real enemy had not yet revealed himself. In the president's hand was a unique kitchen knife made by Milk I, emitting a dangerous golden light. However, the Igo president stated that he would only use this knife to make salad, seemingly making light of the situation. Toriko and Terry went off to train again, when suddenly a monster appeared, the guardian of the mountain Toriko was training on. Luckily, its meat was delicious, so Toriko had to focus his strength, using a powerful punch to send it flying thousands of miles and shattering the mountain. Its meat was as tasty as Wagyu beef but incredibly tough. Toriko looked at Terry and recalled the time with Rin, where she tried to measure Terry's level with her device but got an error. It couldn't be determined because the maximum level the device could measure was level 999. Indeed, Toriko's beloved pet had to be that strong to be worthy. Johannes arrived with luggage to Toriko's location and handed him a message from IGO. They wanted the four heavenly kings to provide some ingredients for the cooking festival, which was to be held on Cooking Island, where all the chefs would gather. On this day, billions of people were expected to attend, and the event would be broadcast live worldwide. Due to the four beasts invasion, the ingredients prepared for the festival were lacking. Eight botanical gardens were severely damaged and unable to supply the ingredients. The ecosystem was also severely disrupted, and the ingredients IGO requested from Toriko were creatures from the gourmet world. In IGO's hotel, Kamatsu had become world famous for making detoxifying machi. The manager now looked at Kamatsu with great satisfaction and thanked him. Thanks to him, the restaurant's business was thriving, and the manager worried that someone might kidnap Kamatsu. Just as he finished speaking, Toriko appeared. Outside the G7 members' hall, Kit and Pinomi. They came to inform Kamatsu that he had made it to the top 88 of the world chef rankings and was eligible to participate in the cooking festival. Toriko and Kamatsu set out to find new ingredients for the festival. This was the first place they came to catch Galala crocodiles, but this time, the area was much more dangerous as it was filled with gourmet world creatures. Kamatsu felt worried about whether he could perform well at the cooking festival. Although his cooking skills were improving, he still lacked confidence. While pondering, Toriko was suddenly attacked, prompting him to retaliate with a flying knife. It turned out to be Takamaro and Aimaro greeting them. Both revealed they were helping clean up the remnants of seeds scattered by the four beasts. Now, they would accompany Toriko and Kamatsu. Kamatsu felt that the place was quite peaceful, mainly because all the creatures in the area had been eaten by the four beasts. Kamatsu was curious about the seeds scattered by the four beasts. Aimaro then asked Kamatsu if he knew about thorny fruits. These fruits had sharp thorns that stuck to animal fur, germinating when embedded. The four beasts brought many here, and although Toriko knew, he kept quiet, thinking they could resolve it easily. Apart from their duty to nature, Aimaro and Takamaro came because they heard the four heavenly kings were searching for festival ingredients, and Takamaro wanted to accompany Toriko. Sani and Queen arrived at the Death Falls. Due to the four beasts attack, the mountains here were destroyed, preventing them from obtaining fish oil. Sani couldn't push back the waterfalls before but now, he had changed, becoming even more handsome and stronger. Sani sensed someone had been following him for a while. It was the fried food chef, Oil King Wabutora, also known as the culinary genius oil. He came here for fish oil, known for its flavor and popularity. Sani offered to explore together. Meanwhile, Coco dressed up and went to the casino where he met Match. Coco was tasked with finding ingredients at the casino, but Match refused to cooperate with IGO, so there was no obligation to supply food for the festival. Knowing this, Coco came to gamble and bet on food. The Toriko gang continued steadily but hadn't encountered anything strange yet. Toriko smelled the scent of metanol, a chemical used to enhance the sweetness of fruits, which was currently underground. Just as they finished speaking, flesh-eating flowers emerged from the ground, and they were creatures from the gourmet world, not just one but three. Toriko tried to block them with four more, but they easily pierced through and attacked Kamatsu. Toriko used his flying knife to chop them down, while Takamaro also attacked, but the flowers didn't die, instead, more of them appeared. This is why they were dubbed gourmet demons. After Toriko cut down one, roots emerged from the ground. Aimaro believed they had to destroy them at the root, otherwise, they would regrow and attack again. Toriko decided to confront them alone and entrusted Kamatsu's safety to Takamaro and Aimaru. Toriko unleashed 50 nail punches, creating a fierce shockwave. Aimaru and Takamaru observed how much Toriko had changed over time. 
Sonny was quite surprised when Wabutora walked on water because his body was coated in oil, making him wonder why he couldn't detect how to find oil here. Afterward, Sonny taunted Wabutora, making him quite annoyed and wanting to have a fight with Sonny. Coco and Match went to the casino. Coco inquired about King Jida, and Match recounted that he and Chef Joe had disappeared. Coco suspected that the mastermind behind everything was the Bisha Kukai and then rolled the dice. Zebra returned to the pyramid in the gourmet desert and met his old friend, the Sphinx. The root of the plant creature had appeared in its original form. Called Mon Plant. It contained chestnuts because it smelled of methanol and furanol. It shot sharp thorns, but Toriko's flying knife didn't affect it. Toriko found it very strange, but the stranger it was, the more delicious it could be. Toriko displayed his knife skills, and although the plant creature dodged, the knife struck its head, shattering its protective shell. Toriko delivered another blow to its mouth, but the plant's ability to regenerate was formidable. Meanwhile, the Oil King opened a bottle of super spicy chili sauce and swallowed it all in one breath, making Sonny feel a sore throat just by looking at him. He began to excrete oily substances, intending to pass through the swift-flowing waters of Death Falls. Back in the gourmet casino, Coco decided the outcome of a red-black game to determine victory or defeat and gather rare ingredients here. Zebra gently advised the Sphinx to crying quickly to avoid his anger. Back to the battle between Toriko and the monstrous plant, Toriko innovatively created a new technique infused with the destructive power of 50 spikes, delivering a devastating punch that shattered the creature's body, ultimately succeeding in defeating the target. He decided to name this technique the supersonic spike shot. Regarding the Oil King's oil, it could only block the rushing water but not the falling rocks, which led to Sani's dissatisfaction and many complaints. After Toriko defeated the monstrous plant, Komatsu used the ingredients from its body to make food for everyone. The flavor was incredibly delicious, but Toriko, being a bit gluttonous, ended up eating the entire portion of ingredients that was supposed to be brought back to the IGO organization. At this moment, the appearance of an old man made Komatsu extremely nervous, and it turned out his identity was Zaz the King of Cooking, the top-ranked chef. Zaz had won the cooking festival championship a whopping 14 times, and even a touch of his hand was enough to turn the super-tough outer shell of the monstrous plant into dust. Upon receiving news of the upcoming cooking festival, all chefs from around the world had gathered on the famous culinary island to take on the challenge. In a certain vehicle, Toriko was happily enjoying his meal, while Komatsu appeared worried because he had decided to register for this competition. His opponents were all top-tier chefs, and Komatsu mainly joined to get their autographs rather than out of confidence. The vehicle quickly brought the two to the location of the cooking festival, a highly renowned holy ground for chefs. As soon as Toriko stepped out of the luxury car, everyone there hunted him down like Korean idols. Sonny found this creepy and created an invisible shield to protect himself from the fanatical fans. Coco simply warned not to touch him if they didn't want to be logged out, while Zebra, with his fierce face, scared people off just by being seen. Finally, Komatsu was warmly welcomed by everyone for discovering the simplified way to make Machi, saving the world. Soon after, some familiar faces like the Live Bearer and Setsuno also appeared, followed shortly by the IGO's black suit guards. They were here to ensure everyone's safety from something Toriko was also aware of. Reporter Tina quickly reported that many people had gathered at the cooking stadium, with a capacity of over 100 million. Outside the stadium, over 3 billion people were watching the festival on television and online platforms. The winner would receive the title of Super Chef, a feat achieved by only 5 people in the world. Zebra didn't care much about that, he was only concerned about filling his stomach. Meanwhile, in the stands, Uncle Zong was extremely annoyed sitting on a cheap folding chair. At this moment, the host with the microphone declared the official opening of the 50th cooking festival. After the cooking festival was announced to begin, the host immediately introduced the 100 contestants participating in this competition. First was the reigning champion from last year, the top-ranked king of cooking, Zaz. Next was the sixth-ranked chef who captured the hearts of all sweet-toothed girls, Ennio. Following them were the 4th-ranked Curry King, Damala, then the 5th-ranked Medicinal Cooking Specialist named Yuda. The 14th-ranked Wabutora and the 17th-ranked Live Bear appeared in sequence, standing out among the chefs was the 2nd-ranked female chef, Setsuno. Without keeping the audience waiting for long, the eagerly anticipated figure, the head chef of the gourmet restaurant ranked 88th. Komatsu quickly stepped out to cheers and applause. Seeing Komatsu looking worried, Toriko encouraged him wholeheartedly, boosting Komatsu's confidence. Meanwhile, the Bishakukai group had also prepared to execute their plan. The host finished introducing the chef's names, while Rin continued diligently with her task of taming her beastly creatures. Mansam and Shigematsu were worried about the Bishakukai's plot. At the cooking stadium, Patch was invited to the stage to give the opening speech. After observing the contestants in front of him, he warned them to ensure food safety and hygiene during cooking, or they would risk receiving embarrassing one-star reviews from the media. Kamatsu. 
Upon hearing this, looked bewildered, and Toriko shouted from a distance to boost Kamatsu's spirits. After a speech full of threats and assurances for the safety of the competition, Patch was applauded by the audience and stepped down. Wabutora, the oil king, came to greet Kamatsu as he had heard of him for a long time. He quickly shook Kamatsu's hand in greeting, leaving a handful of cooking oil in Kamatsu's hand. The elder chef Kama also came to thank Kamatsu for his contributions to the world. Then, other contestants like Speed King Tun and Chef Naramaro came to greet everyone. An elderly hermit chef, radiating an aura of wisdom, appeared to deliver a lecture. Kamatsu took the opportunity to ask for autographs from each person. The top two chefs stood apart, observing the other chefs conversing with each other. Zaz expressed his desire to retire after the competition, but Setsuno disagreed, believing that as long as people still eat, there will always be a need for cooking. Neither of them was willing to yield the title of super chef. When they faced off against each other, the audience erupted with excitement. The members of the G7 group were also eagerly anticipating the competition. Meanwhile, as Kamatsu was still fretting, the host quickly introduced the format of the first round. Contestants would have to participate in physical activities such as swimming, racing, and endurance running before cooking. This round would eliminate half of the initial contestants. They would have to swim across Takoyaki Island to collect ingredients. Next, they would have to run through various mountains and collect cooking utensils at the foot of Okana Hill. The fastest person would choose the best ingredients. In this situation, Kamatsu was in danger, but Toriko still had faith in him, while the youth zebra remained calm and continued eating recklessly, ignoring everything. At this point, the competition had begun at the referee's command. Tina was right by the rice coast, ready to report and even prepared a mouthful of raw rice to stave off hunger. Contestants on the shore were warming up their limbs, while Kamatsu worried about being eliminated from this round of the competition. Meanwhile, Toriko and Zebra remained calm, competing to see who could eat faster. Mr. Manchi, clumsy as ever, stumbled as he stepped onto the stage, accidentally squeezing the trigger of his gun, causing everyone to immediately dive into the sea and swim to the island to gather cooking ingredients. The audience above cheered and encouraged them. At this moment, a mysterious young man who was still asleep suddenly woke up, realizing that he had missed the competition. While other chefs were swimming like athletes, Kamatsu swam like a child learning to swim. However, many people, both familiar and unfamiliar, attentively watched and cheered on the contestants. Currently leading was Mami, ranked 29th, known for being the head chef of an underwater restaurant, hence the menu consisted mostly of fresh sashimi. However, Wabutora, the oil king, used his unique skill to run on water, taking the lead with his deep-fried menu. The contestants behind were still in hot pursuit, with Kamatsu struggling to keep up. Both Sani and Toriko admitted defeat as they realized Kamatsu couldn't swim. Just as Kamatsu was about to sink, Zebra suddenly created a sound buoy to help him. Kamatsu was relieved to swim back to shore easily, but then Setsuno appeared. She thought Kamatsu was drowning and came to rescue him. Seeing her standing on the water, Kamatsu was surprised and greatly admired Setsuno. The truth behind this technique was that before one foot sank, Setsuno immediately lifted the other foot, moving so fast that others couldn't see it. Seeing that Kamatsu was okay, she gracefully glided across the water's surface. Feeling that this was a fair competition, Kamatsu requested Zebra to remove the sound buoy so he could rely on his own strength. Zebra, though indifferent on the surface, still cheered him on wholeheartedly. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure observed the competition from above with a sinister smile. Kamatsu struggled while swimming. While Wabutora used the buoyancy of oil to ride the waves effortlessly, yet Setsuno easily surpassed him. Behind them, top-ranked Chef Saws and Speed King Tun chased after. Despite swallowing countless gulps of seawater, Kamatsu remained determined to swim to the finish line. Setsuno reached the first destination and leisurely selected the best ingredients for cooking. Tina, beside her, explained about the bicycles prepared for transportation. The contestants had to use them to transport their chosen ingredients for cooking, and they quickly arrived to make their selections. As the competition heated up, suddenly, on top of a tall building, a mysterious figure with a sinister smile appeared. This person had decided to reveal themselves, and furthermore, he could stand at a 90-degree angle to the building. The host quickly introduced the newcomer, he wasn't a Spider-Man but indeed the final contestant in this culinary competition. The demon-faced chef named Tengu Brunch, ranked third in the world, emerged. All the audience members were extremely excited by his appearance. Brunch took a deep breath and shouted loudly, I will defeat everyone. Zebra remained silent, but everyone knew his style, less talk, more action, the hallmark of Zebra, the gourmet emperor. Brunch immediately leaped onto the table of the four heavenly kings, facing Zebra directly. Zebra mentioned a contestant named Kamatsu, calling him his companion and claiming that he would humble Brunch's arrogant attitude. However, something seemed amiss. Kamatsu wasn't actually Zebra's companion. Brunch declared his intention to defeat Kamatsu, but the four heavenly kings swiftly responded, cautioning against arrogance and not underestimating others. After the exchange, Brunch dashed off. 
Though he appeared arrogant, the four heavenly kings knew Brunch's true strength was not just empty boasting. After struggling with the sea, Komatsu finally arrived at his destination, his body exhausted. In the distance, Brunch also arrived. Komatsu admired Brunch, but upon seeing Brunch's physique, he couldn't help but notice how immature it seemed. Komatsu acknowledged this observation, questioning how his culinary skills could compare to Brunch's. Komatsu was genuinely participating in the cooking competition, given his tendency to seek autographs from top-ranked chefs whenever he encounters them. Sani angrily questioned why Komatsu should seek the autograph of that arrogant guy. Brunch argued that the remaining ingredients were mere leftovers, but Komatsu eagerly examined each ingredient, envisioning delicious dishes. At that moment, the ingredients seemed to illuminate with joy, happy to be chosen despite being deemed ordinary. Brunch proposed to help Komatsu gather the remaining ingredients to create a unique dish. Despite the long journey ahead, Komatsu and Brunch collaborated. Sunny was annoyed, but Toriko found the collaboration remarkable, appreciating Brunch's kindness. Despite his forceful entry onto the table, Brunch managed to spill only glasses and bottles, ensuring the safety of the food on the plates and the drinks in the glasses. These actions made Toriko see Brunch in a different light, recognizing his kindness. Komatsu and Brunch, both passionate about food, immediately bonded as if they had been longtime friends. This camaraderie showcased the harmony among exceptional chefs. The journey to the cooking island is now jammed with a 120 km traffic backlog, estimated to take 20 hours to clear. These giraffe deers are genetically engineered creatures derived from grass-eating deer. They have strong vision and smell, and when they emit a sound, it signals potential danger. The atmosphere at the festival is tense, emotions running high. After cycling to transport ingredients, participants will carry them on a long run to the cooking arena, but the race doesn't end there. Our chefs will cook the chosen ingredients at the cooking arena, and their dishes will be tasted by the 7G7 judges. Only 50 out of the top 100 chefs will advance to the next round. The leading chefs pedal ahead, while others like Livebearer and Kairu follow closely behind. Bizarre food queen Kapuriko not only carries weight but also fights off obstacles and uses the spoils as ingredients. She's a strong girl indeed. Restaurant owner Odin Genshan deals with a wild boar, using recipes dating back generations. He decides to cook soup with the boar following the traditions of his ancestors. Demon mice attack the chefs, but the poisonous chef Tylan swiftly defeats them with two strokes. Komatsu pedals slowly, so Brunch pulls him along for speed. This is the real battlefield. Komatsu's spirits must be soaring. In a flash, Komatsu and Brunch catch up with the leading chefs. Brunch even sabotages the path to eliminate trailing chefs. This is the essence of competitive spirit, sometimes, cunning tactics make for a thrilling contest. The current top ranks reach the Kankatsu mountain area. They abandon their bicycles and start running, but the speed of these elderly folks is remarkable. Truly, they are top chefs of the planet. Tina is at the equipment station, where chefs choose cooking tools provided by the organizers within an hour. Chefs must quickly select the tools they prefer. Coco believes that the key to winning this round lies in selecting the right ingredients and cooking tools. Setsuno, Zaz, and Yuda are the first to arrive, breezing through the equipment station. One might have thought these three would reach the finish line first. But no, Brunch and Komatsu arrive first. Brunch's victory seems to fuel his arrogance. 85 contestants complete the race, and the one who arrives at the finish line with Brunch is Chef Komatsu. Zebra listens to Komatsu's heartbeat, sensing his nervousness. Yet, the gourmet quartet still believes he'll be fine because cooking is his forte. Instead of choosing Milk's knife like Milk's second, Komatsu opts for an ordinary one, surprising the audience and renowned chefs alike. Brunch questions Komatsu why he didn't use Milk's knife. Komatsu honestly replies that he didn't bring it because Brunch helped him with everything so far. Komatsu decides to use a regular knife to make up for his dishonesty. Komatsu leaves Milk's knife behind, demonstrating that his purpose here is not about winning or losing but about honesty. Brunch turns away, calling him foolish yet intriguing. The four heavenly kings and Milk's second praise Komatsu wholeheartedly. Patch lets Komatsu know that he greatly admires Komatsu's actions, and he will score fairly. Upon hearing this, Komatsu's heart beats faster and becomes somewhat unstable. Komatsu gradually calms down and listens to the call of the ingredients. After some consideration, Komatsu chooses hardshell crabs. With just one knife skillfully wielded, he impresses even the top chefs. Concentrating on what he loves to do, Komatsu pays no heed to the disparaging remarks around him. Living true to oneself like Komatsu leaves no room for complaints. The dish is simple yet impressive, the crab shells resemble crispy fries. Setsuno introduces the dish Komatsu made for everyone. Komatsu's dish is called beach fried rice, and the G7 group hasn't tasted it yet, but Toriko is already salivating. All the ingredients Komatsu chose are not wasted, they are leftovers but exceptionally delicious. Next, the top chefs will showcase their innate talents. 
The first place in this round goes to none other than Setsuno, and Komatsu also successfully advances to the next round. Now, they will begin the second round, and the arena unfolds below with a gigantic scale brought up. The first match on the scale of death is lucky cuisine chef Komatsu facing off against the oil king Wabutora. The rules are as follows, the food on each side of the scale is equal in quantity. Chefs must quickly cook the ingredients and offer them to the audience for tasting. If the quantity of ingredients on one side decreases, the scale will rise, otherwise, it will fall. Since Wabutora uses the oil that Komatsu found, he wants Komatsu to use Melk's knife to compete with him. While Komatsu is still contemplating, Wabutora starts cooking with oil. In no time, Komatsu's scale drops. In a critical moment, Komatsu decides to cut the ingredients with Melk's knife. The elderly are very picky about fried food. And Wabutora's fried dishes make them eat easily and happily. Sunny sees that Wabutora is spurred on by Komatsu's talent. Now, Komatsu is getting closer to the flames. Komatsu struggles to lift the ingredients into the oil pan and fry them with a large spoon, surprising the audience and viewers. It's a giant beef steak. Everyone thought Komatsu wouldn't cook it through, but after a while, it's done because Komatsu is very close to the fire. Thanks to the learning and training process with Toriko throughout the journey. The supersized beefsteak pieces are cooked in an instant. Komatsu learns not only from Toriko but also from Koko. His composure was evident from the gourmet casino. The cheese slowly melts and flows over the steak. It's both cooking and performance art, and both sides of the scale are equal because they handled all the ingredients. Komatsu's beefsteak dish dominates entirely because he uses only natural fish oil, while Wabutora's ambition led him to mix second-rate oil with fish oil to speed up cooking, which backfired. Today, the oil genius Wabutora learned a valuable lesson. Chef Komatsu is the winner of this round, and Wabutora acknowledges what Sunny said about Komatsu is correct. They shake hands happily like two friends. Komatsu's battle has boosted the spirits of Brunch, Setsuno, and Zaz on this side. Setsuno, Zaz, and the other powerful chefs easily secure victories. Only 25 chefs remain for the next round, where 16 will be selected to aim for the championship. In the next round, the rules are simple, the ingredients are on the islands, and a helicopter carries Tina to provide direct information about the islands the chefs will choose to participate in. This competition is to test the chefs' skills and their culinary luck. Each chef will choose their favorite island and use their skills to cook the best dish. For this contest, everyone will choose a companion to start with. For Komatsu, the companion he chooses is none other than Toriko. At the Maiden Island, Setsuno chooses Nono as her companion. Despite the cute appearances of the creatures there, Setsuno doesn't hold back and swiftly defeats them with a single kick. Toriko and Komatsu's group decides to choose Gourmet Island, where everything from the grass to the rocks is gourmet food. Toriko's appetite leads him to consider eating a flower, but Komatsu stops him because if the ingredients are consumed before cooking, they will be disqualified from the competition. On the other side, Coco was chosen by the poison cooking expert Tylan as a companion, while Tina has to go to Gigan Island to report because the unexpected companion of brunch turns out to be Zebra. Because both of them are equally temperamental, they end up fighting each other immediately, with Tina, on the side. Getting shaken. Elsewhere, Sani is chosen as the companion of medicinal cooking Yuda. They venture to find ingredients on the plant island because Sani fears encountering ugly creatures. Meanwhile, top-ranked chef Zaz selects Zong as his companion, simply because he opts for someone significant and doesn't feel the need for a teammate. Zong, unsure about his talents, is astonished when he sees the island they've chosen is inhabited by a giant squid. It tries to attack Zaz, but he easily subdues it with a single strike. At this point, both Komatsu and Toriko have harvested a lot of ingredients, but the problem is that the ingredients keep replenishing every time they pick them. With this situation, Komatsu won't be able to complete the challenge. After a while, many contestants have finished their part of the competition. The first to present his dish is Thailand, whose poisonous shrimp easily captivates the judges' palates. Now, only Komatsu and Brunch have not returned. Tina, on the scene, reports that Brunch and Zebra are fighting, and unfortunately, many unfortunate creatures on the island have died because of their battle. Sensing time is running out, Brunch quickly brings them back to cook. Meanwhile, on the other side, Mansam is still keeping an eye on the Bishakukai, while Zin has to watch the festival through his phone. Meanwhile, Komatsu and Toriko feel discouraged because they can't harvest all the ingredients on the island. Feeling they won't finish on time, Komatsu suggests Toriko eat all the ingredients they've collected. Though he says so, Komatsu is inwardly tormented, making Toriko lose his appetite too. Komatsu holds back his emotions, urging Toriko to eat while enjoying the scenery. Toriko, trying to comfort him, starts analyzing the nature of the plants around them and discovers that the soil above is incredibly rich. When rain falls, the water seeps through the ground. 
blending with the island's ingredients and flowing into the sea. The seawater holds the essence of the entire island, and the creatures that can absorb it are oysters. If they catch one, it's like obtaining the essence of the entire island. Without many words, Toriko immediately dives into the sea to catch oysters. In no time, he finds a massive oyster as big as the island itself, with an incredibly tough shell that even Toriko's flying fork technique can't break. Provoked, the oyster charges at Toriko, intending to ram him, but Toriko remains calm, making gestures before the meal and then unleashing ten incredibly powerful punches that shatter the hard shell, revealing the succulent and nutritious oyster meat. Finally, Kamatsu uses the oyster meat to treat the judges, squeezing lemon over the meat to enhance the flavor. Not only that, but the fried oyster dish also garners praise from everyone, with Toriko continuously eating until Kamatsu has to remind him to eat less if he doesn't have a girlfriend. Brunch is extremely confident with his monster meat dish, while Zebra just wants to eat the meat plate. Brunch hurriedly brings the plate to the judges for tasting. Finally, the list of the 16 contestants who passed the third round is announced, luckily including Kamatsu. However, unfortunately, he will have to face the top-ranked chef saws in the next round. After that, the list of other pairs is also announced. At this time, the giraffe and Mansam sense the impending danger, and all four heavenly kings are ready to face the Bishikukai organization. The 16 faces who made it through the third round have emerged, but the danger named Bishikukai is approaching. Meanwhile, inside the waiting room, Kamatsu faces immense pressure because he is considered a strong candidate for the championship. At this moment, he meets an old friend, Yuemi, and the two friends embrace warmly after a long time. Yuemi praises Kamatsu's honesty and fair play in the competition, which moves him to tears. Yuemi also cries with him because shared tears are joyful. Kamatsu quickly asks about his old friend Otaki, but Yuemi is unsure of his whereabouts. Toriko, Sani, and Koko appear, and Kamatsu introduces them to Yuemi. Seeing Toriko and everyone being so close to Kamatsu, Yuemi admires his friend a lot. Kamatsu explains that Yuemi is the chef of Nakam Gourmet School and is acquainted with Ms. Samire. While they're chatting, Yuemi is called away by a bodyguard because he's now the chef for Chairman Moi, a millionaire and owner of a famous gourmet travel conglomerate, who seems to be plotting something very secretive. On the other side, Brunch is recharging his body with energy, sensing that something unpleasant is about to happen. Toriko also feels like he's being watched by someone. The host announces that the showdown between Kamatsu and the top chef saws will begin in a few minutes. Sani and everyone encourage Kamatsu with all their might, while Toriko believes that he will definitely defeat Zaz. Hearing those words made Kamatsu very happy and filled with confidence as he stepped out onto the tournament stage. As soon as Kamatsu left, the Toriko team immediately returned to a state of readiness, sensing the imminent danger. Outside, the host announced the beginning of the match between the newly famous chef Kamatsu and the world-renowned chef Zaz. Zaz had won 14 consecutive victories in 14 culinary festivals. Zaz told Kamatsu that he would compete to his fullest without giving Kamatsu any leeway. The host introduced the rules of this tournament, the two chefs would have to cook in a completely dark room. They had to rely on their senses and experience to cook, as even a small mistake in the cooking process would affect the quality of the dish. Kamatsu and Zaz entered the dark room, with darkness surrounding them. Kamatsu had to grope his way through the darkness to find the kitchen and ingredients. Meanwhile, Zaz had already started cooking. Kamatsu had to bend down and grope further. While concentrating, he suddenly felt he had caught something, but then a terrifying heat and glowing red eyes appeared in the darkness. Toriko outside also sensed danger. At this moment, outside the festival, the Bishikukai forces immediately mobilized their monsters to attack Mazam's giraffes, causing their heads to fall. In the sky, countless GT robots appeared, along with other monsters, attacking the stadium and key areas on the island. Their purpose was to eliminate all the chefs present. At this moment, Starjun appeared before Kamatsu, causing Toriko to be extremely furious. Outside the stadium, the giraffes reared up, transitioning to attack mode, continuously emitting energy beams from their mouths to destroy the invaders. Mazam also used electricity to activate his muscles, transforming into a giant for battle, as the war had officially begun. Outside, the Bishikukai monsters and GT robots had to face off against Mansum's defensive forces, causing the audience watching the cooking festival to feel extremely worried. Inside the arena where Kamatsu was competing, he was seized by Starjun, and fear was evident on his face. Despite his efforts, Kamatsu couldn't escape. Zebra created sound waves from a distance to protect Kamatsu, while Koko transmitted deadly toxins through Zebra's sound waves to Starjun's hand, but he easily neutralized them. Sunny above used his senses to try to bind Starjun, but it was ineffective. He ignited a blue flame, burning both his senses and the area where Kamatsu was competing. The monsters on this side have arrived, and the people are running in panic. The Sioux chefs of the Bishikokai appear, the chefs ready to fight. Brunch promises to deal with them all for ruining the epic tournament. 
In the midst of the dangerous situation, Toriko also steps forward behind Starjun to rescue Komatsu. Both exchange intense gazes, creating a significant disturbance. Inside, the Shafzaz, left unprotected, has been defeated, surprising Setsuno greatly. Toriko swings his leg, creating a giant blade flying towards Starjun with great destructive force, but luckily, Zebra creates a sound barrier to protect the audience. Then Toriko kicks on the other side, creating a flying fork that surprises Koko and Zebra. Koko starts using his power to shoot poison bullets at the monsters in the sky, but suddenly they are stopped and sucked into a giant vacuum tube. It's Grinpatch, the king of odd eats, who even considers Koko's poison as a delicacy. Sani, protecting Komatsu, suddenly has a giant crab claw cut off a chunk of his hair. It's Tommy, making Sunny horrified by this insect-like creature's ugliness. Sani, disgusted, turns his hair yellow, resembling a super scion to fight Tommy. The monsters gradually attack the people, but an electric surge flies to destroy the giant monsters, led by Brunch and other top chefs forming a battle team. After a series of continuous attacks from Toriko, Starjun remains steadfast as if nothing has happened. The sky is now filled with the creatures of the Bishikukai. During the journey hunting the puffer whale, Toriko experiences fear induced by Starjun. Toriko asserts his determination to protect all the chefs, especially Komatsu. Toriko grabs Starjun and delivers a nail punch, followed by another punch, sending Starjun flying far away. Starjun realizes that Toriko can now unleash powerful punches without sweating. Toriko claims he can punch all day without fatigue and then rushes to deliver another punch to Starjun. Starjun decides it's enough, unleashing his killer intent and delivering a punch to Toriko, knocking him into a pile of rubble. The GT robots replicate in overwhelming numbers, along with countless monsters outside. Rin and Mazum try to defend, but Mazum has lost control due to being drugged in hopes Rin will leave as he can't control himself and might do something terrible. Everything in the arena is destroyed, and the festival has ended. Brunch approaches Komatsu, surprised that someone as weak as Komatsu hasn't fled. He advises Komatsu to escape because capable chefs will fight here. Brunch creates lightning to disperse the approaching monsters. Live Bearer and Wabutora attack fiercely, proving that even chefs can fight fiercely. As Rin runs, she releases a sleep-inducing gas at the monsters, made from the Lazy King ingredient. Some monsters are unaffected, so Rin prepares her laser sword for attack. After taking a full blow from Starjun, Toriko struggled to get up from the rubble. Toriko unleashed 54 punches, causing Starjun to fly through the wall, but Toriko relentlessly pursued him and continued to unleash his fork punches, sending Starjun flying out of the stadium. Toriko followed him, using a boomerang combined with a flying fork to attack Starjun head-on. Starjun fell, and Toriko delivered a powerful punch that sent him crashing into a nearby mountain. This relentless combo shattered Starjun's mask and armor. Meanwhile, Masan fought alone, laughing as he defeated numerous GT robots, his muscles bulging with each strike. The chefs in the arena launched fierce attacks. But their numbers remained relentless. Toriko and Starjun, both handsome and powerful, summoned their appetites for battle, charging at each other. Toriko landed a fork punch to Starjun's abdomen, but Starjun countered with a blow to Toriko's mouth. As Toriko fell, he spun, creating a leg-made blade. Starjun countered with fire, but Toriko created a fork shield. Seizing the opportunity, Toriko jumped, forming a hand blade and struck Starjun, but it was Toriko who fell first. Toriko pushed Starjun away by his hair, but after a relentless assault, Toriko's arms were immobilized. Masan sat atop a pile of GT robot corpses, reminiscing about his past encounter with Godfather. Godfather taught Masan that with great power comes great responsibility and subdued Masan with a single finger. Since then, Masan's power had been sealed, and now he used electric shocks to release the seal, his strength increasing by the minute. Meanwhile, the chefs continued their battle against endless waves of creatures. In a dangerous moment, Komatsu received help from the Rice King's grasp, and the sous chefs of Bishikukai began to join the fight. Match and the Gourmet Knights were ready for action, as Match once again faced the dual-muscled opponent, determined to defeat him once more. Despite the efforts of the Yakuza and the Gourmet Knights, they were overwhelmed by Yu's single-handed onslaught. Takamara battled a half-human, half-beast mummy, breaking its ribs, but the creature retaliated sending Takamaro crashing into a wall. The pot artisan Kuribo, tasked by the IGO president to monitor Kusaro, suspected him of being a spy for Bishikokai. After clashing with Takamaro, the half-beast mummy turned its attention to Brunch, hoping to capture him alive for the boss. Brunch, without many words, unleashed a 1000 volts current, more powerful than Pikachu's. Toriko and Starjun on this side are still fiercely battling, with consecutive blows from both. After a while, Starjun begins to show signs of exhaustion but still doesn't forget to provoke Toriko. Yu on the side calls upon the mighty beasts to end this meaningless battle as quickly as possible.
Starjun suggests that instead of warming up, Toriko should use his full strength now, as their current combat appears weak. Hearing Starjun's challenge, Toriko immediately unleashes his flying forks, followed by thousands more converging to create two large forks charging at Starjun. However, he evades them all and appears behind Toriko, and both immediately exchange powerful blows to the chest. Toriko continues to emit the aura of his gourmet demon, hoping to deliver a decisive blow to Starjun. At the arena where Brunch fights against the half-human, half-beast Elg, Elg repeatedly tries to persuade Brunch to join the Bishikukai, but Brunch is not easily swayed. Brunch continuously unleashes bolts of 100,000 volt electricity at Elg, yet after countless strikes, Elg remains steadfast. The local residents scatter in panic, UME loses sight of Chairman Moi, suddenly spotting him and chasing after him. Other billionaires and IGO traders are discussing the ongoing conflict between IGO and Bishikukai. The Rice King throws salt into the eyes of the beasts here. Thinking he has one. He lets his guard down and is stealthily attacked by a nitro creature. Not only this nitro but others appear as well. The blue-skinned monster is Zarajira, the chief of food management, alongside Gert, Bishikukai's talent scout. Yuda comes to aid the Rice King, urging Kamatsu to flee. Toriko and Starjun on this side fight tirelessly, with neither gaining the upper hand. Toriko's attacks are easily countered by Starjun, except for his boomerang, which drains Toriko's strength. Yuda engages in combat with the gourmet nitro world monster. As soon as he charges, it strikes him with one hand, knocking away his sword and forcefully pressing him to the ground. Then, it lunges to attack the chef Damala. Livebearer rushes in to assist, swinging his blade repeatedly at the nitro monster. Despite the barrage of attacks, the damage inflicted seems negligible, and the nitro retaliates, causing Livebearer to collapse. The two Saisiya swiftly rush in, using their rescue firefly lights, and proceed to aid Livebearer. Everyone wonders why such terrifying creatures like the Nitro are obedient to the Bishikukai. Cairo steps forward to provide a simple explanation, it's because the leader of the Bishikukai is essentially a tyrannical demon who not only tames Nitro but also commands other powerful beasts through the honor of gourmet food. Cairo removes his mask and prepares to fight the Nitro creatures. Meanwhile, Coco's toxins are absorbed by Grinpatch, rendering his attacks ineffective. Unyielding, Coco continues his assault, but Grinpatch absorbs his toxins and retaliates with a potent poison storm. Coco removes his headband, shooting continuous toxins at Grinpatch, who swallows them all. Coco then leaps, attempting to cut Grinpatch's suction tube, his vulnerability. However, the tube is reinforced with gourmet world oak resin, harder than diamonds. Unfazed, Coco presses on, relentlessly attacking him. Toriko and Starjun continue their relentless battle. Toriko weakens while Starjun remains robust, blasting blue flames at Toriko. As Kamatsu flees, he prays for culinary divine intervention and is fortunately protected by Zebra's sound armor. Yun, the penguin, comes to Kamatsu's rescue after he's knocked down by a monster. Koko persists in battling Grinpatch, whose suction tube undergoes unexpected transformations. After a series of attacks, Grinpatch swallows Koko whole, laughing triumphantly. Though Toriko falls, he rises defiantly, declaring that I am now stronger than ever before and that change is inevitable. Luckily, Koko on this side is still alive. Earlier, Coco created a fake body out of poison to deceive Grinpatch, a result of training with his comrades. Toriko, while fighting, recounts stories from the past about the strength he and his teammates have built, which is the power of friendship. Not only that, but his current strength is also thanks to the dishes Kamatsu has cooked. After some talk, he flies in to deliver a powerful blow to Starjun's abdomen. On this side, Coco also reveals his robust muscles, surrounded by poison. Once again, Coco attacks Grinpatch with poison cannons, which Grinpatch absorbs into his stomach, causing it to swell like an elephant's belly. Grinpatch retaliates by shooting poisonous darts at Coco. Kamatsu sees Coco fall and wants to rush to help, but with Coco's body full of toxins, no one can approach. Grinpatch inhales deeply, creating a poisonous vortex attacking the arena below. The destructive force creates a giant hole, and fortunately, Yun rescues Kamatsu from it. Kamatsu can only watch helplessly as his comrades slowly fall. However, Koko is still strong enough to prevent Grinpatch from touching his friends. Koko believes that the Bishikukai is here to capture the chefs because chefs in this gourmet era are more precious than social idols. The battles are also about fighting for the chefs. They are irreplaceable in this era. Koko is determined to risk his life to protect Kamatsu because the dishes Kamatsu and other chefs have created bring warmth, satisfaction, and hope to people around the world, especially to crying children, wherever they may be. Therefore, Coco must fight to protect everyone, it is the duty of a gourmet hunter. Coco's words illuminate the darkness of this gloomy atmosphere. Grinpatch then uses a poison tornado. And Coco counterattacks with a poisonous spear. 
Grin Patch advances toward Komatsu, but Koko appears from behind, embracing and squeezing him tightly before both plunge into the deep pit together. On the other side, Starjun becomes more serious as he feels Toriko getting stronger day by day. Sunny closes his eyes to focus his spirit on battling the repulsive monsters before him. Tommy continuously regurgitates insects from his mouth, causing discomfort to everyone, including Sunny. Tommy relentlessly attacks with a swarm of disgusting insects, and Sunny fights back using his frying pan, dazzling light sweeping away the monsters. Toriko and Starjun release their gourmet demons and glare at each other. Then launch into direct attacks. Komatsu, trying to escape, is surrounded by the insect swarm. Tommy finds Sunny fascinating and releases adhesive level 90 bugs, but Sunny, now stronger and more formidable, creates a protective shield with his hair, followed by a thorn rain attack, defeating all the ugly bugs. Not stopping there, Tommy releases large insects in hopes of cutting off all of Sunny's hair. The bugs fly in to cut Sunny's hair, knowing it hurts as much as pulling a tooth. When Sunny was young, he accidentally broke the chairman's precious face, but instead of scolding him, the chairman bandaged his wound. He also said that everything will eventually break, and when that happens, a new light will shine on this era. Now witnessing the scene of the monsters rampant and the screams of everyone, Sunny's heartache is worse than ever. He is transformed into strength, his hair has turned into a golden color, now Sunny looks no different from the Super Scion form level 3 like Goku. The bugs, even if they wanted to, couldn't cut Sunny's hair. More importantly, each strand of hair grows from hunger, it grows to the point where it can spread throughout the universe, so Tommy's bugs are nothing compared to Sunny's power. A bug has been pierced by hair, while the others are quickly crushed, but this also makes Sunny's mind increasingly irrational. Tommy sees Sunny is really strong so he decides to take action himself. Calmly dealing with his bugs because they are too useless, he lands on the ground facing Sunny, but before he can attack, he is already hit by Sunny's hair, breaking an arm. But the problem Sunny faces is also very serious, something is waiting to break out and control Sunny's mind, so before it's too late, Sunny has to defeat his opponent as quickly as possible. Tommy uses his speed to dodge Sunny's hair with eyes formed by hundreds of tiny eyes, he can observe all the movements of Sunny's hair and realize that in this form Sunny cannot fully control his hair, so he takes the opportunity to get close and attack. Sunny had no choice but to revert to his old form for defense, but while focusing on attacking Tommy. Tommy's severed arm unexpectedly grabbed Sunny's neck from behind, seizing the opportunity, Tommy rushed in and landed a punch on Sunny. He grabbed Sunny's hair, then kneed into his abdomen, using force to throw Sunny to the ground, finally, he coldly used his hand to stab through Sunny's chest. At that moment Sunny's seal is also broken, Tommy is joyful but unexpectedly realizes that his hand is stuck, while Sunny's hair turns yellow again covering his face, now he can fully control each strand of his hair. Tommy cannot move, although he doesn't see any of Sunny's hair clinging to him, it turns out that Sunny has used his cut hair to lock him tightly. Sunny also knows that Tommy's severed arm can be controlled remotely so he deliberately creates this trap to lure him. Now with this bright hair Tommy's fate is sealed, but he is also the first person who can touch Sunny and cut so much of his hair like this. Now both are extremely focused before the opponent's final blow, in a moment Tommy's left arm is swallowed up by Sunny's hair. The hungry demon inside Sunny is extremely dangerous and then when both attack, Tommy is pierced by Sunny's hair, he tries to fight to the end but still cannot escape the fate of being swallowed up by Sunny's hair. Although victorious, Sunny himself has been quite seriously injured. Komatsu, at this moment, witnessed the people protected by Zebra being escorted to safety. Now, Komatsu only hoped that Toriko remains safe. On the other side, Brunch saw the face of Elg. Before he could introduce himself, he was struck by high-voltage electricity, but surprisingly, Elg could still regenerate as before. Even after enduring a lightning strike from Brunch, he could still recover and counterattack. This makes Brunch unable to understand. The truth was that Elg was the oldest member of the Bishakukai organization. His lower body was the Horse King, an immortal from legend. To attain the eternal youth and immortality of the Horse King, he fused with it. Upon hearing this, Brunch immediately drew his Thunder Sword to verify Elg's immortality. In a flash, he lunged forward and unleashed the Thunder God's Fury technique to shatter Elg into pieces. However, Elg, being truly immortal, regenerated his cells, surrounding Brunch with multiple replicas. A figure emerged from the ground, seizing Brunch's leg to allow another to leap forward and attack him. It turned out that within Elg's body, there were cells of tapeworms, creatures whose body, when severed, could regenerate into new entities. This revelation made Brunch realize that his opponent was indeed living up to the legend of immortality. Meanwhile, a surprise unfolded as Kuribo turned out to be a spy. He captured Ume, who fortunately was spared due to being Chairman Moa's personal chef. He, along with several others, were members of the NEO group, infiltrating numerous spies into IGO and other organizations worldwide. More importantly, the group included Zaz, a top chef. Brunch became more serious now. 
he continued to use electric currents to attack his opponents, creating a thunderstorm that assaulted all of Elves' replicas. However, over time, Elves' resistance to electricity increased, and hundreds of Elves immediately rushed to gang up on Brunch. As the two batteries around Brunch's neck ran out of power, Eld did not expect this to be part of Brunch's plan. He could convert the attacks he received into electricity. Brunch unleashed a powerful lightning strike, infusing his blood into his enemy's body, turning it into a conductor that incinerated the Elves to their very cells. Regardless of how many times Eld regenerated his body, Brunch's blood remained inside, shocking him. Finally, Eld could no longer bear it and revealed his true form, over 200 years old. Feeling ugly, he covered his real appearance, but to Brunch, he looked handsome compared to the mutant creatures in his village. Upon hearing this, Eld smiled and dissipated into dust. At this point, Zebra had completed evacuating the people from the arena and was ready for combat. The audience and Tina outside the stadium couldn't understand how they could safely leave. The host immediately used the microphone to announce that it was thanks to Zebra. Meanwhile, Yuda and Kairu couldn't stop the Nitro Monster. Other chefs were quickly subdued and captured by the Bishikokai. Just as the monsters were about to attack them, they sensed an extremely dangerous presence, akin to death itself, which was none other than Zebra. Meanwhile, Zong and his two siblings were planning to escape, but Zong wanted to stay because if he left, who would defeat Nitro? His younger sibling expressed profound admiration for Zong, touching him deeply as he hugged them both, bolstering his courage to fight. However, upon seeing the terrifying monster before him, he became frightened. Luckily, Setsuno arrived to rescue them. She instructed them to flee and leave the matter to the elderly. True enough, she swiftly defeated the lingering monsters with a single move. At that moment, Setsuno's opponent appeared, she was Chio, wielding a lightning-fast dagger to attack Setsuno. On the other side, Zebra easily knocked Zarajira thousands of meters away. As for Rin, she had to fight three opponents at once, so she summoned a gigantic sword and swung it in a sweeping motion, putting the monsters to sleep with a single strike. Match, on this side, also easily countered his opponent's attacks with his sword, even though the opponent had increased strength, Match still managed to win. At this point, Zebra had to contend with the Nitro Monster, he easily twisted its arm and delivered a blow, then used his sound gun attack. Taking a deep breath, Zebra unleashed a horrifying roar. Followed by a sound punch, causing the remaining two Nitros to want to gang up on him, but Zebra blew them away with his bazooka sound waves. On the other side, Setsuno gained the upper hand by reducing the air pressure around her opponent, but her opponent also took advantage of it to increase speed, yet all her tricks were defeated by Setsuno. Unexpectedly, Kiribo grabbed her, and Kusero immediately drained her calories, while Chef Saws used his sword to strike Setsuno, fortunately, she was still strong enough to not be defeated, even managing to escape the encirclement. Seeing the scar on Zaza's eye, Setsuno remembered a legendary chef who won the championship in the first tournament. Named Zhua, known as the Dark Chef, who was probably the one Zaza bathed. Caught off guard, Zaz stabbed Chio because she was just blocking the way for him, and Kusero immediately struck her down. The purpose of the Neo organization is to create chaos through the battle between Igo and Bishikokai, and they have a deeper purpose. Zaz wants Setsuno to join the Neo organization, of course, she refused. Now the Neo organization's spies, including Vice President Shigematsu, took action. He took advantage of Mansum's inattention and attacked him by surprise. Kamatsu and Yun, after much effort, found Toriko, only to see Toriko being beaten up by Starjun. Seeing Toriko being defeated. Kamatsu couldn't believe his eyes, all the memories rushed back, where was the strong Toriko against the monsters, where was the Toriko who always defeated his enemies and became stronger after each battle, and happily smiled while eating delicious food cooked by Kamatsu. Seeing Toriko's current situation, Kamatsu was extremely worried, but he was not Starjun's opponent. Inside Toriko's mind, his demon continued to lecture on the power of friendship. When Starjun approached, Kamatsu loudly called out to Toriko to wake up quickly. Toriko immediately got up and punched Starjun. Toriko said he only slept for a while and still couldn't get it. He would finish off Starjun first and then sleep. Starjun stood up proudly, asking Toriko how he wanted to die, Toriko said I could fight however I wanted, so they sized each other up. Starjun was surprised to see himself being hit, so he defended against Toriko's attack, while Kamatsu and Yun quickly stepped aside. Starjun sensed Toriko's increased strength and was curious to see his limits, but Toriko said he had no limits, and now was the time to show him the best results of his training, the ultimate routine technique. On the other side, Zebra and the others are continuously gaining the advantage, while Mansam doesn't understand why Shigematsu betrayed. However, thanks to his ability to recall memories, he decides to stand up because he will not be defeated by anyone other than Chairman Ichiryu. Returning to the study session with Aimaru, Toriko hasn't grasped anything yet but senses his danger. 
Toriko asks about the image of himself being shattered in his mind earlier, Aimaru explains that it's the ultimate routine, a skill that can turn imagination into reality to execute attacks flawlessly. By creating illusions on the opponent or rather turning all imaginations about one's strength into reality to make those imaginations real, users need to expend a lot of energy as well as absolute belief in their own strength, only then can they win against any opponent. It sounds extremely fanciful, but at this moment, Starjun feels like he's become food on Toriko's plate. He then gets punched so hard that it shatters like a mountain. Reflecting on what just happened, Starjun understands why Toriko is so strong, but he still refuses to concede to Toriko, not willing to let this battle slip away from his grasp. They both look at each other for a moment before launching their attacks. Toriko's flying knife technique is not to be underestimated. Although Starjun manages to block it, facing a series of Toriko's attacks, he is forced to resort to his most powerful weapon, a flaming sword that destroys everything it touches. Seeing his opponent wielding the flaming sword and its danger akin to the lay sword from sci-fi movies, Toriko remains confident. Toriko uses the ultimate routine to imagine himself winning, but instead finds himself being split in two. Immediately, a slashing blow tears through the ground toward him. It seems that Starjun has also learned the ultimate routine from their encounter. Feeling overwhelmed, Toriko combines fork and knife to attack Starjun. Starjun then creates a wall of fire to protect himself, and Toriko takes the opportunity to land 50 fork punches followed by 60 spike punches on Starjun. Both exhausted, they continue to clash with each other. Meanwhile, the manager Jojo reveals himself as a Neo spy and blows up the Bishikukai base. Starjun, unaware of this, continues to fight Toriko. They exchange blow for blow, even in the blazing flames of Starjun, Toriko remains undaunted, his cells constantly regenerate despite severe burns. But this also causes Toriko to consume a lot of calories. Regardless of everything, he still charges into battle with Starjun to the end. Kamatsu cheers from the sidelines, while Toriko manages to knock away Starjun's sword and continues to land powerful punches on Starjun. Starjun doesn't yield and retaliates, exchanging techniques with Toriko to the end. Both fight until they collapse to the ground, but Starjun is the one who stands up first. Toriko also stands up, but as they prepare to unleash their punches, they hesitate because they sense the presence of someone else, who has now approached the stadium. Everyone there feels the presence of this mysterious figure, who rides a level 295 Dark Chef Snake. Approaching the arena. The tycoons and the three members of the G7 organization also sense his presence. The mysterious figure lands in the arena, accompanied by the young man Tepe. Zebra, with his super-sensitive ears, hears everything and plans to attack but is intercepted and controlled by Tepe's vines. It seems that Tepe is being influenced by the cloak-wearing man. The two nitros flew in to attack him because they sensed he was the most dangerous one. The cloaked figure pulled out a strange knife and successfully subdued the two nitros. Setsuno seems to recognize the knife and its wielder, as the knife is the legendary Cinderella belonging to a person named Frozy, the chef goddess. The cloaked figure, none other than the first champion of the tournament called Joie, unleashed a powerful slash with the knife. Setsuno had to muster all her strength to block it, but the force of the slash split the entire arena. Seeing Setsuno forced to wield her own knife and battle shocked Yuda beyond belief. Despite blocking the attack, she was injured. Sensing a powerful enemy. Toriko and Starjun temporarily stopped fighting and decided to head to the arena. Feeling Setsuno's weakness, Jua plunged the knife into the ground, reviving the three Nitro Zebra had defeated and ordered them to eliminate Setsuno. Setsuno prepared to fight but was restrained by Tepe's vines. At that moment, one of the Nitros was flung away, and the one who appeared was none other than knocking Master Jiro. At this moment, Starjun, Toriko, and Kamatsu rode their beasts back to the stadium. Starjun seemed worried, which left Toriko confused about what was happening. On the other side, the Nitro had been struck by Jiro's fatal acupoint, rendering it immobile. Jiro, realizing that Tepe was aiding the enemy, angrily shouted, this idiot still hasn't woken up. The loud roar was so shocking that even Brunch was astonished. Jiro, one of the three strongest individuals and a terror to creatures in the gourmet world of old, was known as the Beast King. In the gourmet world, Ichiryu and Midora faced each other, while outside, the strongest of Igeo faced the strongest of Bishikukai. The starving beasts on the gourmet world's lost islands were eager to make Ichiryu their prey, having endured hunger since yesterday. They wanted to feast, so Ichiryu activated the conqueror's hockey, illuminating the surroundings, then his hand transformed into giant chopsticks, picking up the strongest beasts one by one. Minora, seeing this, also activated his conqueror's hockey. Feeling that killing someone like Jiro would be a waste, Shua invited him to join Neo. Jiro, annoyed, slammed his hand into the ground, paralyzing everyone around, effectively immobilizing the entire island. In other words, he had acupunctured the entire planet, but Jua could still move. 
At this point, outside the arena, the geological formations rose due to the Earth ceasing its rotation. Zhuo marveled at Jiro, calling him a monster. Jiro immediately transformed behind him, shattering his cloak to reveal his true face. However, when this face appeared, everyone was utterly astonished because it wasn't Chua's face but the face of Chef Goddess Frozy. Seeing the geological formations rising, the individual immediately flew up and used the Cinderella sword to cut them down. Despite the striking resemblance to Chef Goddess, Setsuno and Jiro remained skeptical that this person was Frozy. Therefore, they decided to collaborate to find evidence. However, with the sharp blade in hand, he could easily dismantle the techniques of both Setsuno and Jiro. Despite witnessing the opponent's power, they still doubted that it was Frozy because she had indeed passed away many years ago before their eyes. The one bearing the face of Chef Goddess launched an attack. Setsuno, injured, couldn't dodge, and Jiro hurried to her aid, suffering severe injuries himself. They both decided to embrace each other in the face of imminent death, but Toriko appeared just in time to rescue them. Kamatsu also arrived, but the situation was not pleasant. Starjun jumped down from his dragon, realizing who was in front of him and the revelation about Jojo being a spy for NEO. Surprisingly, the mysterious figure aimed at Kamatsu. And Tepe appeared. Knowing he was being manipulated, Toriko found it challenging to handle. Kamatsu tried to awaken Tepe but failed. Toriko and Starjun decided to intervene but were stopped by Tepe. Both were then freed by Setsuno, who, along with Jiro, decided to awaken Tepe. Zhuo now had to face Toriko and Starjun's killing intent, but he easily dominated them, showing his superiority and concern only for Kamatsu. Toriko immediately unleashed his nail punch while Starjun used his flame lance, but both were knocked away within a second, and even his strike left a wound on both their chests. Meanwhile, in the world of Gourmet, the situation of the two strongest men was more tense than ever. Midori extended a long tongue that resembled the legendary Orochimaru, devouring several beasts and even Ichirio's chopsticks. After that, Midori extended his massive, elongated tongue through the ground where Ichiryu was standing. But Ichiryu managed to leap up and evade it. Ichiryu then recalled the memories of the past. In the past, famine and war led to scarce ingredients, forcing Midori to steal from others to survive. He endured countless beatings and even fainted due to hunger. Fortunately, Chef Goddess Frozy found and took care of Midori with great affection. Frozy's care and nourishment quickly restored Midori's health, surprising Frozy herself. Upon seeing others approaching, Midora attacked, but Acacia overlooked him, considering Midora a new member of the family. Acacia named each member of his family, the eldest, Ichiryu, was called Dragon, the second, Jiro, was Wolf, and finally, Midora was named Tiger. From then on, the three, along with Acacia, hunted rare ingredients. Jiro also introduced his traveling companion, Setsuno, to the family. Those moments together were the most precious to Midora until the day God appeared. It drove Frozy to search for God to fill the hungry bellies of people worldwide. This caused intense opposition within the family, but with her determination, Frozy couldn't be stopped, and upon her return, she fell seriously ill. Midora resolved to find the Water of Life to save Frozy, but it was guarded by the Water Dragon. After fighting the Water Dragon, Midora weakened significantly. Not wanting Midora to die for her, Frozy used her remaining strength to cook God for Midora to heal his wounds, sacrificing her life in the process. Midora mourned for six days and nights, and Frozy was buried on a high mountain peak amidst the grief of everyone. Acacia promised himself and others to change the world for the better. The war ended shortly after, and people worldwide enjoyed plentiful meals, but Midora lived on in memories because God had taken Frozy's life. Because God caused Frozy's death, Midora decided that he alone would consume God and all other ingredients in the world. Ichiria threw a pair of giant chopsticks at Midora, but Midora quickly devoured them, causing Ichiria to lose one arm. The loss of his arm caused considerable pain to Ichiryu. Meanwhile, both Toriko and Starjun were subdued by Zhuo. Toriko tried to block Zhuo's advance towards Kamatsu, but it was in vain. Zhuo questioned Kamatsu about the book he had found in the Gourmet Pyramid, believing that whoever found it must have exceptional culinary luck, and Zhuo wanted to exploit Kamatsu to obtain God. At that moment, Zebra unleashed his roar to attack Zhuo, having escaped from the troublesome roots, joined by Sani and Koko. Seeing his friends gathered, Toriko urged Kamatsu to flee since their mission was to protect him. Starjun felt saddened upon learning that his teammates had been defeated. Zhuo believed that all four heavenly kings were severely injured, questioning how they could possibly win against him. Zhuo reminisced about their first encounter in the kingdom of Jadar, where Koko realized the true identity of their opponent. Zhuo was indeed the personal chef of the Jadar kingdom's ruler, the Dark Chef. Seeing the four heavenly kings engage, Jiro and Setsuno put all their efforts into awakening Tepe. However, he suddenly used acupuncture on himself and then punched Jiro. 
This led to a fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat between them, but with Tepe's current strength, Jiro needed Setsuno's assistance. On the other side, Zebra disregarded the identity of his opponent and immediately launched a sound orb combined with Sani's poisonous hair technique straight at the formidable Joa. Despite Joa's immense power, he remained unscathed. Zebra persisted with his sound orb, but Joa swiftly countered it with his knife, followed by a series of slashing attacks. Even Sani's hair couldn't withstand the assault. And all three had to brace themselves against the onslaught until Toriko intervened to create a barrier. Despite Zebra and Sani's coordinated attacks, Joa effortlessly repelled them all with his sword. Inside, the members of the Neo organization had started to vote on recruiting additional members. They intended to utilize the reserve of ingredients at the casino and wait for Joa to return with Kamatsu to persuade him to join their ranks. The battle with Tepe was intense. He easily severed Setsuno's sword, enraging her, but she managed to trap him by controlling the pressure around him. Jiro took the opportunity to push back Tepe. Though Jiro collapsed due to severe injuries, he successfully sealed the cells controlled by Joa in Tepe's body. Now, they could only wait for the outcome of Toriko's group's battle. However, the situation looked bleak, with even the four heavenly kings on the verge of defeat. Joa then proposed that Kamatsu join the Neo organization to help him reshape the world's order. However, Kamatsu refused because he was Toriko's teammate and his only wish was to find God and fulfill Akasha's menu. More importantly, Kamatsu would never serve someone who viewed chefs as mere tools. Seeing this, Joa decided to send Toriko's group to heaven to threaten Kamatsu, as the solar eclipse was imminent and God would appear, ensuring that Joa would never give up. Zebra asked if it must be very delicious, and Joa remarked that he was truly foolish, as having God in one's hands meant having the power to control the world. However, Kamatsu didn't care about that, and not even the four heavenly kings would let someone like Joa interfere with Akasha's menu. Toriko also didn't give up because God would be the full course in his complete menu. Seeing that all four heavenly kings were still alive and well, Joa planned his move, but his sword suddenly was firmly held by Starjun. His forehead began to glow, and his third eye awakened through the battle with Toriko, awakening Starjun's gourmet cells. Starjun pointed his finger to the sky, concentrating his power and launching a direct attack at Joa. However, he was still no match for Joa. The heavenly kings then pooled their strengths, channeling and combining them. After much effort, they created a sphere containing the power of their friendship. Then, the four combined their efforts to push it towards Joa. Joa found this amusing and split the sphere in two with his sword, causing an explosion that blew them all away. On the Sky Island, Ichiria had only one arm left and endured countless life-threatening blows from Midora. However, he understood that Midora had chosen the wrong path that Acacia and Frozy had set, so he had to help him at all costs. Ichiryu regained his arm and unleashed the King's Chopsticks technique, but Midora remained unfazed by the blow. Effortlessly defeating Ichiryu with a single strike. He then summoned his gourmet devil and intended to devour Ichiryu. Back on the battlefield, the four heavenly kings were heavily injured, and Joa was determined to capture Kamatsu by any means necessary, even if it meant using force. In his subconscious, Toriko reached out to his demon to borrow its strength. Toriko unexpectedly extended his demon arm, piercing through Joa's body. During the battle with Starjun, Toriko's gourmet cells also awakened. A demon would appear and instinctively consume everything. Joa constantly provoked Toriko's cells to transform so he could witness Toriko devouring his teammates, laughing at their shared desire for God. Joa follows the philosophy of enjoying delicious food alone and denying it to others if it's not to his liking. Under his influence, the demon within Toriko fully emerges. Meanwhile, before finishing off Ichiryu, Midora is suddenly reminded by Ichiryu of their childhood memories. Ichiryu talks about the desire to share one last meal with everyone, which brings tears to Midora's eyes. Nevertheless, he still decides to unleash his punch. His roar emitted a bright light that spread across the island. Terry on the hilltop noticed something and, with the Emperor Crow and Snake Queen, ran towards Toriko. The demon within Toriko emerged before everyone's helplessness, destroying everything in sight. Kamatsu, suppressing his fear, ran to Toriko, shouting about their friendship, memories, and shared desire, but was devoured by the demon. In the depths of his consciousness, Toriko saw the demon and himself, determined to fulfill their dream of completing their full menu. The demon emitted a brilliant light. Soon after, a Toriko figure emerged, surrounded by a dazzling light. He had fully mastered his instincts, easily shattering Joa's sword and defeating him. Joa charges forward with his sword, but is blocked by the power of friendship, fueled by the adventurous memories that give strength to Toriko and the gratitude for the ingredients that make delicious dishes. Joa cannot comprehend this. Believing that ingredients are merely tools for controlling the world. He then transforms into a giant demon to try to defeat Toriko. Appearing as a complete demon, Joa wields his sword to attack, but all his strikes are dodged by Toriko. 
Despite being pushed back, Toriko easily counters, punching away Zhuo's sword. They engage in a fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, where Toriko's attacks carry images of the ingredients he has consumed. Toriko overwhelms Zhuo effortlessly because he lacks appreciation for ingredients. Zhuo decides to unleash his strongest technique, drawing a circle and executing a life-ending strike. Toriko prays, surrounded by images of ingredients that quickly merge into his arm. He delivers an immensely powerful punch, pushing back Zhuo's attack and sending him flying into the sky. Thus, Zhuo is defeated along with his Cinderella sword, prompting other Neo members to flee immediately. Kamatsu happily runs towards Toriko. Star Jun suddenly notices shooting stars in the sky, falling one after another. On Sky Island, Ichiryu is still alive because Midora showed mercy. Facing the meteor shower, Toriko and the four heavenly kings join forces to protect everything, including the animals and other people, and eventually, peace is restored. Star Jun decides to return to Midora. Kamatsu asks Star Jun to deliver a message to Otaki, promising a rematch at next year's food festival. Star Jun advises Kamatsu to deliver the message himself and promises Toriko to meet again in the gourmet world for another showdown. At the hospital, Mansam are being treated, and the truth about President Shigematsu and Director Yum being spies is heart-wrenching. However, the immediate concern is to rebuild the city, and Mansam is finally praised for his handsome looks. Unexpectedly, Midora appears with President Ichiryu in hand, returning him to Toriko before leaving. However, Jiro and Setsuno didn't want him to leave with an empty stomach. Just then, Kamatsu brought out a ocean soup to treat them, reminding him of memories with Frozy. They all sit together to eat. Midora sheds tears for the happiness of his small family in the past. And President Ichiryu is delighted to eat with his family again. Midora stands up to leave, thanking Kamatsu for the delicious meal before returning to the gourmet world. Ichiryu can only watch Midora leave, hoping to meet again. Later, Tina's news reports progress in the city's reconstruction, with free food distribution to the citizens, and many difficulties are being effectively addressed. Toriko and Kamatsu stroll together. Toriko knows that Joa is still alive, and the mystery of him possessing the face and skills of Chef Goddess remains. However, Toriko is determined not to let anyone get their hands on the legendary god ingredient. Coco, Sunny, and Zebra are also on their way to the gourmet world. Toriko, of course, cannot stay still. He holds Kamatsu's hand, dragging him along despite Kamatsu's apparent reluctance. Toriko and Kamatsu embark on a new journey, facing strange creatures as part of their daily routine. Now, they explore unknown delicacies together on their journey. As usual, the sunny boat set sail today, but they encountered a big problem, the food on the ship had run out. Suddenly, they spotted an island nearby, so the boat quickly changed course toward the island. Luffy's group decided to go ashore to search for food. As they walked, they encountered a variety of delicious foods in front of them. There was meat growing on trees, mushrooms tasting like ice cream, and grass resembling noodles. How could this be possible? It was truly strange. Chopper approached a herb, explaining its benefits when a mysterious figure grabbed him. This person was Toriko, a VIP pro gourmet hunter specializing in discovering rare foods. Once he got his hands on something, it was destined for the grill. While Toriko was preparing to cook Chopper, Luffy launched an attack, making Toriko struggle to defend himself. Only then did he realize that this creature could speak human language. Suddenly, hundreds of eyes stared at them as if they were about to be devoured alive. These were the hungry pigs, aggressive creatures that would attack anyone who dared to invade their territory. Their level was 1, meaning it would take 10 hunters equipped with hunting rifles to kill one. Otherwise, they were doomed. The hungry pigs began their relentless attack, and both Toriko and Luffy found themselves in a battle. They treated the pigs like balls, kicking them up into the sky and then down to the ground, causing them to get dizzy. Suddenly, the pieces of meat on their backs emitted a burning smell, indicating their increased anger. Toriko and Luffy frantically fought them off before getting burned by the pig's hot breath. Toriko introduced himself as a gourmet hunter, always seeking unique flavors and hunting for undiscovered ingredients. Even more terrifying, Toriko discovered SI thousand types of ingredients out of the total 300,000 known worldwide, making him an idol in the anime world. Seeing Luffy's elongated arm, Toriko wondered if Luffy's body was made of rubber. Indeed, Luffy had eaten the devil fruit, making his body like this, but its taste was awful. After the introduction, the two defeated the pigs. They enjoyed the spoils of victory, forgetting that their friends were still waiting, starving and exhausted, and hadn't seen Luffy return. Thanks to Toriko, Luffy's group could enjoy delicious pork meat and bone broth, adding Sanji's top-grade sauce made from unexpected orange juice. Nami hadn't eaten any piece yet when the two food gods had finished everything. The last piece was also eaten by Kamatsu. To make up for the delicious dish, 
he invited Sanji to try his own dish. The pork was cooked again, delicious and sweet, making Sanji's eyes blink and his mouth twitch. Nami intended to pack up the food to take back, but Toriko and Luffy, the two food gods, had eaten everything clean, leaving nothing for anyone else. Feeling guilty, Toriko suggested they should go hunt the Hungrilla bird, a legendary ingredient. Toriko came here specifically to catch that bird. Its meat melted on the tongue, with a sweet taste and an intoxicating aroma. Just one taste was addictive for a lifetime. Hearing this, the stomachs of the two food gods immediately shrank, realizing they were bottomless pits. Up ahead, there's a bald hill. Surely, the Hungrilla bird must have eaten all the grass there because the vegetation in this area grows very vigorously, so the sudden appearance of a bald hill without any vegetation is definitely conspicuous. Suddenly, several one-horned bears appeared. They must have just woken up hungry, so they had to go look for prey. They are at level 2 difficulty to catch, and their meat is tough and hard to eat. Toriko had a principle, not to kill an animal if he wouldn't eat its meat, so running away was the wisest choice. One bear suddenly lunged forward, blocking their path. Luffy grabbed the horn and kicked, knocking the bear out. However, danger still lurked as the Hungrilla bird welcomed them with a strong wind, almost blowing Nami and Kamatsu away. Fortunately, Luffy managed to hold them back. The Hungrilla bird was level 3, and before they could react, it attacked Toriko's handsome face. Quickly, he subdued the little bird, which then targeted Nami. Luckily, Sanji rescued them. Chopper transformed and punched the bird in the face, but it was ineffective. Luffy shot his rubber gun at the Hungrilla bird, but its armor was too tough to penetrate. It swooped down, slashing them like poultry and blowing them away. Behind that iron armor was undoubtedly top-notch meat. Just thinking about it made Toriko's mouth water. To stop it from flying around, Luffy ensnared it and delivered continuous punches. The Hungrilla bird, unafraid, continued its attack, forcing Toriko to resort to his ultimate move. Toriko summoned his food demon, one hand holding a knife and the other a fork, and with two swift strikes, he sent the bird straight to its final resting place. The stomachs of these eaters. Toriko praised the food without reservation, are you all craving this deliciousness? The fatty meat melted in their mouths, releasing a flavor akin to top-grade salmon. The Luffy group devoured everything, disregarding their starving comrades who lay waiting. Nami sought Kamatsu for a sip of soup to comfort herself. He took out spice seeds to add to the food. This rare ingredient, when added to soup, created five flavors. In the silent night, the sound of rustling leaves suddenly filled the air. A dark shadow rushed in and grabbed Kamatsu, Nami. After everyone finished eating, Terry noticed that Kamatsu and Nami had disappeared. Chopper immediately translated Terry's message for everyone. They quickly headed to the place where the dark shadow left many clues footprints and the scent of top-grade cocoa. Without a doubt, the dark shadow that abducted Kamatsu was a koala. Their meat was terrible and inedible. Despite the poor quality of their meat, the cocoa beans growing on their backs were top-notch. They surely had taken Nami and Kamatsu to their den. These creatures were omnivores, and their den was in multi-fruit trees. These trees produced fruits with sweet flavors, earning the fruit the title of the world's fruit museum. To produce such delicious fruits, they needed ample sunlight, so they grew on the peaks of high mountains. As they approached the mountain, a strange air current appeared. And an underground stream erupted, catching Chopper off guard. To his surprise, it was chocolate, not poison. As Luffy sprinted ahead, his eyes lit up like headlights in the night sky upon hearing the news, this guy was truly obsessed with food. While running, then suddenly, an underground chocolate stream erupted, leading the food enthusiasts to a river of ice cream. Fortunately for Luffy, it was indeed ice cream otherwise, he might have met his end. Upon reaching the shore, they encountered the Castella lion, a creature with a mane made of incredibly smooth and fluffy Castella cake. Moreover, it roared so loudly, like a giant-sized speaker, that it could rupture eardrums. Toriko devised a strategy for Sanji to advance first, tempting the lion, while he quickly attacked its flank. Despite their imposing appearance, the Castella lion couldn't withstand Toriko's blows. As they defeated one, five more emerged. Toriko and Luffy found themselves surrounded, but Princess Sani, with Coco and Rin, appeared to rescue them. They were Toriko's teammates. At this point, the lionesses had regained consciousness after being knocked out. Sanji, Coco, and Rin stayed behind to block the lions while Toriko's group continued to rescue the hostages. On the way, Toriko had a bad feeling about the situation. The koala bears were moving slowly and weakly, making them perfect prey for the hungry lions. However, to everyone's surprise, the lion's stomachs were empty, and they couldn't eat any of the koalas. At this moment, Kamatsu and Nami were at the mountaintop. Kamatsu, excitedly witnessing the multi-fruit, paid no attention to the imminent danger of being eaten alive. 
a pink koala emerged, causing Nami to scream in fear. Sanji swiftly advanced toward the enemy's territory. The monstrous creature appeared before him, a pink koala. This one had a capture level of 5. The koalas below growled and charged forward. Sanji couldn't land a hit on them because they were too fast. Toriko and Luffy advanced to attack the boss, leaving the smaller koalas to be handled by Chopper's group. On the sunny ship, Robin detected the commotion and decided to turn towards the other side of the island to investigate. At this moment, the pink koala was engaged in combat with Luffy, delivering a powerful punch that sent him flying. It stomped its feet loudly and then spun around to attack the two. Luckily, they managed to evade, but it continued using its old tricks, and this time Luffy got hit. It was quite a painful blow. The pink koala then turned to attack Toriko. Although Toriko managed to block its punch, the force was so strong that the ground beneath his feet sank. Toriko exerted all his strength to push the koala's hand away, but their attacks from both sides didn't fare much better. The koala struck Luffy hard, leaving him flattened, and dodged Toriko's punch, even tearing Toriko's clothes in the process. Fortunately, Toriko still had his pants to cover himself, otherwise, he would have been in quite a predicament. They changed their strategy and teamed up to fight together. Luffy transformed into a rubber gun, while Toriko transformed into a bullet and shot straight towards the pink koala, delivering a thunderclap punch that finished off the pink koala. The plan to rescue Nami and Komatsu was a resounding success. Suddenly, the ground shook, and the volcano erupted, spewing out nothing but caramel. The truth about the island began to unfold. The legendary stories of the Hungrilla birds, engraved in many ancient texts and passed down through generations, were revealed. Toriko had come here based on historical documents. But there was a mix-up among historians. The similarity in pronunciation between bird and island led to the misunderstanding that the legendary ingredient was a bird, not this Hungrilla island. In an instant, the island reverted to its original form, a pudding cake, delicious and fragrant. The two culinary experts devoured the entire island in just one minute. With no time to waste, the island was completely consumed. Luffy's group gathered enough food supplies and departed. Before leaving, Toriko promised Luffy that someday he would treat him to a full course meal. But as you might expect, with friends like these, promises for another encounter to be trusted. They bid farewell without even knowing who the other group fighting the lions was. The sunny ship continued its journey, while Toriko and Komatsu embarked on a quest to discover new, high-quality ingredients. One day, Toriko and Komatsu were fishing in the middle of the sea. The monstrous creature they were after was the Haru shark. It had been over three days, and it still hadn't taken the bait. Just as they were getting frustrated, the Haru shark finally bit the hook, much to their delight. Toriko then leaped and punched the fish, knocking it unconscious. Surprisingly, the Haru shark suddenly revived. It turned out that Luffy had been swallowed by it earlier, and it was Toriko's punch that helped him escape. The reason the Straw Hat Pirates came to the sea area was because their doctor, Chopper, had contracted deep sea fever. To cure it completely, they needed to find the seafood fruit. According to Toriko's knowledge, the seafood fruit originated from China and could only be found on the Tuchu Island. The group quickly arrived at the destination. Like before, half of the members stepped onto the island, while the rest stayed to watch the ship. Chopper's green marks on his face were becoming more apparent day by day. Suddenly, a flock of blackbirds surrounded them. Knowing they weren't delicious, Toriko had no intention of killing them. Zoro swiftly subdued the flock, while Robin created a restraining net to control them. Finally, Luffy used his giant hands to defeat the entire flock of black birds. However, they then wanted Luffy to be their master. The Toriko group proceeded to the bird's nest. Toriko inquired about the seafood fruit's whereabouts, but the birds didn't know. Meanwhile, Robin explored and discovered a stone slab with strange characters. At that moment, Komatsu brought porridge for Chopper, who refused to eat. His body gradually turned green, causing Toriko great concern. They needed to find the seafood fruit quickly because Chopper wouldn't survive much longer. Therefore, Luffy decided to set out immediately. The group continued forward, encountering a fierce panda bear blocking their path. Zoro stayed behind to hold it off while the others ventured inside. The bear looked foolish, but its movement speed was quite fast, forcing Zoro to draw his sword for battle. Luffy's group passed through the tunnel and reached a water lake. Robin quickly found a tree bearing the seafood fruit. Just when they thought it was over, a tentacle dragged Robin underwater, causing her to lose consciousness gradually. The true form of the monster emerged, it was Mangrond, a creature whose body was intertwined with the tree. Mangrond started attacking Luffy, who, along with Toriko, retaliated immediately. Although they managed to knock off its head, it regenerated quickly. In a moment of carelessness, Luffy was ensnared, and the seawater rendered him powerless. Toriko was also thrown far away by Mangrond. 
Chopper apologized to everyone, blaming himself for the situation. Toriko encouraged Chopper, reminding him that they came not only to save him but also to find delicious food. Saying so, Toriko launched an attack on Mangron's head to free Luffy, who quickly rescued Robin and returned. Once again, Luffy and Toriko fought together. Toriko's kick caused the tree to fall, which meant Mangron was defeated. Then Komatsu processed the seafood fruit obtained from the tree and gave it to Chopper to eat. Unexpectedly, it had an immediate effect, Chopper's body quickly returned to normal, and Joy returned to the group. The team continued to feast until late at night. However, things didn't stop there. Instead of turning green, Chopper's body was now as red as fire. It turned out that the seafood fruit didn't have the effect they thought it would. This revelation caused panic and fear among them. While they were unsure how to deal with this, the sunny ship arrived and landed in front of them. On board were not only members of the Straw Hat Pirates but also Toriko's friends. They came to help Toriko but realized they needed to save Chopper first. Sanji easily recognized the illness Chopper was suffering from. Initially, the patient would feel cold, followed by a raging fever, and then death would come when the sun rose. To save Chopper, he needed to eat four miraculous ingredients representing each season, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, all at once. Luckily, the Tuchu Island had all these ingredients, so the group quickly set out to find them. On the mountain peak in front of them, there was a gigantic sign. Toriko jumped up and punched it to activate it. As predicted, a mushroom tower emerged, divided into four floors, each representing a different season. Luffy made a hole to enter the tower, and along with everyone else, they ventured inside. The first floor represented summer, so it was extremely hot. After running for a while, they encountered an obstacle, a ferocious chili sauce tiger. On its back was the first ingredient they needed. With time running short, the group split up to expedite the process. The second floor was autumn. So the air was quite comfortable. Their opponent was an eight-horned pig, much to Sanji's disappointment as it was different from what he had imagined. Luffy, Toriko, and Komatsu were on the third floor, which represented winter. The climate here was extremely harsh. Their adversary was a drunken monkey guarding the third ingredient. It had been watching over the sake waterfall, where the third ingredient was located. The drunken monkey had no intention of making it easy for Luffy's group to obtain the ingredient and fiercely opposed them. On the other hand, Usopp became bait for the pursuing tiger. If he ran fast enough, the chili sauce would fall out. After a while of flying and jumping, the entire body of the tiger had turned into chili sauce, thus obtaining the first ingredient. On the other side, Frankie, Sanji, and Sanji had also defeated the eight-horned pig and collected the second ingredient. Only Luffy's group had not yet collected anything due to the difficulty of dealing with the drunken monkey. Due to drinking sake, the drunken monkey became stronger day by day. Komatsu also discovered the mango quince flower, the final ingredient. If they defeated the drunken monkey, they could obtain the two ingredients. This time, both Luffy and Toriko rushed forward, unleashing powerful consecutive punches that blew it out. However, there were still challenges ahead. The mango quince flower had not yet bloomed because the weather on this floor was too cold for it to develop further. Now they needed sunlight. But they couldn't find any sunlight. Fortunately, beams of light suddenly appeared from somewhere, as it turned out, the Hara sharks could emit light like sunlight. Thanks to them, the mango quince tree grew rapidly, and the flowers bloomed. With all the ingredients gathered, Komatsu began to process them and created a culinary masterpiece. This time, Chopper was officially cured of his illness and would not relapse. Everyone rejoiced at this success. Both sides bid farewell to each other emotionally and promised to meet again on another occasion. Today, the IGO Food Festival is being held again, where the winner will receive an excellent reward, a legendary piece of succulent meat. Pirates from all over the world and culinary hunters are present. The referee signals the start of the competition, and immediately the competitors rush forward like an army. Suddenly, the ground trembles, and a giant sand dune appears, swallowing everyone. It's a level 40 insect beast, and everyone is about to become its prey. Somewhere outside the sand pit, Toriko's Heavenly King's group appears. Komatsu is running fast, followed by Luffy's straw hat pirates. Sanji wants to impress the beautiful Nami and Rin. Luffy won't let anyone take the legendary meat. There's also another character with universe-class power, Sun Goku, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. The referee announces that the participants must pass through the dangerous forest to reach the center of the island, with the additional rule of no flying. Here is the legendary piece of meat reserved for the winner, the audience in the stands cheers enthusiastically for the contestants. Does anyone remember the handsome blonde commentator of the martial arts tournament? Alongside him is Mansam from IGO. 
Finally, the strongest man in the world, Mr. Satan, says, I may not be the strongest in the world, but I'm the strongest in this universe. Krillin asks Piccolo if he thinks the legendary meat is tasty. Coco explains that the meat from the mythical beast cow only eats the finest foods, making it extremely rare. Robin has read about the information on this mythical cow, while Nami hopes the captain wins to exchange the meat for money. Quickly, the contestants reach a fork in the road, with tall, treacherous mountains ahead. To the east lies a deep forest filled with fierce creatures, while to the west is a barren desert. Without much ado, Luffy, Toriko, and Goku choose the shortest path. Gohan and Komatsu opt to venture into the forest, and Sanji feels uncomfortable being separated from Nami and Rin. Suddenly, a giant ape appears, level 45, but Setsuno says they don't need to fight it. If they satisfy its hunger, it'll let them pass. Sanji and Komatsu manage to feed the ape until it's full and lies down contentedly. In the desert, Frankie's group is struggling to cross the area when they encounter Master Rashi and Brook lying on the sand. Nami and Rin try to help, but the two always have mischievous thoughts, deserving a rebuke. Goten and Trunks decide to fuse into Gotenks, which excites Chopper. He wants to fuse with Sanji immediately. Meanwhile, Luffy and Toriko are climbing the mountain, exhausted. Goku effortlessly jumps to the top. He's almost reached the summit, sure to find the most delicious beef there. Luffy and Toriko catch up, but suddenly, the universal deity communicates with Goku. Warning of a powerful creature's appearance. Goku leaves immediately. Luffy and Toriko didn't understand why Goku disappeared. At that moment, Zoro was lost somewhere, and Zebra created an illusion to deceive Zoro. The live broadcast of King Zebra suddenly appeared. Vegeta, from afar, rushed in search of Goku, eager for a confrontation. Without understanding what Vegeta was saying, Zoro and Zebra unleashed a barrage of attacks on Vegeta. A massive explosion occurred, blowing away the cameraman. Satan couldn't believe his eyes, he thought these guys must be using some special effects. Luffy and Toriko rushed to the center of the arena, where Goku returned after saving the Earth. Now! The race was truly on. The three of them accelerated and simultaneously grabbed the flag. Since there were no rules for this situation, they decided to compete right there. The ground began to tremble as the arena drained of water, and the floor was raised. Mr. Satan fell onto the platform, but the audience thought he wanted to join the battle to win the legendary meet, so everyone supported him. In this battle, the last one remaining on the floor would be the winner. The referee declared the match started, and Goku lunged forward to punch Luffy's head. Luffy countered, Toriko unleashed his barrage of punches, and Luffy activated Gear Second. They engaged in continuous combat. Although Luffy was strong. Goku punched both Luffy and Toriko, then unleashed a Kamehameha, causing the arena to explode. Mr. Satan trembled in fear, it was a serious battle now. Goku transformed into Super Saiyan Level 1, while Toriko and Luffy used their strongest attacks. Their combined assault shook the entire island. Surprisingly, all three were disqualified for being outside the arena. Just as the referee was about to declare a tie, someone emerged from below, the strongest man in the world, Mr. Satan. He had defeated all three heavyweight fighters and was jubilant in his victory. To him, Toriko, Luffy, and Goku were just kids. The legendary meat has been cooked, Toriko looks at it hungrily, with his good heart. Mr. Satan decides to share the meat. Goku praises the strength of Luffy and Toriko, promising to fight them again next time. Under the deep sea, a round monster like an egg appears. The legendary meat has been turned into various dishes by super chefs. Before eating, Toriko reminds everyone to thank the ingredients. Toriko eats a piece that tastes so good it makes him shiver. Gyu turns food into cola for Frankie's energy. This is Toriko, Luffy, and Goku's paradise, but things don't stop there. This competition is organized by Mansam to catch the monster Akami, a famous deep-sea fish. Suddenly, something explodes on the water surface, and the pink-red fish without eyes is Akami, with a stomach as deep as the sea. At first glance, it doesn't seem scary until it opens its mouth, revealing sharp teeth and new terrifying spikes. Even Gohan is absorbed by its power. In a moment, it grows in size, and Akami's speed is extremely fast, easily dodging attacks. Gohan has no more strength left. Setsuno says it's because of Akami's toxin, and the condition to save them is to defeat Akami within 30 minutes so she can make an antidote from its body. Everyone's task is to find this monster. While Sanji and Sani argue, Akami appears. Sanji attacks with Diablo Jam but is countered. Piccolo kicks Akami far away, and then all three unleash their strongest attacks. Piccolo uses Kamehameha, but Akami unexpectedly absorbs all their power. At this time, Goku still cannot sense its energy. Koko and Brook run out to sea because others are searching in the forest, so they will search here. Unfortunately, Brook is captured by the giant Akami. 
Coco uses his poison sword to cut off its tentacles, but it still has many other tentacles to absorb their strength. Goten and Trunks immediately fuse into Gotenks, while Frankie transforms into a super robot and grabs onto Akami's tentacles, tearing them all off. He prepared to unleash his ultimate moves, but unfortunately, Akami absorbs all his strength, leaving them in a dire situation. Gotenks commands the ghost attack to explode around Akami, but the outcome is the same as it absorbs the strength through its tentacles. On this side, Toriko confronts Akami, which has absorbed even more power this time. Before he can unleash his technique, he hears the cry of Gomu Gomu no. Toriko explains that Akami has absorbed strength and is now 100 times stronger, but its taste has also improved a hundredfold. Goku transforms into Super Saiyan, and all three of them launch a fierce attack on the monster. They used their strongest moves, but it seems to have little effect. Goku releases a powerful Kamehameha, followed by Luffy infusing Haki into his punch, sending Akami flying 500 meters away. Their brief moment of relief is interrupted as Akami reappears and attacks all three of them. It has evolved into a form called Super Big Tuna. Rendering Luffy's hockey-coated punches ineffective and unleashing a powerful energy blast that hits Goku. Toriko explains that Akami can absorb and convert damage into strength, and the only way to stop it is with a powerful attack. While Toriko and Luffy continue their assault on Akami, Goku prepares to use his ultimate move, the Genki Dama. However, Akami absorbs the energy from the energy sphere. Everyone on the island channels their energy to Goku, rapidly increasing the size of the energy sphere. Goku throws the sphere at Akami, while Luffy and Toriko combine their strength to punch its mouth. Goku unleashes the Genki Dama powered Kamehameha, defeating the monster Akami. The final battle concludes with all three warriors exhausted but smiling. Now, they have a super delicious grilled meat from the legendary source. Meanwhile, elsewhere on the island, Zoro, Zebra, and Vegeta are still fiercely battling it out. In a marketplace where ingredients are traded, there's a kid who keeps bothering one stall owner after another. He's not there to buy ingredients but to ask about Toriko's whereabouts. An old man selling meat recounts Toriko's visit with a giant fong bunny, but that was two years ago, and Toriko's current whereabouts are unknown. However, the kid isn't discouraged. Out of the 300,000 ingredients found worldwide, 6,000 belong to Toriko. Seeing the kid's determination to meet Toriko, Tomo introduces himself as Toriko's friend and promises to take the kid to him. So the kid boards Tomo's boat to an island where Toriko was supposed to be. As soon as they arrive, the kid is chased by a wild pig. Left stranded by Tomu, who departs without a proper farewell. He was running and using a rubber band for self-defense, but only further irritated the pig. Just as the pig was about to approach, Toriko suddenly appeared and delivered a punch that knocked it out instantly. Toriko then walked over to break off a branch of a cigar tree and put it in his mouth to smoke. While preparing to cook garlic pork, the boy ran up to Toriko and asked who he was, but then immediately fainted from exhaustion. When the boy regained consciousness, Toriko generously offered him a delicious piece of meat, while he himself ate the entire remaining pig, leaving only the bones. Toriko straightforwardly asked the boy if he needed anything from him. The boy quickly told Toriko about his village being ravaged by a giant bird. Although the villagers managed to escape, their homes and belongings were destroyed, leaving them in great distress. The boy decided to use all the village's money to hire Toriko to defeat the bird. Toriko refused the payment because he is a gourmet hunter, not a mercenary. Moreover, the bird was classified as level 6 by the IGO, meaning that capturing animals of level 1 requires the effort of 10 armed hunters, which the amount offered couldn't cover. Toriko suggests being paid with the bird itself, as its meat, living high in the sky, would be exceptionally delicious and valuable. The kid, relieved not to pay money, agrees and introduces himself as Peck. The village of Peck was situated deep in the Tazan Plateau, prompting Toriko to decide to traverse the mountain range filled with exotic beasts to reach it as quickly as possible. Shortly after, they encountered a serpent bat, which made Peck quickly consult his dictionary about it, only to be intimidated by the serpent bat's long tongue. Both of them were immediately chased by the serpent bat. Toriko instructed Peck to use the rubber sling to shoot at it since he was from a village of hunters. Peck attempted to shoot but missed every time. It turned out that Peck's village sent him to find Toriko because he was exceptionally skilled at evading capture. Being the only one who could venture outside without being caught by the giant bird. Peck urged Toriko to take action against the serpent bat, but Toriko refused because the snake bat's meat wasn't appetizing to him. With no other option, Toriko resorted to using an electric rod to shock the serpent bat, rendering it immobile on the ground. Toriko's principle was not to kill anything he wouldn't eat, but if he did kill, he would consume the meat. Afterward, they continued their journey and stumbled upon numerous bread flowers and chocolate mushrooms. Before Peck could read about them, Toriko had already consumed them all, including the poisonous mushrooms. Toriko wasn't concerned because his body had developed antibodies to the toxin. 
allowing him to eat them without worry. In the evening, they sat down to a feast of grilled rabbit meat. Toriko casually lit a cigarette, surprising Peck with his fondness for smoking. Toriko praised Peck's extensive knowledge of ingredients, but Peck didn't feel happy because he believed that knowing a lot wouldn't help him save his village and family. Peck requests Toriko to accept him as an apprentice. The next day, Toriko takes Peck to hunt a mountain goat. Despite Peck's fear, Toriko pushes him forward. When the goat saw Peck, it flew into a rage and attacked the boy. Toriko, standing nearby, advised Peck to quickly use the power of friendship, using his intellect to deal with the goat. Peck hurriedly took cover behind some rocks to cut off the goat's tail, then calmly contemplated Toriko's advice. Seizing the moment when the goat was not paying attention, Peck enticed it to chase him to a rocky ledge. He then jumped down, causing the goat to lose its balance and fall face-first onto the rocks below. Seeing the goat defeated, Peck was delighted that his plan had succeeded. He realized that the goat's long legs were weak against strong impacts when landing, so he led it to this spot to bring it down. However, Toriko suddenly noticed the wound caused by the goat's claws under its belly. That evening, they arrived at Peck's village only to find it deserted. Peck hurried to call everyone. And to their surprise, the village chief and several young men suddenly appeared. It turned out that the villagers had dug underground shelters to hide from the giant bird. Peck was overjoyed to see everyone safe, including his mother. All the villagers gathered to meet Toriko. Peck quickly distributed the ingredients they had hunted among them to organize an outdoor barbecue party. Everyone enjoyed the feast tremendously. It had been a long time since they had such a delicious meal. While they were celebrating, the sound of the giant bird suddenly echoed, terrifying the villagers. They rushed to flee, but Toriko remained excited because he didn't have to go searching for it. The bird descended from the sky. A fat creature with five heads. Toriko was attacked relentlessly by its heads and was even trampled underfoot. Toriko, infuriated, got up and fought back, dodging the bird's attacks. Just as Toriko was about to deliver a decisive blow, the bird flew up swiftly to prevent him, then stretched its neck to bite Toriko's arm. Toriko waited for the opportunity, then used his strength to knock down the bird. He then prayed for their meal, gathering his strength to deliver a powerful blow that knocked out the bird. Toriko walked away confidently amidst Peck's admiration and the cheers of the villagers. However, Toriko was still not satisfied because he realized the bird was starving. Guessing it had been driven from its habitat. Toriko believed the one who had driven it away was the legendary elephant bear, a mythical creature of the Tazan Plains. Considering the appearance of the bat snake in an uninhabited area and the wound under the belly of the goat that Peck had defeated through deductive reasoning from reading the Gourmet Monster Dictionary, Toriko affirmed that the main culprit was indeed the legendary elephant bear. The elephant bear spent most of its life hibernating in caves, awakening only to devour everything in sight to store energy for its next hibernation. Fifteen years ago, Peck's village was nearly wiped out by it, so the village chief banned everyone from mentioning it. Toriko, upon hearing this, became excited because the meat of the elephant bear surely stored and crystallized many wonderful flavors during its hibernation. Thinking about it made Toriko hungry, so he told Peck that he would go hunt the elephant bear, but first, they needed to feast on the ugly bird they had just caught. The next morning, Toriko followed the bird's location to find the elephant bear. As they set out, Peck, Toriko's three-day apprentice, wanted to join because he was Toriko's apprentice. Toriko agreed, and Peck became Toriko's guide. Peck volunteered to go ahead so that if anything happened, he could run away first. As they walked and talked, Peck asked about Toriko's fork strike technique. Toriko explained that it was the ultimate technique, condensing all punches into one to increase power, but Toriko couldn't use it continuously. Peck pointed out a puddle in front of them. As he took a sip, Toriko noticed that the puddle was made by the elephant bear's footprint. Suddenly, they faced a group of mad monkeys from afar. Peck immediately shot rubber at the monkeys, luckily with Toriko rushing to help, or Peck would have been torn apart. Toriko carried Peck and ran into the deep forest, accidentally encountering a group of wild boars. Toriko had to dodge and escape, but they faced a giant bird. Toriko had to run to the side and unexpectedly met a group of ugly birds blocking their way. Wanting to conserve energy to fight the elephant bear, Toriko had to climb the mountain wall to avoid them, realizing that the beasts must be guarding something on the mountain top. Indeed, when they reached there, they were surprised to see a gigantic and fierce elephant bear. Peck was trembling with fear at the sight of the powerful elephant bear. Despite feeling the beast's ferocity, Toriko's hunger overwhelmed his fear. Ignoring the monstrous creature's roars, Toriko immediately attacked it. The elephant bear's powerful strikes made it difficult for Toriko to approach, but when he unleashed his fork punch, it had no effect. Toriko was knocked down and trampled by the elephant bear. The elephant bear sniffed Toriko with its long trunk, ready to devour him. 
At that moment, Peck rushed back, ignoring Toriko's advice to run away. Not wanting to always flee danger, Peck recalled Toriko's words to use his head to fight. Peck quickly used his sling to shoot stones at the elephant bear. Although the stones didn't cause much harm, they stuck to the elephant bear's fur, and then Peck shot a firestone, scaring the elephant bear. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Toriko escaped. Indeed, after 15 years of hibernation, the elephant bear feared bright light. At that moment, it angrily charged towards Peck. But Toriko appeared and carried the boy away. Seeing his apprentice's bravery, Toriko promised to share some elephant bear meat with Peck. Then he lured the elephant bear away, leaving Toriko alone to face the elephant bear. He used his fork and knife techniques. When the elephant bear charged, Toriko blocked it with his fork, then used the knife to slice it horizontally. Seeing it still standing, Toriko summoned his demon, channeling all his strength into his right arm to make it as big as a giant's. Toriko used the giant arm to throw a fork punch, knocking the elephant bear far away, successfully defeating this powerful beast. Finally, Toriko brought the elephant bear meat back to share with the whole village because Peck had helped catch it. Toriko praised the delicious taste of the elephant bear meat, and the villagers cried tears of joy, never having tasted such delicious meat. They held a feast until evening. When saying goodbye, Peck thanked Toriko for helping their village. Toriko advised him to find more delicious food for everyone, while he followed the guidance of his hungry stomach. They then bid farewell happily. Some time later, Peck met the owner of the meat shop and Tomu again. Tomu seemed annoyed that Peck hadn't thanked him properly for the help, while Peck was irritated that Tomu had left him alone on a dangerous island. But then Peck proudly showed off the red piglet he had caught. The shop owner and others clamored to buy it. But the highlight of the market today was an elephant bear brought by Toriko himself. Peck couldn't hide his pride in his master. Meanwhile, Tajiko was still leisurely fishing when a young man named Kamatsu from the IGO Association arrived, asking for Toriko's help in catching the Galala crocodile, kicking off a journey in search of gourmet cuisine for us to see. Thank you for following and watching anime on my channel. If you find it enjoyable, please subscribe, like, share, and hit the notification bell to watch even better videos. Thank you.